Section 1 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Lake Placid, Florida. Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett Enchantress of Venus, Part 1 The ship moved slowly across the Red Sea through the shrouding veils of mist, her sail barely filled with the languid thrust of the wind. Her hull, of a light thin metal, floated without sound, the surface of the strange ocean parting before her prow in silent rippling streamers of flame. Light deepened toward the ship, a river of indigo flowing out of the west. The man known as Stark stood alone by the after-rail and watched its coming. He was full of impatience and a gathering sense of danger, so it seemed to him that even the hot wind smelled of it. The steersman lay drowsily over his sweep. He was a big man, with skin and hair the color of milk. He did not speak, but Stark felt that now and again the man's eyes turned toward him, pale and calculating under half-closed lids, with a secret avarice. The captain and the two other members of the little coasting vessel's crew were forward at their evening meal. Once or twice Stark heard a burst of laughter, half-whispered and furtive. It was as though all four shared in some private joke, from which he was rigidly excluded. The heat was oppressive. Sweat gathered on Stark's dark face. His shirt stuck to his back. The air was heavy with moisture, tainted with the muddy fecundity of the land that brooded westward behind the eternal fog. There was something ominous about the sea itself. Even on its own world, the Red Sea is hardly more than a legend. It lies behind the mountains of white cloud, the great barrier wall that hides away half a planet. Few men have gone beyond that barrier, into the vast mystery of inner Venus. Fewer still have come back. Stark was one of that handful. Three times he had crossed the mountains, and once he had stayed for nearly a year. But he had never quite grown used to the Red Sea. It was not water. It was gaseous, dense enough to float the buoyant hulls of the metal ships, and it burned perpetually with its deep inner fires. The mist that clouded it were stained with the bloody glow. Beneath the surface Stark could see the drifts of flame where the lazy currents ran, and the little coiling bursts of sparks that came upward and spread and melted into other bursts, so that the face of the sea was like a cosmos of crimson stars. It was very beautiful, glowing against the blue, luminous darkness of the night. Beautiful and strange. There was a padding of bare feet, and the captain, Malthor, came up to Stark, his outlines dim and ghostly in the gloom. "'We will reach Shurun,' he said." "'Before the second glass is run.' "'Stark nodded. Good. "'The voyage had seemed endless, "'and the close confinement of the narrow deck "'had gotten badly on his nerves. "'You will like Shurun, said the captain jovially. "'Our wine, our food, our women, all superb. "'We don't have many visitors. "'We keep to ourselves, as you will see. "'But those who do come—' "'He laughed and clapped Stark on the shoulder.' Ah, yes, you will be happy in Sharoon. It seemed to Stark that he had caught an echo of laughter from the unseen crew, as though they listened and found a hidden jest in Malthor's words. Stark said, That's fine. Perhaps, said Malthor, you would like to lodge with me. I could make you a good price. He had made a good price for Stark's passage up the coast. An exorbitantly good one. Stark said, No. "'You don't have to be afraid,' said the Venusian, in a confidential tone. "'The strangers who come to Sharoon all have the same reason. "'It's a good place to hide. We're out of everybody's reach.' He paused, but Stark did not rise to this bait. Presently he chuckled and went on. "'In fact, it's such a safe place that most of the strangers decide to stay on. "'Now, at my house, I could give you—' Stark said again, flatly, No. The captain shrugged. Very well. Think it over anyway. He peered ahead into the red, coiling mists. 
Ah, see there? He pointed, and Stark made out the shadowy loom of cliffs. We're coming into the strait now. Malthor turned and took the steering sweep himself, the helmsman going forward to join the others. The ship began to pick up speed. Stark saw that she had come into the grip of a current that swept toward the cliffs, a river of fire ever more swiftly in the depths of the sea. The dark walls seemed to plunge toward them. At first, Stark could see no passage. Then, suddenly, a narrow crimson streak appeared, widened, and became a gut of boiling flame, rushing silently around broken rocks. Red fog rose like smoke. The ship quivered, sprang ahead, and tore like a mad thing into the heart of the inferno. In spite of himself, Stark's hands tightened on the rail. Tattered veils of mist swirled past them. The sea, the air, the ship itself, seemed drenched in blood. There was no sound, in all that wild sweep of current through the strait. Only the sullen fires burst and flowed. The reflected glare showed Stark that the straits of Shurun were defended. Squat fortresses brooded on the cliffs. There were ballistas and great windlasses for the drawing of nets across the narrow throat. The men of Shurun could enforce their law, that barred all foreign shipping from their gulf. They had reason for such a law, and such a defense. The legitimate trade of Shurun, such as it was, was in wine and the delicate laces woven from spider silk. Actually, however, the city lived and throve on piracy, the arts of wrecking, and a contraband trade in the distilled juice of the Vila Poppy. Looking at the rocks and the fortresses, Stark could understand how it was that Shurun had been able for more centuries than anyone could tell to victimize the shipping of the Red Sea and offer a refuge to the outlaw, the wolf's head, the breaker of taboo. With startling abruptness, they were through the gut and drifting on the still surface of this all but landlocked arm of the Red Sea. Because of the shrouding fog, Stark could see nothing of the land. But the smell of it was stronger. Warm damp soil and the heavy, faintly rotten perfume of vegetation half jungle, half swamp. Once, through a rift in the wreathing vapor, he thought he glimpsed the shadowy bulk of an island, but it was gone at once. After the terrifying rush of the strait, it seemed to Stark that the ship barely moved. His impatience and the subtle sense of danger deepened. He began to pace the deck with the nervous, velted motion of a prowling cat. The moist, steamy air seemed all but unbreathable after the clean dryness of Mars, from whence he had come so recently. It was oppressively still. Suddenly he stopped, his head thrown back, listening. The sound was borne faintly on the slow wind. It came from everywhere and nowhere, a vague dim thing without source or direction. It almost seemed that the night itself had spoken, the hot blue night of Venus, crying out in the mist with the tongue of infinite woe. It faded and died away, only half heard, leaving behind it a sense of aching sadness, as though all the misery and longing of the world had found voice in that desolate wail. Stark shivered. For a time there was silence, and then he heard the sound again, now on a deeper note. Still faint and far away, it was sustained longer by the vagaries of the heavy air, and it became a chant, rising and falling. There were no words. It was not the sort of thing that would have need of words. Then it was gone again. Stark turned to Malthor. What was that? The man looked at him curiously. He seemed not to have heard. That wailing sound, said Stark impatiently. Oh, that! the Venetian shrugged. A trick of the wind. It sighs in the hollow rocks around the strait. He yawned, giving place again to the steersman, and came to stand beside Stark. The earthman ignored him. For some reason, that sound half heard through the mists had brought his uneasiness to a sharp pitch. Civilization had brushed over Stark with a light hand. Raised from infancy by half-human aboriginals, his perceptions were still those of a savage. His ear was good. 
Malthor lied. That cry of pain was not made by any wind. I have known several earthmen, said Malthor, changing the subject, but not too swiftly. None of them were like you. Intuition warned Stark to play along. I don't come from Earth, he said. I come from Mercury. Malthor puzzled over that. Venus is a cloudy world where no man has ever seen the sun, let alone a star. The captain had heard vaguely of these things. Earth and Mars he knew of, but Mercury was an unknown word. Stark explained, The planet nearest the sun, it's very hot there. The sun blazes like a huge fire. There are no clouds to shield it. Ah, that's why your skin is so dark. He held his own pale forearm close to Stark's and shook his head. "'I've never seen such skin,' he said admiringly. "'Nor such great muscles.' Looking up, he went on in a tone of complete friendliness. "'I wish you would stay with me. We'll find no better lodgings in Shurun. And I warn you, there are people in town who will take advantage of strangers, rob them, even slay them. Now... I'm known by all as a man of honor. You could sleep soundly under my roof. He paused, then added with a smile. Also, I have a daughter. An excellent cook, and very beautiful. The woeful chanting came again, dim and distant on the wind, an echo of warning against some unimagined fate. Stark said for the third time, No. He needed no intuition to tell him to walk wide of the captain. The man was a rogue, and not a very subtle one. A flint-hard, angry look came briefly into Malthor's eyes. You're a stubborn man. You'll find that Shurun is no place for stubbornness. He turned and went away. Stark remained where he was. The ship drifted on through a slow eternity of time. And all down that long, still gulf of the Red Sea, through the heat and the wreathing fog, the ghostly chanting haunted him, like the keening of lost souls in some forgotten hell. Presently the course of the ship was altered. Malthor came again to the afterdeck, giving a few quiet commands. Stark saw land ahead, a darker blur on the night, and then the shrouded outlines of a city. Torches blazed on the quays and in the streets, and the low buildings caught a ruddy glow from the burning sea itself. A squat and ugly town— Shurun, crouching witch-like on the rocky shore, her ragged skirts dipped in blood. The ship drifted toward the quays. Stark heard a whisper of movement behind him, the hushed and purposeful padding of naked feet. He turned, with the astonishing swiftness of an animal that feels itself threatened, his hand dropping to his gun. A belaying pin, thrown by the steersman, struck the side of his head with stunning force. Reeling, half-blinded, he saw the distorted shapes of men closing in upon him. Malthor's voice sounded low and hard. A second belaying pin whizzed through the air and cracked against Stark's shoulder. Hands were laid upon him. Bodies, heavy and strong, bore his down. Malthor laughed. Stark's teeth glinted bare and white. Someone's cheek brushed past, and he sank them into the flesh. He began to growl, a sound that should never come from a human throat. It seemed to the startled Venusians that the man they had attacked had by some wizardry become a beast at the first touch of violence. The man with the torn cheek screamed. There was a voiceless scuffling on the deck, a terrible intensity of motion— and then the great dark body rose and shook itself free of the tangle, and was gone, over the rail, leaving Malthor with nothing but the silken rags of a shirt in his hands. The surface of the Red Sea closed without a ripple over Stark. There was a burst of crimson sparks, a momentary trail of flame going down like a drowned comet, and then nothing. End of Part One How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, 
share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Section 2 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of Enchantress of Venus Stark dropped slowly downward through a strange world. There was no difficulty about breathing, as in a sea of water. The gases of the Red Sea support life quite well, and the creatures that dwell in it have almost normal lungs. Stark did not pay much attention at first, except to keep his balance automatically. He was still dazed from the blow, and he was raging with anger and pain. The primitive in him, whose name was not Stark but Nachaka, and who had fought and starved and hunted in the blazing valleys of Mercury's twilight belt, learning lessons he never forgot, wished to return and slay Malthor and his men. He regretted that he had not torn out their throats, for now his trail would never be safe from them. But the man Stark, who had learned some more bitter lessons in the name of civilization, knew the unwisdom of that. He snarled over his aching head and cursed the Venusians in the harsh, crude dialect that was his mother tongue, but he did not turn back. There would be time enough for Malthor. It struck him that the gulf was very deep. Fighting down his rage, he began to swim in the direction of the shore. There was no sign of pursuit, and he judged that Malthor had decided to let him go. He puzzled over the reason for the attack. It could hardly be robbery, since he carried nothing but the clothes he stood in, and very little money. No, there was some deeper reason. A reason connected with Malthor's insistence that he lodge with him. Stark smiled. It was not a pleasant smile. He was thinking of Shurun, and the things men said about it, around the shores of the Red Sea. Then his face hardened. The dim coiling fires through which he swam brought him memories of other times he had gone adventuring in the depths of the Red Sea. He had not been alone then. Helva had gone with him, the tall son of a barbarian kinglet up coast by Yarel. They had hunted strange beasts through the crystal forests of the sea bottom and bathed in the welling flames that pulsed from the very heart of Venus to feed the ocean. They had been brothers— Helvi was gone, to Shurun. He had never returned. Stark swam on, and presently he saw below him in the red gloom something that made him drop lower, frowning with surprise. There were trees beneath him, great forest giants towering up into an eerie sky, their branches swaying gently to the slow wash of the currents. Stark was puzzled. The forests where he and Helvi had hunted were truly crystalline without even the memory of life. The trees were no more trees in actuality than the branching corals of Terra's southern oceans. But these were real, or had been. He thought at first that they still lived, for their leaves were green, and here and there creepers had starred them with great nodding blossoms of gold and purple and waxy white. But when he floated down close enough to touch them, he realized that they were dead— Trees, creepers, blossoms, all. They had not mummified, nor turned to stone. They were pliable, and their colors were very bright. Simply, they had ceased to live, and the gases of the sea had preserved them by some chemical magic, so perfectly that barely a leaf had fallen. Stark did not venture into the shadowy denseness below the topmost branches. A strange fear came over him, at the sight of that vast forest dreaming in the depths of the gulf, drowned and forgotten, as though wondering why the birds had gone, taking with them the warm rains and the light of day. He thrust his way upward, himself like a huge dark bird above the branches. An overwhelming impulse to get away from that unearthly place drove him on, his half-wild sense shuddering with an impression of evil so great that it took all his acquired common sense to assure him that he was not pursued by demons. He broke the surface at last, to find that he had lost direction in the red deep and made a long circle around, so that he was far below Shurun. 
He made his way back, not hurrying now, and presently clambered out over the black rocks. He stood at the end of a muddy lane that wandered in toward the town. He followed it, moving neither fast nor slow, but with a wary alertness. Huts of wattle and daub took shape out of the fog, increased in numbers, became a street of dwellings. Here and there rushlights glimmered through the slitted windows. A man and a woman clung together in a low doorway. They saw him and sprang apart, and the woman gave a little cry. Stark went on. He did not look back, but he knew that they were following him quietly, at a little distance. The lane twisted snake-like upon itself, crawling now through a crowded jumble of houses. There were more lights and more people, tall white-skinned folk of the swamp edges, with pale eyes and long hair the color of new flax, and the faces of wolves. Stark passed among them, alien and strange with his black hair and sun-darkened skin. They did not speak, nor try to stop him. They only looked at him out of the red fog, with a curious blend of amusement and fear, and some of them followed him, keeping well behind. A gang of small naked children came from somewhere among the houses and ran shouting beside him, out of reach, until one boy threw a stone and screamed something unintelligible except for one word, Lahari. Then they all stopped, horrified, and fled. Stark went on, through the corridor of the lace-makers, heading by instinct toward the wharves. The glow of the Red Sea pervaded all the air, so that it seemed as though the mist was full of tiny drops of blood. There was a smell about the place he did not like, a damp miasma of mud and crowding bodies and wine, and the breath of the Vila Poppy. Sharoon was an unclean town, and it stank of evil. There was something else about it, a subtle thing that touched Stark's nerves with a chill finger. He could see the shadow of it in the eyes of the people, hear its undertone in their voices. The wolves of Sharoon did not feel safe in their own kennel. Unconsciously, as this feeling grew upon him, Stark's step grew more and more wary, his eyes more cold and hard. He came out into a broad square by the harbor front. He could see the ghostly ships moored along the quays, the piled casts of wine, the tangled masts and cordage dim against the background of the burning gulf. There were many torches here. Large low buildings stood around the square. There was laughter and the sound of voices from the dark verandas, and somewhere a woman sang to the melancholy lifting of a reed pipe. A suffused glow of light in the distance ahead caught Stark's eye. That way the street sloped to a higher ground, and straining his vision against the fog, he made out very dimly the tall bulk of a castle crouched on the low cliffs, looking with bright eyes upon the night and the streets of Sharoon. Stark hesitated briefly. Then he started across the square toward the largest of the taverns. There were a number of people in the open space, mostly sailors and their women. They were loose and foolish with wine, but even so they stopped where they were and stared at the dark stranger, and then drew back from him, still staring. Those who had followed Star came into the square after him and then paused, spreading out in an aimless sort of way to join with other groups, whispering among themselves. The woman stopped singing in the middle of a phrase. A curious silence fell on the square. A nervous semblance ran round and round under the silence, and men came slowly out from the verandas and the doors of the wine shops. Suddenly a woman with disheveled hair pointed her arm at Stark and laughed, the shrieking laugh of a harpy. Stark found his way barred by three tall young men with hard mouths and crafty eyes, who smiled at him as hounds smile before the kill. Stranger, they said, Earthman. Outlaw, answered Stark, and it was only half a lie. One of the young men took a step forward. Did you fly like a dragon over the mountains of White Cloud? Did you drop from the sky? I came on Malthor's ship. A kind of sigh went around the square, and with it the name of Malthor. The eager faces of the young men grew heavy with disappointment. 
but the leader said sharply, I was on the quay when Malthor docked. You were not on board. It was Stark's turn to smile. In the light of the torches, his eyes blazed cold and bright as ice against the sun. Ask Malthor the reason for that, he said. Ask the man with the torn cheek. Or perhaps, he added softly, you would like to learn for yourselves. The young men looked at him, scowling, in an odd mood of indecision. Stark settled himself, every muscle loose and ready. And the woman who had laughed crept closer and peered at Stark through her tangled hair, breathing heavily of the poppy wine. All at once she said loudly, He came out of the sea. That's where he came from. He's... One of the young men struck her across the mouth, and she fell down in the mud. A burly seaman ran out and caught her by the hair, dragging her to her feet again. His face was frightened and very angry. He hauled the woman away, cursing her for a fool and beating her as he went. She spat out blood and said no more. "'Well,' said Stark to the young men, "'have you made up your minds?' "'Minds,' said a voice behind them, a harsh-timbered, rasping voice that handled the liquid vocables of the Venusian speech very clumsily indeed. "'They have no minds, these whelps. If they had, they'd be off about their business, instead of standing here badgering a stranger.' The young men turned, and now between them Stark could see the man who had spoken. He stood on the steps of the tavern. He was an earthman, and at first Stark thought he was old— because his hair was white and his face deeply lined. His body was wasted with fever, the muscles all gone to knotty strings twisted over bone. He leaned heavily on a stick, and one leg was crooked and terribly scarred. He grinned at Stark and said, in colloquial English, "'Watch me get rid of him. He began to tongue-lash the young men, telling them they were idiots, the misbegotten offspring of swamp toads, utterly without manners, and that if they did not believe the stranger's story, they should go ask Malthor, as he suggested. Finally he shook his stick at them, fairly screeching. "'Go on, now. Go away. Leave us alone. My brother of Earth and I.' The young men gave one hesitant glance at Stark's feral eyes. Then they looked at each other and shrugged, and went away across the square half-sheepishly, like great loudish boys caught in some misdemeanor. The white-haired earthman beckoned to Stark, and, as Stark came up to him on the steps, he said under his breath, almost angrily, "'You are in a trap.' Stark glanced over his shoulder. At the edge of the square the three young men had met a fourth, who had his face bound up in a rag. They vanished almost at once into a side street, but not before Stark had recognized the fourth man as Malthor. It was the captain he had branded. With loud cheerfulness, the lame man said in Venusian, Come in and drink with me, brother, and we will talk of earth. End of Part 2 Section 3 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 of Enchantress of Venus The tavern was of the standard low-class Venusian pattern, a single huge room under bare thatch, the wall half open with the reed shutters rolled up, the floor of split logs propped up on the piling out of the mud, a long low bar, little tables, mangy skins and heaps of dubious cushions on the floor around them, and at one end the entertainers, two old men with a drum and a reed pipe, and a couple of sulky, tired-looking girls. The lame man led Stark to a table in the corner and sat down, calling for wine. His eyes, which were dark and haunted by long pain, burned with excitement. His hands shook. Before Stark had sat down, he had begun to talk, his words stumbling over themselves as though he could not get them out fast enough. How is it there now? Has it changed any? Tell me how it is, the cities, the lights, the paved streets, the women, the sun. Oh, Lord, what I wouldn't give to see the sun again, and women with dark hair and their clothes on. 
He leaned forward, staring hungrily into Stark's face, as though he could see those things mirrored there. For God's sake, talk to me. Talk to me in English. Tell me about Earth. How long have you been here? asked Stark. I don't know. How do you reckon time on a world without a sun, without one damn little star to look at? Ten years, a hundred years. How should I know? Forever. Tell me about Earth. Stark smiled wryly. I haven't been there for a long time. The police were too ready with the welcoming committee. But the last time I saw it, it was just the same. The lame man shivered. He was not looking at Stark now, but at some place far beyond him. Autumn woods, he said, red and gold on the brown hills. Snow. I can remember how it felt to be cold. The air bit you when you breathed it. And the women wore high-heeled slippers. No big bare feet tromping in the mud, but little sharp heels tapping on clean pavement. Suddenly he glared at Stark, his eyes furious and bright with tears. Why the hell did you have to come here and start me remembering? I'm Larrabee. I live in Sharoon. I've been here forever, and I'll be here till I die. There isn't any earth. It's gone. Just look up into the sky, and you'll know it's gone. There's nothing anywhere but clouds, and Venus, and mud. He sat still, shaking, turning his head from side to side. A man came with the wine, put it down, and went away again. The tavern was very quiet. There was a wide space empty around the two earthmen. Beyond that people lay on the cushions, sipping the poppy wine and watching with a sort of furtive expectancy. Abruptly, Larrabee laughed, a harsh sound that held a certain honest mirth. I don't know why I should get sentimental about Earth at this late date. Never thought much about it when I was there. Nevertheless, he kept his gaze averted, and when he picked up his cup his hand trembled so that he spilled some of the wine. Stark was staring at him in unbelief. Larrabee, he said, you're Mike Larrabee. You're the man who got half a million credits out of the strong room of the Royal Venus. Larrabee nodded, and got away with it, right over the mountains of White Cloud, that they said it couldn't be flown. And do you know where that half million is now? At the bottom of the Red Sea, along with my ship and my crew, out there in the Gulf. Lord knows why I lived. He shrugged. Well, anyway, I was headed for Sharoon when I crashed, and I got here. So why complain? He drank again, deeply, and Stark shook his head. You've been here nine years, then, by Earth time, he said. He had never met Larrabee, but he remembered the pictures of him that had flashed across the space on police bands. Larrabee had been a young man then, dark and proud and handsome. Larrabee guessed his thought. I've changed, haven't I? Stark said lamely, Everybody thought you were dead. Larrabee laughed. After that, for a moment, there was silence. Stark's ears were straining for any sound outside. There was none. He said abruptly, What about this trap I'm in? I'll tell you one thing about it, said Larrabee. There's no way out. I can't help you. I wouldn't if I could. Get that straight. But I can't anyway. Thanks, Stark said sourly. You can at least tell me what goes on. Listen, said Larrabee. I'm a cripple and an old man, and Sharoon isn't the sweetest place in the solar system to live. But I do live. I have a wife, a slatternly wench, I'll admit, but good enough in her way. You'll notice some dark little haired brats rolling in the mud. They're mine, too. I have some skill at setting bones and such, and so I can get drunk for nothing as often as I will, which is often. Also, because of this bum leg, I'm perfectly safe. So don't ask me what goes on. I take great pains not to know. Stark said, Who are the Lahari? Would you like to meet them? Larrabee seemed to find something very amusing in that thought. Just go on up to the castle. They live there. They're the lords of Jeroon, and they're always glad to meet strangers. He leaned forward suddenly. Who are you, anyway? What's your name, and why the devil did you come here? 
My name is Stark, and I came here for the same reason you did. Stark, repeated Larrabee slowly, his eyes intent. That rings a faint bell. Seems to me I saw a wanted flash once. Some idiot that had led a native revolt somewhere in the Jovian colonies. A big, cold-eyed brute they referred to colorfully as the wild man from Mercury. He nodded, pleased with himself. Wild man, eh? Well, Sharoon will tame you down. Perhaps, said Stark. His eyes shifted constantly, watching Larrabee, watching the doorway and the dark veranda and the people who drank, but did not talk among themselves. Speaking of strangers, one came here at the time of the last rains. He was Venusian, from up coast. A big young man. I used to know him. Perhaps he could help me. Larrabee snorted. By now he had drunk his own wine and Stark's, too. Nobody can help you. As for your friend, I never saw him. I'm beginning to think I should never have seen you. Quite suddenly he caught up his stick and got with some difficulty to his feet. He did not look at Stark, but said harshly, You'd better get out of here. Then he turned and limped unsteadily to the bar. Stark rose. He glanced after Larrabee, and again his nostrils twitched to the smell of fear. He went out of the tavern the way he had come in, through the front door. No one moved to stop him. Outside, the square was empty. It had begun to rain. Stark stood for a moment on the steps. He was angry and filled with a dangerous unease, the hair-trigger nervousness of a tiger that senses the beaters creeping toward him up the wind. He would almost have welcomed the sight of Malthor and the three young men, but there was nothing to fight but the silence and the rain. He stepped out into the mud, wet and warm around his ankles. An idea came to him, and he smiled, beginning to move now with a definite purpose, along the side of the square. The sharp downpour strengthened. Rain smoked from Stark's naked shoulders, beat against thatch and mud with a hissing rattle. The harbor had disappeared behind boiling clouds of fog, where the water struck the surface of the Red Sea and was turned again instantly by chemical action into vapor. The quays and the neighboring streets were being swallowed up by the impenetrable mist. Lightning came with an eerie bluish flare and thunder came rolling after it. Stark turned up the narrow way that led toward the castle. Its lights were winking out now, one by one, blotted by the creeping fog. Lightning etched its shadowy bulk against the night, and then was gone. And through the noise of the thunder that followed, Stark thought he heard a voice calling. He stopped, half-crouching, his hand on his gun. The cry came again, a girl's voice, thin as the wail of a seabird through the driving rain. Then he saw her, a small white blur in the street behind him, running, and even in that dim glimpse of her, every line of her body was instinct with fright. Stark set his back against the wall and waited. There did not seem to be anyone with her, though it was hard to tell in the darkness and the storm. She came up to him and stopped, just out of his reach looking at him and away again with a painful irresoluteness. A bright flash showed her to him clearly. She was young, not long out of her childhood, and pretty in a stupid sort of way. Just now her mouth trembled on the edge of weeping, and her eyes were very large and scared. Her skirt clung to her long thighs, and above it her naked body, hardly fleshed into womanhood, glistened like snow in the wet. Her pale hair hung dripping over her shoulders. Stark said gently, What do you want with me? She looked at him, so miserably like a wet puppy, that he smiled. And as though that smile had taken what little resolution she had out of her, she dropped to her knees, sobbing. I can't do it, she wailed. He'll kill me, but I just can't do it. Do what? asked Stark. She stared up at him. "'Run away,' she urged him. "'Run away now. "'You'll die in the swamps, "'but that's better than being one of the lost ones.' She shook her thin arms at him. "'Run away!' 
End of Part 3「Section 4 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4 of Enchantress of Venus The street was empty. Nothing showed. Nothing stirred anywhere. Stark leaned over and pulled the girl to her feet, drawing her in under the shelter of the thatched eaves. "'Now then,' he said, "'suppose you stop crying and tell me what this is all about.' Presently, between gulps and hiccups, he got the story out of her. "'I'm Zareth,' she said, "'Malthor's daughter. He's afraid of you because of what you did to him on the ship, so he ordered me to watch you in the square, when you would come out of the tavern. Then I was to follow you, and—' She broke off, and Stark patted her shoulder. "'Go on.' But a new thought had occurred to her. If I do, will you promise not to beat me, or... She looked at his gun and shivered. I promise. She studied his face, what she could see of it in the darkness, and then seemed to lose some of her fear. I was to stop you. I was to say what I've already said, about being Malthor's daughter and the rest of it, and then I was to say that he wanted me to lead you into an ambush while pretending to help you escape, but that I couldn't do it and would help you to escape anyhow, because I hated Malthor and the whole business about the Lost Ones. So you would believe me and follow me, and I would lead you into the ambush. She shook her head and began to cry again, quietly this time, and there was nothing of the woman about her at all now. She was just a child, very miserable and afraid. Stark was glad he had branded Malthor. But I can't lead you into the ambush— I do hate Malthor, even if he is my father, because he beats me. And the lost ones, she paused. Sometimes I hear them at night, chanting away out there beyond the mist. It's a very terrible sound. It is, said Stark. I've heard it. Who are the lost ones, Zareth? I can't tell you that, said Zareth. It's forbidden even to speak of them. And anyway, she finished honestly, I don't even know. People disappear, that's all. Not our own people of Sharoon, at least not very often. But strangers like you, and I'm sure my father goes off into the swamps to hunt among the tribes there, and I'm sure he comes back from some of his voyages with nothing in his hold but men from some captured ship. Why or what for, I don't know, except I've heard the chanting." They live out there in the gulf, do they, the lost ones? They must. There are many islands there. And what of the Lahari, the lords of Shirun? Don't they know what's going on, or are they part of it? She shuddered and said, It's not for us to question the Lahari, or even to wonder what they do. Those who have are gone from Shirun. Nobody knows where. Stark nodded. He was silent for a moment, thinking... Then Zareth's little hand touched his shoulder. Go, she said. Lose yourself in the swamps. You're strong, and there's something about you different from other men. You may live to find your way through. No, I have something to do before I leave, Sharoon. He took Zareth's damp fair head between his hands and kissed her on the forehead. You're a sweet child, Zareth, and a brave one. Tell Malthor that you did exactly as he told you and it was not your fault I wouldn't follow you. He will beat me anyway, said Zareth philosophically, but perhaps not quite so hard. He'll have no reason to beat you at all, if you tell him the truth, that I would not go off with you because my mind was set on going to the castle of the Lahari. There was a long, long silence, while Zareth's eyes widened slowly in horror, and the rain beat on the thatch and fog and thunder rolled together across Yeroon. "'To the castle?' she whispered. "'Oh, no! Go into the swamps, or let Malthor take you, but don't go to the castle!' She took hold of his arm, her fingers biting into his flesh with the urgency of her plea. "'You're a stranger. You don't know. Please, don't go up there!' "'Why not?' asked Stark. "'Are the Lahari demons?' Do they devour men? 
He loosened her hands gently. "'You'd better go now. Tell your father where I am, if he wishes to come after me.' Zareth backed away slowly, out into the rain, staring at him as though she had looked at someone standing on the brink of hell, not dead, but worse than dead. Wonder showed in her face, and through it a great yearning pity. She tried once to speak, then shook her head and turned away, breaking into a run as though she could not endure to look upon Stark any longer. In a second she was gone. Stark looked at her for a moment, strangely touched. Then he stepped out into the rain again, heading upward along the steep path that led to the castle of the lords of Shuroon. The mist was blinding. Stark had to feel his way, as he climbed higher, above the level of the town. He was lost in the sullen redness. A hot wind blew, and each flare of light turned the crimson fog into a hellish purple. The night was full of vast hissing, where the rain poured into the gulf. He stopped once to hide his gun in a cleft between the rocks. At length he stumbled against a carven pillar of black stone and found the gate that hung from it a massive thing sheathed in metal. It was barred, and the pounding of his fists upon it made little sound. Then he saw the gong, a huge disc of beaten gold beside the gate. He picked up the hammer that lay there, and set the deep voice of the gong rolling out between the thunderbolts. A bear slit opened, and a man's eyes looked out at him. Stark dropped the hammer. "'Open up!' he shouted. "'I would speak with the Lahari.' From within he heard an echo of laughter. Scraps of voices came to him on the wind, and then more laughter. And then, slowly, the great valves of the gate creaked open, wide enough only to admit him. He stepped through, and the gateway shut behind him with a ringing clash. He stood in a huge open court. Enclosed within its walls was a village of thatched huts, with open sheds for cooking, and behind them were pens for stabling the beasts, the wingless dragons of the swamps that can be caught and broken to the goad. He saw only vague glimpses because of the fog. The men who had led him in clustered around him, thrusting him forward into the light that streamed from the huts. He would speak with the Lahari, one of them shouted, to the women and children who stood in the doorways watching. The words were picked up and tossed around the court and a great burst of laughter went up. Stark eyed them, saying nothing. They were a puzzling breed. The men, obviously, were soldiers and guards to the Lahari, for they wore the hornus of fighting men. As obviously these were their wives and children, all living behind the castle walls and having little to do with Sharoon. But it was their racial characteristics that surprised him. They had interbred with the pale tribes of the swamp edges that had peopled Sharoon, and there were many with milk-white hair and broad faces. Yet even these bore an alien stamp. Stark was puzzled, for the race he would have named was unknown here behind the mountains of White Cloud, and almost unknown anywhere on Venus a sea level, among the sweltering marshes and the eternal fogs. They stared at him even more curiously, "'remarking on his skin and his black hair "'and the unfamiliar modeling of his face. "'The women nudged each other and whispered, giggling, "'and one of them said aloud, "'They'll need a barrel hoop to collar that neck.' "'The guards closed in around him. "'Well, if you wish to see the Lahari, you shall,' said the leader, "'but first we must make sure of you.' "'Spear points ringed him round. "'Stark made no resistance while they stripped him of all he had.' except for his shorts and sandals. He had expected that, and it amused him, for there was little enough for them to take. All right, said the leader, come on. The whole village turned out in the rain to escort Stark to the castle door. There was about them the same ominous interest that the people of Sharoon had had, with one difference. They knew what was supposed to happen to him, knew all about it, and were therefore doubly appreciative of the game. A great doorway was square and plain, and yet neither crude nor ungraceful. The castle itself was built of the black stone, each block perfectly cut and fitted. 
and the door itself was sheathed in the same metal as the gate, darkened but not corroded. The leader of the guard cried out to the warder, "'Here is one who would speak with the Lahari.' The warder laughed, "'And so he shall. Their night is long and dull.' He flung open the heavy door and cried the word down the hallway. Stark could hear it echoing hollowly within, and presently from the shadows came servants clad in silks and wearing jeweled collars, and from the guttural sound of their laughter Stark knew that they had no tongues. Stark faltered then. The doorway loomed hollowly before him, and it came to him suddenly that evil lay behind it, and that perhaps Zareth was wiser than he when she warned him from the Lahari. Then he thought of Helvi, and of other things, and lost his fear in anger. Lightning burned the sky. The last cry of the dying storm shook the ground under his feet. He thrust the grinning warder aside and strode into the castle, bringing a veil of the red fog with him, and did not listen to the closing of the door, which was stealthily and quiet as the footfall of approaching death. Torches burned here and there along the walls, and by their smoky glare he could see that the hallway was like the entrance, square and unadorned, faced with the black rock. It was high and wide, and there was about the architecture a calm, reflective dignity that had its own beauty, in some ways more impressive than the sensuous loveliness of the ruined palaces he had seen on Mars. There were no carvings here, no paintings nor frescoes, it seemed that the builders had felt that the hall itself was enough, in its massive perfection of line and the somber gleam of polished stone. The only decoration was in the window embrasures. These were empty now, open to the sky with the red fog wreathing through them, but there were still scraps of jewel-toned panes clinging to the fretwork, to show what they had once been. A strange feeling swept over Stark. Because of his wild upbringing, he was abnormally sensitive to the sort of impressions that most men receive either dully or not at all. Walking down the hall, preceded by the tongueless creatures in their bright silks and blazing collars, he was struck by a subtle difference in the place. The castle itself was only an extension of the minds of its builders, a dream shaped into reality. Stark felt that the dark, cool, curiously timeless dream had not originated in a mind like his own, nor like that of any man he had ever seen. Then the end of the hall was reached, the way barred by low broad doors of gold fashioned in the same chaste simplicity. A soft scurrying of feet, a shapeless tittering from the servants, a glancing of malicious, mocking eyes. The golden door swung open, and Stark was in the presence of the Lahari. End of Part 4 Section 5 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 5 of Enchantress of Venus They had the appearance, in that first glance, of creatures glimpsed in a fever dream, very bright and distant, robed in a misty glow that gave them an illusion of unearthly beauty. The place in which the earthmen now stood was like a cathedral for breadth and loftiness. Most of it was in darkness, so that it seemed to reach without limit above and on all sides, as though the walls were only shadowy phantasms of the night itself. The polished black stone under his feet held a dim, translucent gleam, depthless as water in a black tarn. There was no substance anywhere. Far away in this shadowy vastness burned a cluster of lamps, a galaxy of little stars to shed a silvery light upon the lords of Sharoon. There had been no sound in the place when Stark entered, for the opening of the golden doors had caught the attention of the Lahari and held it in contemplation of the stranger. Stark began to walk toward them in this utter stillness. Quite suddenly, in the impenetrable gloom somewhere to his right, there came a sharp scuffling and a scratching of reptilian claws, a hissing and a sort of low, angry muttering, all magnified and distorted by the echoing vault into a huge, demonic whispering that swept all around him. Stark whirled around, crouched and ready. 
His eyes blazed, and his body bathed in cold sweat. The noise increased, rushing toward him. From the distant glow of the lamps came a woman's tinkling laughter, thin crystal broken against the vault. The hissing and snarling rose to hollow crescendo, and Stark saw a blurred shape bounding at him. His hands reached out to receive the rush, but it never came. The strange shape resolved itself into a boy of about ten, who dragged after him on a bit of rope a young dragon, new and toothless from the egg, and protesting with all its strength. Stark straightened up, feeling let down and furious, and relieved. The boy scowled at him through a forelock of silver curls. Then he called him a very dirty word and rushed away, kicking and hauling at the little beast until it ragged like the father of all dragons and sounded like it, too, in that vast echo chamber. A voice spoke, slow, harsh, sexless. It rang thinly through the vault. Thin, but a steel blade is thin, too. It speaks inexorably, and its word is final. The voice said, "'Come here, into the light.' Stark obeyed the voice. As he approached the lamps, the aspect of the Lahari changed and steadied. Their beauty remained, but it was not the same. They had looked like angels. Now that he could see them clearly, Stark thought that they might have been the children of Lucifer himself. There were six of them, counting the boy. Two men, about the same age as Stark, with some complicated gambling game forgotten between them. A woman, beautiful, gowned in white silk, sitting with her hands in her lap, doing nothing. A woman, younger, not so beautiful, perhaps, but with a look of stormy and bitter vitality. She wore a short tunic of crimson, and a stout leather glove on her left hand, which perched a flying thing of prey with its fierce eyes hooded. The boy stood beside the two men, his head poised arrogantly. From time to time he cuffed the little dragon, and it snapped at him with its impotent jaws. He was proud of himself for doing that. Stark wondered how he would behave with the beast when it had grown its fangs. Opposite him, crouched on a heap of cushions, was a third man. He was deformed, with an ungainly body and long, spidery arms, and in his lap a sharp knife lay on a block of wood half formed into the shape of an obese creature half woman, half pure evil. Stark saw with a flash of surprise that the face of the deformed young man, of all the faces there, was truly human, truly beautiful. His eyes were old in his boyish face, wise, and very sad in their wisdom. He smiled upon the stranger, and his smile was more compassionate than tears. They looked at Stark, all of them, with restless, hungry eyes. They were the pure breed that had left its stamp of alienage on the pale-haired folk of the swamps, the serfs who dwelled in the huts outside. They were of the cloud people, the folk of the high plateaus, kings of the land on the farther slopes of the mountains of white cloud. It was strange to see them here, on the dark side of the barrier wall, but here they were. How had they come, and why, leaving their rich, cool plains for the feeder of these foreign swamps, he could not guess. But there was no mistaking them, the proud fine shaping of their bodies, their alabaster skin, their eyes that were all colors and none, like the dawn sky, their hair that was pure warm silver. They did not speak, they seemed to be waiting for permission to speak, and Stark wondered which one of them had voiced that steely summons. Then it came again. Come here, come closer. And he looked beyond them, beyond the circle of lamps into the shadows again, and saw the speaker. She lay upon a low bed, her head propped on silken pillows, her vast, her incredibly gigantic body covered with a silken pall. Only her arms were bare, two shapeless masses of white flesh ending in tiny hands. From time to time she stretched one out and took a morsel of food from the supply laid ready beside her, snuffing and wheezing with the effort, and then gulped the tidbit down with a horrible voracity. 
Her features had long ago dissolved into a shaky formlessness, with the exception of her nose, which rose out of the fat, curved and cruel and thin, like the bony beak of the creature that sat on the girl's wrist and dreamed its hooded dreams of blood. And her eyes. Stark looked into her eyes and shuddered. Then he glanced at the carving half-formed in the cripple's lap, and knew what thought had guided the knife. Half woman, half pure evil. And strong, very strong. Her strength lay in her naked eyes for all to see, and it was an ugly strength. It could tear down mountains, but it could never build. He saw her looking at him. Her eyes bored into his as though they would search out his very guts and study them, and he knew that she expected him to turn away, unable to bear her gaze. He did not. Presently he smiled and said, I have outstared a rock lizard, to determine which of us should eat the other. And I've outstared the very rock while waiting for him. She knew that he spoke the truth. Stark expected her to be angry, but she was not. A vague mountainous rippling shook her and emerged at length as a voiceless laughter. "'You see that?' she demanded, addressing the others. "'You whelps of the Lahari! Not one of you dares to face me down, and yet here is a great dark creature from the gods nowhere who can stand and shame you!' She glanced again at Stark. "'What demon's blood brought you forth, that you have learned neither prudence nor fear?' Stark answered somberly, I learned them both before I could walk, but I learned another thing also, a thing called anger. And you are angry? Ask Malfor if I am, and why? He saw the two men start a little, and a slow smile crossed the girl's face. Malfor, said the hulk upon the bed, and ate a mouthful of roast meat dripping with fat. That is interesting. "'But rage against Malthor did not bring you here. "'I am curious, stranger. Speak. I will.' "'Stark glanced around. The place was a tomb, a trap. "'The very air smelled of danger. "'The younger folk watched him in silence. "'Not one of them had spoken since he came in, "'except the boy who had cursed him, "'and that was unnatural in itself. "'The girl leaned forward.' idly stroking the creature on her wrist, so that it stirred and ran its knife-like talons in and out of their bony sheaths with sensuous pleasure. Her gaze on Stark was bold and cool, oddly challenging. Of them all, he alone saw him as a man. To the others he was a problem, a diversion, something less than human. Stark said, A man came to Shuroon at the time of the last rains, his name was Helvi, and he was son of a little king by Yarel. He came seeking his brother, who had broken taboo and fled for his life. Helvi came to tell him that the ban was lifted, and he might return. Neither one came back. The small evil eyes were amused, blinking in their tallowy creases. And so? And so I have come after Helvi, who is my friend." Again there was the heaving of that bulk of flesh, the explosion of laughter that hissed and wheezed in snake-like echoes through the vault. Friendship must run deep with you, stranger. Ah, well, the Lahari are kind of heart. You shall find your friend. And as though that were the signal to end their deferential silence, the younger folk burst into laughter also, until the vast hall rang with it giving back the sound like demons laughing on the edge of hell. The cripple only did not laugh, but bent his bright head over his carving and sighed. The girl sprang up. Not yet, grandmother. Keep him a while. The cold, cruel eyes shifted to her. And what will you do with him, Vara? Haul him about on a string, like boar with his wretched beast? Perhaps, though I think it would need a stout chain to hold him. Vara turned and looked at Stark, bold and bright, taking in the breadth and height of him, the shaping of the great smooth muscles, the iron line of the jaw. She smiled. Her mouth was very lovely, like the red fruit of the swamp tree that bears death in its pungent sweetness. 
"'Here is a man,' she said, "'the first man I have seen since my father died.' The two men at the gaming-table rose, their faces flushed and angry. One of them strode forward and gripped the girl's arm roughly. "'So I am not a man,' he said with surprising gentleness. "'A sad thing for one who is to be your husband. It is best that we settle that now, before we wed.' Vara nodded. Stark saw that the man's fingers were cutting savagely into the firm muscle of her arm, but she did not wince. "'High time to settle it all, Egil. You have borne enough from me. The day is long overdue for my taming. I must learn now to bend my neck and acknowledge my lord.' For a moment Stark thought she meant it. The note of mockery in her voice was so subtle. Then the woman in white— who all this time had not moved or changed expression, voiced again the thin, tinkling laugh he had heard once before. From that, and the dark suffusion of blood in Egil's face, Stark knew that Vara was only casting the man's own phrases back at him. The boy let out one derisive bark, and was cuffed into silence. Vara looked straight at Stark. "'Will you fight for me?' she demanded." Quite suddenly, it was Stark's turn to laugh. No, he said. Waters shrugged. Very well, then. I must fight for myself. Man, snarled Egil. I'll show you who's a man. You scapegrace little vixen. He wrenched off his girdle with his free hand, at the same time bending the girl around so he could get a fair shot at her. The creature of prey, a Terran falcon, clung to her wrist, beating its wings and screaming, its hooded head jerking. With a motion so quick that it was hardly visible, Vodder slipped the hood and flew the creature straight for Egil's face. He let go, flinging up his arms to ward off the talons and the tearing beak. The wide wings beat and hammered. Egil yelled. The boy boar got out of range and danced up and down, shrieking with delight. Vara stood quietly. The bruises were blackening on her arm, but she did not deign to touch them. Egil blundered against the gaming table and sent the ivory pieces flying. Then he tripped over a cushion and fell flat, and the hungry talons ripped his tunic to ribbons down the back. Vara whistled, a clear, preemptory call. The creature gave a last peck at the back of Egil's head and flopped suddenly back to its perch on her wrist. She held it, turning toward Stark. He knew from the poise of her that she was on the verge of launching her pet at him. But she studied him and then shook her head. No, she said, and slipped the hood back on. You would kill it. Egil had scrambled up and gone off into the darkness, sucking a cut on his arm. His face was black with rage. The other man looked at Vara. "'If you were pledged to me,' he said, "'I'd have that temper out of you.' "'Come and try it,' answered Vara. The man shrugged and sat down. "'It's not my place. I keep the peace in my own house.' He glanced at the woman in white, and Stark saw that her face, hitherto blank of any expression, had taken on a look of abject fear." "'You do,' said Vara. "'And if I were Errol, I would stab you while you slept. "'But you're safe. She had no spirit to begin with.' "'Errol shivered and looked steadfastly at her hands. "'The man began to gather up the scattered pieces. "'He said casually, "'Egil will wring your neck some day, Vara, and I shan't weep to see it.' "'All this time the old woman had eaten and watched, watched and eaten,' her eyes glittering with interest. "'A pretty brood, are they not?' she demanded of Stark. "'Full of spirit, quarreling like young hawks in the nest. "'That's why I keep them around me, so that they are such sport to watch. "'All except Treon there.' She indicated the crippled youth. "'He does nothing. Dull and soft mouth, worse than Errol. "'What a grandson to be cursed with!' but his sister has fire enough for two. She munched a sweet, grunting with pride. Treon raised his head and spoke, and his voice was like music, echoing with an eerie liveliness in that dark place. 
dull I may be, grandmother, and weak in body, and without hope. Yet I shall be the last of the Lahari. Death sits waiting on the towers, and he shall gather you all before me. I know, for the winds have told me. He turned his suffering eyes upon Stark and smiled, a smile of such woe and resignation that the earthman's heart ached with it. Yet there was a thankfulness in it, too, as though some long waiting was over at last. You, he said softly, stranger with the fierce eyes, I saw you come, out of the darkness, and where you set foot there was a bloody print. Your arms were red to the elbows, and your breast was splashed with the redness, and on your brow was the symbol of death. Then I knew, and the wind whispered into my ear, It is so. This man shall put the castle down, and its stone shall crush Sharoon and set the lost ones free. He laughed very quietly. Look at him, all of you, for he will be your doom. There was a moment's silence, and Stark, with all the superstitions of a wild race thick within him, turned cold to the roots of his hair. Then the old woman said disgustedly, Have the winds warned you of this, my idiot? With astonishing force and accuracy, she picked up a ripe fruit and flung it at Treon. Stop your mouth with that, she told him. I'm weary to death of your prophecies. Treon looked at the crimson juice trickling down the breast of his tunic, to drip upon the carving in his lap. The half-formed head was covered with it. Treon was shaking with silent mirth. Well, said Vara, coming up to Stark, what do you think of the Lahari, the proud Lahari, who would not stoop to mingle their blood with the cattle of the swamps? My half-witted brother, my worthless cousins, that little monster boar who is the last twig of the three. Do you wonder I flew my falcon at Egil? She waited for an answer, her head thrown back, the silver curls framing her face like wisps of storm-cloud. There was a swagger about her that at once irritated and delighted Stark. A hellcat, he thought, but a mighty fetching one, and bold as brass. Bold and honest. Her lips were parted, midway between her anger and a smile. He caught her to him suddenly and kissed her, holding her slim, strong body as though she were a doll. He was in no hurry to set her down. When at last he did... He grinned and said, "'Was that what you wanted?' "'Yes,' answered Vara. "'That was what I wanted.' She spun about, her jaw set dangerously. "'Grandmother!' She got no farther. Stark saw that the old woman was attempting to sit upright, her face purpling with effort and the most terrible wrath he had ever seen. "'You!' she gasped at the girl. She choked on her fury and her shortness of breath and then Egil came soft-footed into the light, bearing in his hand a thing made of black metal and oddly shaped, with a blunt, thick muzzle. "'Lie back, grandmother,' he said. "'I had a mind to use this on Vara.' Even as he spoke he pressed a stud, and Stark, in the act of leaping for the sheltering darkness, crashed down and lay like a dead man. There had been no sound, no flash, nothing— but a vast hand that smote him suddenly into oblivion. Egil finished, but I see a better target. End of Part 5 Section 6 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6 of Enchantress of Venus Red Red Red. The color of blood. Blood in his eyes. He was remembering now. The quarry had turned on him, and they had fought on the bare, blistering rocks. Nor had Nachaka killed. The lord of the rocks was very big, a giant among lizards, and Nachaka was small. The lord of the rocks had laid open Nachaka's head before the wooden spear had more than scratched his flank. It was strange that Nachaka still lived. The Lord of the Rocks must have been fully fed. Only that saved him. Nachaka groaned, not with pain, but with shame. 
He had failed. Hoping for great triumph, he had disobeyed the tribal law that forbids a boy to hunt the quarry of a man, and he had failed. Old One would not reward him with the girdle and the flint spear of manhood. Old One would give him to the women for punishment of little whips. Tika would laugh at him, and it would be many seasons before Old One would grant him permission to try the man's hunt. Blood in his eyes. He blinked to clear them. The instinct of survival was prodding him. He must arouse himself and creep away, before the Lord of Rocks returned to eat him. The redness would not go away. It swam and flowed, strangely sparkling. He blinked again, and tried to lift his head, and could not, and fear struck down upon him like the iron frost of night upon the rocks of the valley. It was all wrong. He could see himself clearly, a naked boy dizzy with pain, rising and clambering over the ledges and the shale to the safety of the cave. He could see that, and yet he could not move. All wrong. Time, space, the universe, darkened and turned. A voice spoke to him, a girl's voice. Not Tika's, and the speech was strange. Tika was dead. Memories rushed through his mind. The bitter things, the cruel things. Old one was dead, and all the others. The voice spoke again, calling him by that name that was not his own. Stark. Memory shattered into a kaleidoscope of broken pictures, fragments, rushing, spinning. He was adrift among them. He was lost, and the terror of it brought a scream to his throat. Soft hands touching his face, gentle words, swift and soothing. The redness cleared and steadied, though it did not go away, and quite suddenly he was himself again, with all his memories where they belonged. He was lying on his back, and Zareth, Malthor's daughter, was looking down at him. He knew now what the redness was. He had seen it too often before not to know. He was somewhere at the bottom of the Red Sea, that weird ocean in which a man can breathe. And he could not move. That had not changed nor gone away. His body was dead. The terror he had felt before was nothing to the agony that filled him now. He lay entombed in his own flesh, staring up at Zareth, wanting an answer to a question he dared not ask. She understood from the look in his eyes. "'It's all right,' she said, and smiled. "'It will wear off. You'll be all right. It's only the weapon of the Lahari. Somehow it puts the body to sleep, but it will wake again.' Stark remembered the black object that Egil had held in his hands. A projector of some sort. Then, beaming a current of high-frequency vibration that paralyzed the nerve centers. He was amazed. The cloud people were barbarians themselves, though on a higher scale than the Swamp Edge tribes, and certainly had no such scientific proficiency. He wondered where the Lahari had got hold of such a weapon. It didn't really matter, not just now. Relief swept over him, bringing him dangerously close to tears. The effect would wear off. At the moment, that was all he cared about. He looked up at Zareth again. Her pale hair floated with the slow breathing of the sea, a milky cloud against the spark-shot crimson. He saw now that her face was drawn and shadowed, and there a terrible hopelessness in her eyes. She had been alive when he first saw her, frightened, not too bright, but full of emotion and a certain dogged courage. Now the spark was gone, crushed out. She wore a collar around her white neck, a ring of metal with the ends fused together for all time. "'Where are we?' he asked. And she answered, her voice carrying deep and hollow in the dense substance of the sea, "'We're in the place of the Lost Ones.' Stark looked beyond her, as far as he could see, since he was unable to turn his head. And wonder came to him. Black walls, black vault above him. A vast hall filled with a wash of the sea that slipped in streaks of whispering flame through the high embrasures. A hall that was twin to the vault of shadows where he had met the Lahari. There is a city, said Zareth dully. You will see it soon. 
You will see nothing else until you die. Stark said, very gently, How do you come here, little one? Because of my father. I will tell you all I know, which is little enough. Malthor has been slaver to the Lahari for a long time. There are a number of them among the captains of Sharoon. But that is a thing that is never spoken of. So I, his daughter, could only guess. I was sure of it when he sent me after you. She laughed, a bitter sound. Now I'm here, with the collar of the lost ones on my neck. But Malthor is here, too. She laughed again, ugly laughter to come from a young mouth. Then she looked at Stark, and her hand reached out timidly to touch his hair in what was almost a caress. Her eyes were wide and soft and full of tears. Why didn't you go into the swamps when I warned you? Stark answered stolidly. Too late to worry about that now. Then, you say Malthor is here a slave? Yes. Again, that look of wonder and admiration in her eyes. I don't know what you said or did to the Lahari, but the Lord Eagel came down in a black rage and cursed my father for a blundering fool because he could not hold you. My father whined and made excuses, and all would have been well, only his curiosity got the better of him, and he asked the Lord Eagel what had happened. You were like a wild beast, Malthor said, and he hoped you had not harmed the Lady Vara, as he could see from Egil's wounds that there had been trouble. The Lord Egil turned quite purple. I thought he was going to fall in a fit. Yes, said Stark. It was the wrong thing to say. The ludicrous side of it struck him, and he was suddenly roaring with laughter. Malthor should have kept his mouth shut. Egil called his guard and ordered them to take Malthor. And when he realized what had happened, Malthor turned on me, trying to say that it was all my fault that I let you escape. Stark stopped laughing. Her voice went on slowly. Egil seems quite mad with fury. I have heard that the Lahari are all mad, and I think it is so. At any rate, he ordered me taken too for he wanted to stamp Malthor's seed into the mud forever. So here we are. There was a long silence. Stark could think of no word of comfort, and, as for hope, he had better wait until he was sure he could at least raise his head. Egil might have damaged him permanently, out of spite. In fact, he was surprised he wasn't dead. He glanced again at the collar on Zareth's neck. Slave slave to the Lahari, in the city of the Lost Ones. What the devil did they do with slaves at the bottom of the sea? The heavy gases conducted sound remarkably well, except for an odd property of diffusion, which made it seem that a voice came from everywhere at once. Now, all at once, Stark became aware of a dull clamor of voices drifting towards him. He tried to see and Zareth turned his head carefully so that he might. The Lost Ones were returning from whatever work it was they did. Out of the dim red murk beyond the open door they swam, into the long, long vastness of the hall that was filled with the same red murk, moving slowly, their white bodies trailing wakes of sullen flame. The host of the dam drifting through a strange, red-litten hell, weary and without hope. One by one they sank onto pallets laid in rows on the black stone floor, and lay there, utterly exhausted, their pale hair lifting and floating with the slow eddies of the sea. And each one wore a collar. One man did not lie down. He came toward Stark, a tall barbarian who drew himself with great strokes of his arm so that he was wrapped in wheeling sparks. Stark knew his face. Helvy, he said and smiled in welcome. Brother! Helvy crouched down, a great handsome boy he had been the time Stark saw him. But he was a man now, with all the laughter turned to grim deep lines around his mouth, and the bones of his face standing out like granite ridges. Brother, he said again, looking at Stark through a glitter of unshamed tears. Fool! and he cursed Stark savagely because he had come to Sharoon to look for an idiot who had gone the same way, and was already as good as dead. 
"'Would you have followed me?' asked Stark. "'But I am only an ignorant child of the swamps,' said Helvey. "'You come from space. You know other worlds. You can read and write. You should have better sense.' Stark grinned. "'And I'm still an ignorant child of the rocks. So we're two fools together. Where is Tobel?' Tobel was Helvey's brother, who had broken taboo and looked for refuge in Sharoon. Apparently he had found peace at last, for Helvey shook his head. A man cannot live too long under the sea. It is not enough merely to breathe and eat. Tobel overran his time, and I am close to the end of mine. He held up his hand and then swept it down sharply, watching the broken fires dance along his arms. The mind breaks before the body, said Helvey casually, as though it were a matter of no importance. Zareth spoke. Helvey has guarded you each period while the other slept. And not I alone, said Helvey. The little one stood with me. Guarded me, said Stark. Why? Helvey gestured toward a pallet not far away. Malthor lay there, his eyes half open and full of malice the fresh scar livid on his cheek. "'He feels,' said Helvey, "'that you should not have fought upon his ship.' Stark felt an inward chill of horror. To lie here helpless, watching Malthor come toward him with open fingers reaching for his helpless throat. He made a passionate effort to move, and gave up gasping. Helvey grinned. "'Now is the time I should wrestle you, Stark, for I never could throw you before.' He gave Stark's head a shake, very gentle for all its apparent roughness. "'You'll be throwing me again. Sleep now, and don't worry.' He settled himself to watch, and presently, in spite of himself, Stark slept, with Zareth curled at his feet like a little dog. There was no time down there in the heart of the Red Sea. No daylight, no dawn, no space of darkness. No winds blew. No rain nor storm broke the endless silence. Only the lazy currents whispered by on their way to nowhere, and the red sparks danced, and the great hall waited, remembering the past. Stark waited, too. How long he never knew, but he was used to waiting. He had learned his patience on the knees of the great mountains whose heads lift proudly into open space to look at the sun, and he had absorbed their own contempt for time. Little by little, life returned to his body. A mongrel guard came now and again to examine him, pricking Stark's flesh with his knife to test the reaction, so that Stark should not malinger. He reckoned without Stark's control. The Earthman bore his prodding without so much as a twitch, until his limbs were completely his own again. Then he sprang up and pitched the man half the length of the hall, turning over and over, yelling with startled anger. At the next period of labor, Stark was driven with the rest out into the city of the Lost Ones. End of Part 6 Section 7 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 7 of Enchantress of Venus Stark had been in places before that oppressed him with a sense of their strangeness or their wickedness. Sinharad, the lovely ruin of coral and gold lost in the Martian wastes. Jakara, Valkis, the low canal towns that smell of blood and wine. The cliff caves of Arianarod on the edge of Darkseid, the buried tomb cities of Callisto. But this, this was a nightmare to haunt a man's dreams. He stared about him as he went in the long line of slaves, and felt such a cold shuddering contraction of his belly as he had never known before. Wide avenues paved with polished blocks of stone, perfect as even mirrors. Buildings, tall and stately, pure and plain, with a calm strength that could outlast the ages. Black, all black, with no fripperies of paint or carving to soften them, only here and there a window like a drowned jewel glinting through the red. Vines like drifts of snow cascading down the stones, 
gardens with close-clipped turf and flowers lifting bright on their green stalks, their petals open to a daylight that was gone, their head bending as though to some forgotten breeze. All neat, all tended, the branches pruned, the fresh soil turned this morning. By whose hand? Stark remembered the great forest dreaming at the bottom of the gulf, and shivered. He did not like to think how long ago these flowers must have opened their young bloom to the last light they were ever going to see. For they were dead, dead as the forest, dead as the city, forever bright and dead. Stark thought that it must always have been a silent city. It was impossible to imagine noisy throngs flocking to a market square down those immense avenues. The black walls were not made to echo song or laughter. Even the children must have moved quietly along the garden paths, small wise creatures born to an ancient dignity. He was beginning to understand now the meaning of that weird forest. The Gulf of Sharoon had not always been a gulf. It had been a valley, rich, fertile, with this great city in its arms, and here and there on the upper slopes of the retreat of some noble or philosopher, of which the castle of the Lahari was a survivor. A wall or rock had held back the Red Sea from this valley. And then, somehow, the wall had cracked, and the sullen crimson tide had flowed slowly, slowly into the fertile bottoms, rising higher, lapping the towers and the treetops in swirling flame, drowning the land forever. Stark wondered if the people had known the disaster was coming, if they had gone forth to tend their gardens for the last time, so that they might remain perfect in the embalming gases of the sea. The columns of slaves herded by overseers armed with small black weapons similar to the one Egil had used came out into a broad square whose farther edges were veiled in the red murk. And Stark looked on the ruin. A great building had fallen in the center of the square. The gods only knew what force had burst its walls and tossed the giant blocks like pebbles into a heap. But there it was, the one untidy thing in the city, a mountain of debris. Nothing else was damaged. It seemed that this had been the place of temples and they stood unharmed, ranked around the sides of the square, the dim fires rippling through their open porticos. Deep in their inner shadows, Stark thought he could make out images, gigantic things brooding in the spark-shot gloom. He had no chance to study them. The overseers cursed them on, and now he saw what use the slaves were put to. They were clearing away the wreckage of the fallen building. Helvey whispered, "'For sixteen years men have slaved and died down here, and the work is not half done. And why do the Lahari want it done at all? I'll tell you why. Because they are mad, mad as swamp dragons gone musteth in the spring. It seemed madness, indeed, to labor at this pile of rocks in a dead city at the bottom of the sea. It was madness. And yet the Lahari— although they might be insane, were not fools. There was a reason for it, and Stark was sure it was a good reason, good for the Lahari, at any rate. An overseer came up to Stark, thrusting him roughly forward toward a sledge already partly loaded with broken rocks. Stark hesitated, his eyes turning ugly, and Helvey said, "'Come on, you fool! Do you want to be down flat on your back again?' Stark glanced at the little weapon, blunt and ready, and turned reluctantly to obey. And there began his servitude. It was a weird sort of life he led. For a while he tried to reckon time by the periods of work and sleep, but he lost count, and it did not greatly matter anyway. He labored with the others, hauling the huge blocks away, clearing out the cellars that were partly barred, shoring up weak walls underground. The slaves clung to their old habit of thought, calling the work periods days and the sleep periods nights. Each day Egil, or his brother Cond, came to see what had been done, and went away black-browed and disappointed, ordering the work speeded up. Creon was there also much of the time. 
he would come slowly in his awkward, crab-wise way and perch like a pale gargoyle on the stones, never speaking, watching with his sad, beautiful eyes. He woke a vague foreboding in Stark. There was something awesome in Treon's silent patience, as though he waited the coming of some black doom, long delayed but inevitable. Stark would remember the prophecy and shiver. It was obvious to Stark after a while that the Lahari were clearing the building to get at the cellars underneath. The great dark caverns already barred had yielded nothing, but the brothers still hoped. Over and over, Cond and Egil sounded the walls and the floors, prying here and there, and chafing at the delay in opening up the underground labyrinth. What they hoped to find, no one knew. Vara came too. Alone, and often, she would drift down through the dim, mist fires and watch, smiling a secret smile, her hair like blown silver where the currents played with it. She had nothing but curt words for Egil, but she kept her eyes on the great dark earth man, and there was a look in them that stirred his blood. Egil was not blind, and it stirred his too, but in a different way. Zareth saw that look. She kept as close to Stark as possible, asking no favors but following him around with a sort of quiet devotion, seeming contented only when she was near him. One night in the slave barracks she crouched beside his pallet, her hand on his bare knee. She did not speak, and her face was hidden by the floating masses of her hair. Stark turned her head so that he could see her, pushing the pale cloud gently away. "'What troubles you, little sister?' Her eyes were wide and shadowed with some vague fear. But she only said, "'It is not my place to speak.' "'Why not?' "'Because,' her mouth trembled, and then suddenly she said, "'Oh, it's foolish, I know. But the woman of the Lahari—' "'What about her?' "'She watches you. Always she watches you. And the Lord Egil is angry. There is something in her mind, and it will bring you only evil—' I know it. It seems to me, said Stark wryly, that the Lahari have already done as much evil as possible to all of us. No, answered Zareth, with an odd wisdom. Our hearts are still clean. Stark smiled. He leaned over and kissed her. I'll be careful, little sister. Quite suddenly she flung her arms around his neck and clung to him tightly, and Stark's face sobered. He patted her, rather awkwardly, and then she had gone, to curl up on her own pallet with her head buried in her arms. Stark lay down. His heart was sad, and there was a stinging moisture in his eyes. The red eternities dragged on. Stark learned what Helvey had meant when he said that the mind broke before the body. The sea bottom was no place for creatures of the upper air. He learned also the meaning of the metal collars, and the manner of Tobel's death. Helvey explained, There are boundaries laid down. Within them we may range, if we have the strength and the desire after work. Beyond them we may not go, and there is no chance of escape by breaking through the barrier. How this is done I do not understand, but it is so, and the collars are the key to it. When a slave approaches the barrier, the collar brightens as though with fire, and the slave falls. I have tried this myself, and I know. Half paralyzed, you may still crawl back to safety. But if you are mad, as Tobel was, and charge the barrier strongly. He made a cutting motion with his hands. Stark nodded. He did not attempt to explain electricity or electronic vibrations to Helvey but it seemed plain enough that the force with which the Lahari kept their slaves in check was something of the sort. The callers acted as conductors, perhaps for the same type of beam that was generated in the hand weapons. When the metal broke the invisible boundary line, it triggered off a force beam from the central power station, in the manner of the obedient electric eye that opens doors and rings alarm bells. First a warning, then death. The boundaries were wide enough, extending around the city and enclosing a good bit of forest beyond it. 
There was no possibility of a slave hiding among the trees, because the collar could be traced by the same type of beam, turned to low power, and the punishment meted out to a retaken man was such that few were foolish enough to try that game. The surface, of course, was utterly forbidden. The one unguarded spot was the island where the central power station was, and here the slaves were allowed to come sometimes at night. The Lahari had discovered that they lived longer and worked better if they had an occasional breath of air and a look at the sky. Many times Stark made that pilgrimage with the others. Up from the red depths they would come, through the reeling bands of fire where the currents ran, through the clouds of crimson sparks and the sullen patches of stillness that were like pools of blood, a company of white ghosts shrouded in flame, rising from their tomb for a little taste of the world they had lost. It didn't matter that they were so weary they had barely the strength to get back to the barracks and sleep. They found the strength. To walk again on the open ground, to be rid of the eternal crimson dusk and the oppressive weight on the chest, to look up into the hot blue night of Venus and smell the fragrance of the lia tree borne on the land wind. They found the strength. They sang here, sitting on the island rocks and staring through the mist toward the shore they would never see again. It was their chanting that Stark had heard when he came down the gulf with Malthor, that wordless cry of grief and loss. Now he was here himself, holding Zareth close to comfort her and joining his own deep voice into that primitive reproach to the gods. While he sat, howling like the savage he was, he studied the power plant, a squat blockhouse of a place. On the nights the slaves came, guards were stationed outside to warn them away. The blockhouse was doubly guarded with the shock beam. To attempt to take it by force would only mean death for all concerned. Stark gave up the idea for the time being. There never was a second when escape was not in his thoughts, but he was too old in the game to break his neck against a stone wall. Like Malthor, he would wait. Zareth and Helvi both changed after Stark's coming. Though they never talked of breaking free, both of them lost their air of hopelessness. Stark made neither plans nor promises. But Helvi knew him from of old, and the girl had her own subtle understanding, and they held up their heads again. Then, one day, as the work was ending, Vara came smiling out of the red murk and beckoned to him, and Stark's heart gave a great leap. Without a backward look he left Helvi and Zareth, and went with her, down the wide still avenue that led outward to the forest. End of Part 7 Section 8 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 8 of Enchantress of Venus They left the stately buildings in the wide spaces behind them, and went in among the trees. Stark hated the forest. The city was bad enough, but it was dead, honestly dead, except for those neat nightmare gardens. There was something terrifying about these great trees, full-leafed and green, rioting and flowering vines and all the rich undergrowth of the jungle, standing like massed corpses made lovely by mortuary art. They swayed and rustled as the coiling fire swept them, branches bending to that silent, horrible parody of wind. Stark always felt trapped there, and stifled by the stiff leaves and the vines. But he went, and Vara slipped like a silver bird between the great trunks, apparently happy. I have come here often, ever since I was old enough. It's wonderful. Here I can stoop and fly like one of my own hawks. She laughed and plucked a golden flower to set it in her hair, and then darted away again, her white legs flashing. Stark followed. He could see what she meant. Here, in this strange sea, one's motion was as much flying as swimming, since the pressure equalized the weight of the body. There was a queer sort of thrill in plunging headlong from the treetops, 
to arrow down through a tangle of vines and branches and then sweep upward again. She was playing with him, and he knew it. The challenge got his blood up. He could have caught her easily, but he did not. Only now and again he circled her to show his strength. They sped on and on, trailing wakes of flame, a black hawk chasing a silver dove through the forest of a dream. But the dove had been fledged in an eagle's nest. Stark wearied of the game at last. He caught her, and they clung together, drifting still among the trees with the momentum of that wonderful weightless flight. Her kiss at first was lazy, teasing, and curious. Then it changed. All Stark's smoldering anger leaped into a different kind of flame. His handling of her was rough and cruel, and she laughed, a little fierce, voiceless laugh, and gave it back to him, and remembered how he had thought her mouth was like a bitter fruit that would give a man pain when he kissed it. She broke away at last and came to rest on a broad branch, leaning back against the trunk and laughing, her eyes brilliant and cruel as Stark's own. And Stark sat down at her feet. "'What do you want?' he demanded. "'What do you want with me?' She smiled. There was nothing sidelong or shy about her. She was bold as a new blade. "'I'll tell you, wild man.' He started. "'Where did you pick up that name?' I've been asking the Earthman Larrabee about you. It suits you well. She leaned forward. This is what I want of you. Slay me Egil and his brother Cond. Also Boar, who will grow up worse than either, although I can do it myself, if you're adverse to killing children, though Boar is more a monster than a child. Grandmother can't live forever, and with my cousins out of the way, she's no threat. Treon doesn't count. And if I do, what then? Freedom, and me. You'll rule Shuron at my side. Stark's eyes were mocking. For how long, Vara? Who knows, and what does it matter? The years take care of themselves, she shrugged. The Lahari blood has run out, and as time there was a fresh strain. Our children will rule after us, and they'll be men. Stark laughed. He roared with it. It's not enough that I'm a slave to the Lahari. Now I must be executioner and herd bull as well. He looked at her keenly. Why me, Vara? Because, as I have said, you are the first man I've seen since my father died. Also, there is something about you. She pushed herself upward to hover lazily, her lips just brushing his. Do you think it would be so bad a thing to live with me, wild man? She was lovely and maddening, a silver witch shining among the dim fires of the sea, full of wickedness and laughter. Stark reached out and drew her to him. Not bad, he murmured, dangerous. He kissed her, and she whispered, I think you're not afraid of danger. On the contrary, I'm a cautious man. He held her off where he could look straight into her eyes. I owe Egil something on my own but I will not murder. The fight must be fair, and Con will have to take care of himself. Fair? Was Egil fair with you, or me? He shrugged. My way, or not at all. She thought it over for a while, then nodded. All right. As for Con, you will give him a blood debt, and pride will make him fight. The Lahari are all proud, she added bitterly. That is our curse, but it's bred in the bone, as you'll find out. One more thing. Zareth and Helvy are to go free, and there must be an end to this slavery. She stared at him. You drive a hard bargain, wild man. Yes or no? Yes and no. Zareth and Helvy you may have, if you insist, though the gods know what you see in that pallid child. As to the other, she smiled very mockingly, I'm no fool, Stark. You're evading me, and two can play that game. He laughed. Fair enough. And now tell me this, which with silver curls, how am I to get at Egil that I may kill him? I'll arrange that. She said it with such vicious assurance that he was pretty sure she would arrange it. He was silent for a moment, and then he asked, 
Vara, what are the Lahari searching for at the bottom of the sea? She answered slowly, I told you that we are a proud clan. We were driven out of the high plateaus centuries ago because of our pride. Now it's all we have left, but it's a driving thing. She paused and then went on. I think we had known about the city for a long time, but it had never meant anything until my father became fascinated by it. He would stay down here days at a time exploring, and it was he who found the weapons and the machine of power which is on the island. He found the chart and the metal book hidden away in a secret place. The book was written in pictographs, as though it was meant to be deciphered, and the chart showed the square with the ruined building and the temples, with a separate diagram of catacombs underneath the ground. The book told of a secret, a thing of wonder and of fear, and my father believed that the building had been wrecked to close the entrance to the catacombs where the secret was kept. He determined to find it. Sixteen years of other men's lives. Stark shivered. What was the secret, Vara? The manner of controlling life. How it was done I do not know. But with it one might build a race of giants, of monsters, or of gods. You can see what that would mean to us, a proud and dying clan. Yes, answered Stark slowly. I can see. The magnitude of the idea shook him. The builders of the city must have been wise indeed in their scientific research to evolve such a terrible power. To mold the living cells of the body to one's will. To create, not life itself, but its form and fashion. A race of giants, or of gods. The Lahari would like that. To transform their own degenerate flesh into something beyond the race of men to develop their followers into a core of fighting men that no one could strike against, to see that their children were given an unholy advantage over all the children of men. Stark was appalled at the realization of the evil they could do if they ever found that secret. Vara said, There was a warning in the book. The meaning of it was not quite clear, but it seemed that the ancient ones felt that they had sinned against the gods and been punished, perhaps by some plague. They were a strange race, and not human. At any rate, they destroyed the great building there as a barrier against anyone who should come after them, and let the Red Sea in to cover their city forever. They must have been superstitious children, for all their knowledge. Then you all ignored the warning and never worried that a whole city had died to prove it. She shrugged. Oh, Terran has been muttering prophecies about it for years. Nobody listens to him. As for myself, I don't care whether we find the secret or not. My belief is it was destroyed along with the building. And besides, I have no faith in such things. Besides, mocked Stark shrewdly, you wouldn't care to see Egil and Cond striding across the heavens of Venus, and you're doubtful just what your own place would be in the new pantheon. She showed her teeth at him. You're too wise for your own good. And now goodbye. She gave him a quick, hard kiss and was gone, flashing upward, high above the treetops where he dared not follow. Stark made his way slowly back to the city, upset and very thoughtful. As he came back into the great square, heading toward the barracks, he stopped, every nerve taut. Somewhere, in one of the shadowy temples, the clapper of a votive bell was swinging, sending its deep pulsing note across the silence. Slowly, slowly, like the beating of a dying heart it came, and mingled with it was the faint sound of Zareth's voice calling his name. End of Section 8 Section 9 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 9 of Enchantress of Venus He crossed the square, moving very carefully through the red murk, and presently he saw her. It was not hard to find her. There was one temple larger than the rest. Stark judged that it must once have faced the entrance of the fallen building, 
as though the great figure within was set to watch over the scientists and philosophers who came there to dream their vast and sometimes terrible dreams. The philosophers were gone, and the scientists had destroyed themselves. But the image still watched over the drowned city, its hand raised both in warning and in benediction. Now, across its reptilian knees, Zareth lay. The temple was open on all sides, and Stark could see her clearly, a little white scrap of humanity against the black unhuman figure. Malthor stood beside her. It was he who had been tolling the votive bell. He had stopped now, and Zareth's words came clearly to Stark. Go away! Go away! They're waiting for you! Don't come in here! I'm waiting for you, Stark, Malthor called out, smiling. Are you afraid to come? And he took Zareth by the hair and struck her, slowly and deliberately, twice across the face. All expression left Stark's face, leaving it perfectly blank except for his eyes, which took on a sudden lambent gleam. He began to move toward the temple, not hurrying even then, but moving in such a way that it seemed an army could not have stopped him. Zareth broke free from her father. Perhaps she was intended to break free. Egil, she screamed, it's a trap. Again Malthor caught her, and this time he struck her harder, so that she crumpled down again across the image that watched with his jeweled, gentle eyes and saw nothing. She's afraid for you, said Malthor. She knows I mean to kill you if I can. Well, perhaps Egil is here also. Perhaps he's not. But certainly Zareth is here. I've beaten her well, and I shall beat her again, as long as she lives to be beaten, for her treachery to me. And if you want to save her from that, you outland dog, you'll have to kill me. Are you afraid? Stark was afraid. Malthor and Zareth were alone in the temple. The pillared colonnades were empty except for the dim fires of the sea. Yet Stark was afraid, for an instinct older than speech warned him to be. It did not matter. Zareth's white skin was mottled with dark bruises, and Malther was smiling at him, and it did not matter. Under the shadow of the roof and down the colonnade he went, swiftly now, leaving a streak of fire behind him. Malthor looked into his eyes, and his smile trembled and was gone. He crouched, and at the last moment, when the dark body plunged down at him as a shark plunges, he drew a hidden knife from his girdle and struck. Stark had not counted on that. The slaves were searched for possible weapons every day, and even a sliver of stone was forbidden. Somebody must have given it to him. Someone... The thought flashed through his mind while he was in the very act of trying to avoid that death blow. Too late, too late, because his own momentum carried him on to the point. Reflexes quicker than any man's, the hair-trigger reactions of a wild thing. Muscle straining, the center of balance shifted with an awful wrenching effort, his hands grasping at the fire-shot redness as though to force it to defy its own laws. The blade ripped a long, shallow gash across his breast, but it did not go home. By a fraction of an inch, it did not go home. While Stark was still off balance, Malthor sprang. They grappled. The knife blade glittered redly, a hungry tongue eager to taste Stark's life. The two men rolled over and over, drifting and tumbling erratically, churning the sea to a froth of sparks. And still the image watched, its calm reptilian features unchangingly benign and wise. Threads of darker red laced heavily across the dancing fires. Stark got Malthor's arm under his own and held it there with both hands. His back was to the man now. Malthor kicked and clawed with his feet against the back of Stark's thighs, and his left arm came up and tried to clamp around Stark's throat. Stark buried his chin so that it could not, and then Malthor's hand began to tear at Stark's face, searching for his eyes. Stark voiced a deep, bestial sound in his throat. He moved his head suddenly, catching Malthor's hand between his jaws. He did not let go. 
Presently his teeth were locked against the thumb joint, and Malther was screaming, but Stark could give all his attention to what he was doing with the arm that held the knife. His eyes had changed. They were all beasts now, the eyes of a killer blazing cold and beautiful in his dark face. There was a dull crack, and the arm ceased to strain or fight. It bent back upon itself, and the knife fell, drifting quietly down. Malthor was beyond screaming now. He made one effort to get away as Stark released him, but it was a futile gesture, and he made no sound as Stark broke his neck. He thrust the body from him. It drifted away, moving lazily with the suck of the currents through the colonnade, now and again touching a black pillar as though in casual wander, wandering out at last into the square. Malthor was in no hurry. He had all eternity before him. Stark moved carefully away from the girl, who was trying feebly now to sit upon the knees of the image. He called out to some unseen presence hidden in the shadows under the roof. Malthor screamed your name, Egil. Why didn't you come? There was a flicker of movement in the intense darkness of the ledge at the top of the pillars. Why should I? asked the Lord Egil of the Lahari. I offered him his freedom if he could kill you, but it seems he could not, even though I gave him a knife, and drugs to keep your friend Helvy out of the way. He came out where Stark could see him, very handsome in a tunic of yellow silk, the blunt black weapon in his hands. The important thing was to bait a trap. You would not face me because of this. He raised the weapon. I might have killed you as you worked, of course, but my family would have had hard things to say about that. You're a phenomenally good slave. And they'd have said hard words like coward Egil, Stark said softly, and Vara would have said her bird at you in earnest. Egil nodded. His lip curved cruelly. Exactly. That amused you, didn't it? And now my little cousin is training another falcon to swoop at me. She hooded you today, didn't she, Outlander? He laughed. Ah, oh, well, I didn't kill you openly because there's a better way. Do you think I want to be gossiped all over the Red Sea that my cousin jilted me for a foreign slave? Do you think I wished it known that I hated you, and why? No, I would have killed Malthor anyway, if you hadn't done it. "'because he knew. "'And when I have killed you and the girl, "'I shall take your bodies to the barrier "'and leave them there together. "'And it will be obvious to everyone, "'even Vara, "'that you were killed trying to escape.' "'The weapon's muzzle pointed straight at Stark, "'and Egil's finger quivered on the trigger stud. "'Full power this time. "'Instead of paralysis, death. "'Stark measured the distance "'between himself and Egil. He would be dead before he struck, but the impetus of his leap might carry him on and give Zareth a chance to escape. The muscles of his thighs stirred and tensed. A voice said, And it will be obvious how and why I died, Egil. For if you kill them, you must kill me, too. Where Trian had come from, or when, Stark did not know. But he was there by the image, and his voice was full of strong music and his eyes shone with a fey light. Egil had started, and now he swore in fury. You idiot! You twisted freak! How did you come here? How does the wind come, and the rain? I am not as other men. He laughed, a somber sound with no mirth in it. I am here, Egil, and that's all that matters. And you will not slay this stranger who is more beast than man, and more man than any of us. The gods have a use for him. He had moved as he spoke. Until now he stood between Stark and Egil. Get out of the way, said Egil. Trion shook his head. Very well, said Egil. If you wish to die, you may. The fey gleam brightened in Trion's eyes. This is a day of death, he said softly, but not of his or mine. Egil said a short, ugly word, and raised the weapon up. Things happened very quickly after that. Stark sprang, arching up and over Trion's head. 
cleaving the red gases like a burning arrow. Egil started back and shifted his aim upward, and his finger snapped down on the trigger stud. Something white came between Stark and Egil and took the force of the bolt. Something white. A girl's body, crowned with streaming hair, and a collar of metal glowing bright around the slender neck. Zareth. They had forgotten her. The beaten child crouched down on the knees of the image. Stark had moved to keep her out of danger, and she was no threat to the mighty Egil, and Treon's thoughts were known only to himself and the winds that taught him. Unnoticed, she had crept to a place where one last plunge would place her between Stark and death. The rush of Stark's going took him on over her, except that her hair brushed softly against his skin. Then he was on top of Egil, and it had all been done so swiftly that the lord of the Lahari had not had time to loose another bolt. Stark tore the weapon from Egil's hand. He was cold, icy cold, and there was a strange blindness on him, so that he could see nothing clearly but Egil's face. And it was Stark who screamed this time, a dreadful sound like the cry of a great cat gone beyond reason or fear. Treon stood watching. He watched the blood stream darkly into the sea, and he listened to the silence come, and he saw the thing that had been his cousin drift away on the slow tide, and it was as though he had seen it all before and was not surprised. Stark went to Zareth's body. The girl was still breathing, very faintly, and her eyes turned to Stark, and she smiled. Stark was blind now with tears. All his rage had run out of him with Egil's blood, leaving nothing but an aching pity and a sadness and a wondering awe. He took Zareth very tenderly into his arms and held her, dumbly, watching the tears fall on her upturned face. And presently he knew that she was dead. Some time later Treon came to him and said softly, To this end she was born, and she knew it, and was happy. Even now she smiles. And she should, for she had a better death than most of us. He laid his hand on Stark's shoulder. Come, I'll show you where to put her. She will be safe there, and tomorrow you can bury her where she would wish to be. Stark rose and followed him, bearing Zareth in his arms. Treon went to the pedestal on which the image sat. He pressed in a certain way upon a series of hidden springs, and a section of the paving slid noiselessly back, revealing stone steps leading down. End of Part 9 Section 10 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 10 of Enchantress of Venus Treon led the way down, into darkness that was lighted only by the dim fires they themselves woke in passing. No currents ran here. The red gas lay dull and stagnant, closed within the walls of a square passage built of the same black stone. These are the crypts, he said, the labyrinth that is shown on the chart my father found. And he told about the chart as Vara had. He led the way surely his misshapen body moving without hesitation past the mouths of branching corridors and the doors of chambers whose interiors were lost in shadow. The history of the city is here, all the books and the learning that they had not the heart to destroy. There are no weapons. They were not a warlike people, and I think that the force we of the Hilari have used differently was defensive only protection against the beasts and the raiding primitives of the swamps. With a great effort, Stark wrenched his thoughts away from the light burden he carried. I thought, he said dully, that the crypts were under the wrecked building. So we all thought. We were intended to think so. That is why the building was wrecked. And for sixteen years we of the Lahari have killed men and women with dragging the stones of it away. But the temple was shown also in the chart. We thought it was there merely as a landmark, an identification for the great building. But I began to wonder, How long have you known? 
Not long, perhaps two rains. It took many seasons to find the secret of this passage. I came here at night when the others slept. And you didn't tell? No, said Trion. You are thinking that if I had told, there would have been an end to the slavery and the death. But what then? My family turned loose with the power to destroy a world, as this city was destroyed? No, it was better for the slaves to die. He motioned Stark aside, then between the doors of gold that stood ajar, into a vault so great that there was no guessing its size in the red and shrouding gloom. This was the burial place of their kings, said Trion softly. Leave the little one here. Stark looked around him, still too numb to feel awe, but impressed even so. They were set in straight lines, the beds of black marble, lines so long that there was no end to them except the limit of vision. And on them slept the old kings, their bodies, marvelously embalmed, covered with silken palls, their hands crossed upon their breasts, their wise unhuman faces stamped with the mark of peace. Very gently, Stark laid Zareth down on a marble couch, and covered her also with silk, and closed her eyes and folded her hands. And it seemed to him that her face, too, had that look of peace. He went out with Trion, thinking that none of them had earned a better place in the Hall of Kings than Zareth. Trion, he said, yes? That prophecy you spoke when I came to the castle, I will bear it out. Trion nodded. That is the way of prophecies. He did not return toward the temple, but led the way deeper into the heart of the catacombs. A great excitement burned within him, a bright and terrible thing that communicated itself to Stark. Trion had suddenly taken on the stature of a figure of destiny, and the earthman had the feeling that he was in the grip of some current that would plunge on irresistibly until everything in its path was swept away. Stark's flesh quivered. They reached the end of the corridor at last, and there, in the red gloom, a shape sat waiting before a black, barred door. A shape grotesque and incredibly misshapen, so horribly malformed that by it Trion's crippled body appeared almost beautiful. Yet its face was as the faces of the images and the old kings, and its sunken eyes had once held wisdom, and one of its seven-fingered hands were still slim and sensitive. Stark recoiled. The thing made him physically sick, and he would have turned away, but Trion urged him on. Go closer. It is dead, embalmed, but it has a message for you. It has waited all this time to give that message. Reluctantly, Stark went forward. Quite suddenly, it seemed that the thing spoke. Behold me, look upon me, and take counsel before you grasp that power which lies beyond the door. Stark leaped back, crying out, and Trion smiled. It was so with me, but I have listened to it many times since then. It speaks not with a voice, but within the mind, and only when one has passed a certain spot. Stark's reasoning mind pondered over that. A thought record, obviously triggered off by an electronic beam. The ancients had taken good care that their warning would be heard and understood by anyone who should solve the riddle of the catacombs. Thought images, speaking directly to the brain, know no barrier of time or language. He stepped forward again, and once more the telepathic voice spoke to him. We tampered with the secrets of the gods. We intended no evil, but it was only that we loved perfection, and wished to shape all living things as flawless as our buildings and our gardens. We did not know that it was against the law. I was one of those who found the way to change the living cell. We used the unseen force that comes from the land of the gods beyond the sky and we so harnessed it that we could build from the living flesh as the potter builds from the clay. We healed the halt and the maimed, and made those stand tall and straight who came crooked from the egg, and for a time we were as brothers to the gods themselves. 
I myself, even I, knew the glory of perfection. And then came the reckoning. The cell, once made to change, would not stop changing. The growth was slow, and for a while we did not notice it, but when we did it was too late. We were becoming a city of monsters, and the force we had used was worse than useless, for the more we tried to mold the monstrous flesh to its normal shape, the more the stimulated cells grew and grew, until the bodies we labored over were like things of wet mud that flow and change even as you look at them. One by one the people of the city destroyed themselves, and those of us who were left realized the judgment of the gods and our duty. We made all things ready, and let the Red Sea hide us forever from our own kind, and those who should come after. Yet we did not destroy our knowledge. Perhaps it was our pride only that forbade us, but we could not bring ourselves to do it. Perhaps other gods, other races wiser than we, can take away the evil and keep only the good. For it is good for all creatures to be, if not perfect, at least strong and sound. But heed this warning, whoever you may be that listen. If your gods are jealous, if your people have not the wisdom or the knowledge to succeed where we failed in controlling this force, then touch it not, or you and all your people will become as I. The voice stopped. Stark moved back again and said to Trion incredulously, and your family would ignore that warning? Trion laughed. They are fools. They are cruel and greedy and very proud. They would say that this is a lie to frighten away intruders, or that human flesh would not be subject to the laws that govern the flesh of reptiles. They would say anything, because they have dreamed this dream too long to be denied. Stark shuddered and looked at the black door. The thing ought to be destroyed. Yes, said Trion softly. His eyes were shining, looking into some private dream of his own. He started forward, and when Stark would have gone with him, he thrust him back, saying, No, you have no part in this. He shook his head. I have waited, he whispered, almost to himself. The winds bade me wait, until the day was ripe to fall from the tree of death. I have waited, and at dawn I knew, for the wind said, Now is the gathering of the fruit at hand. He looked suddenly at Stark, and his eyes had in them a clear sanity, for all their feigness. You heard, Stark. We made those stand tall and straight who came crooked from the egg. I will have my hour. I will stand as a man for the little time that is left. He turned, and Stark made no move to follow. He watched Treon's twisted body recede, white against the red dusk, until it passed the monstrous watcher and came to the black door. The long, thin arms reached up and pushed the bar away. The door swung slowly back. Through the opening Stark glimpsed a chamber that held a structure of crystal rods and discs mounted on a frame of metal the whole thing glowing and glittering with a restless bluish light that dimmed and brightened as though it echoed some vast pulse beat. There was another apparatus, intricate banks of tubes and condensers, but this was the heart of it, and the heart was still alive. Trion passed within and closed the door behind him. Stark drew back some distance from the door and its guardian, crouched down, and set his back against the wall. He thought about the apparatus. Cosmic rays, perhaps, the unseen force that came from beyond the sky. Even yet, all their potentialities were not known. But a few luckless spacemen had found that, under certain conditions, they could do amazing things to human tissue. It was a line of thought Stark did not like at all. He tried to keep his mind away from Trion entirely. He tried not to think at all. It was dark there in the corridor, and very still, and the shapeless horror sat quiet in the doorway and waited with him. Stark began to shiver, a shallow animal twitching of the flesh. He waited. 
After a while he thought Treon must be dead, but he did not move. He did not wish to go into that room to see. He waited. Suddenly he leaped up, cold sweat bursting out all over him. A crash that echoed down the corridor, a crashing of shattered crystal, and a high singing note that trailed off into nothing. The door opened. A man came out. A man tall and straight and beautiful as an angel. A strong-limbed man with Treon's face, Treon's tragic eyes. And behind him the chamber was dark. The pulsing heart of power had stopped. The door was shut and barred again. Treon's voice was saying, There are records left, and much of the apparatus, so that the secret is not lost entirely. Only it is out of reach. He came to Stark and held out his hand. Let us fight together as men. And do not fear. I shall die long before this body changes. He smiled, the remembered smile that was full of pity for all living things. I know, for the winds have told me. Stark took his hand and held it. Good, said Treon. And now lead on, stranger with the fierce eyes. For the prophecy is yours, and the day is yours, and I who have crept about like a snail all my life know little of battles. Lead, and I will follow. Stark fingered the collar around his neck. Can you rid me of this? Treon nodded. There are tools and acid in one of the chambers. He found them and worked swiftly, and while he worked, Stark thought, smiling, and there was no pity in that smile at all. They came back at last into the temple, and Treon closed the entrance to the catacombs. It was still night, for the square was empty of slaves. Stark found Egil's weapon where it had fallen, on the ledge where Egil died. We must hurry, said Stark. Come on. End of section 10《Section 11 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 11 of Enchantress of Venus The island was shrouded heavily in mist and the blue darkness of the night. Stark and Treon crept silently among the rocks until they could see the glimmer of torchlight through the window slits of the power station. There were seven guards, five inside the blockhouse, two outside to patrol. When they were close enough, Stark slipped away, going like a shadow, and never a pebble turned under his bare foot. Presently he found a spot to his liking and crouched down. A sentry went by not three feet away, yawning and looking hopefully at the sky for the first signs of dawn. Treon's voice rang out, the sweet, unmistakable voice. "'Ho there, guards!' The sentry stopped and whirled around. Off around the curve of the stone wall, someone began to run, his sandals thud-thudding on the soft ground, and the second guard came up. "'Who speaks?' one demanded. "'The Lord Treon?' They peered into the darkness, and Treon answered, "'Yes.' He had come forward far enough so that they could make out the pale blur of his face keeping his body out of sight among the rocks and the shrubs that sprang up between them. "'Make haste,' he ordered. "'Bid them open the door, there.' He spoke in breathless jerks, as though spent. "'A tragedy! A disaster! Bid them open them!' One of the men leaped to obey, hammering on the massive door that was kept barred from the inside. The other stood, goggle-eyed, watching. Then the door opened spilling a flood of yellow torchlight into the red fog. "'What is it?' cried the men inside. "'What has happened?' "'Come out!' gasped Treon. "'My cousin is dead. The Lord Egil is dead, murdered by a slave.' He let that sink in. Three or more men came outside into the circle of light, and their faces were frightened, as though somehow they feared they might be held responsible for this thing. "'You know him,' said Treon, the great black-haired one from Earth. He has slain the Lord Egil and got away into the forest, and we need all extra guards to go after him, since many must be left to guard the other slaves, who are mutinous. 
You, and you. He picked out the four biggest ones. Go at once and join the search. I will stay here with the others. It nearly worked. The four took a hesitant step or two, and then one paused and said doubtfully, But my lord, it is forbidden that we leave our posts for any reason. Any reason at all, my lord? The Lord Cond would slay us if we left this place. And you fear the Lord Cond more than you do me, said Trayon philosophically. Ah, well, I understand. He stepped out full into the light. A gasp went up, and then a startled yell. The three men from inside had come out armed only with swords, but the two sentries had their shock weapons. One of them shrieked. It's a demon who speaks with Trion's voice. And the two black weapons started up. Behind them, Stark fired two silent bolts in quick succession. The men fell, safely out of the way for hours. Then he leapt for the door. He collided with two men who were doing the same thing. The third had turned to hold Trion off with his sword until they were safely inside. Seeing that Trion, who was unarmed, was in danger of being spitted on the man's point. Stark fired between the two lunging bodies as he fell, and brought the guard down. Then he was involved in a thrashing tangle of arms and legs, and a lucky blow jarred the shock weapon out of his hand. Trayon added himself to the fray. Pleasuring in his new strength, he caught one man by the neck and pulled him off. The guards were big men and powerful, and they fought desperately. Stark was bruised and bleeding from a cut mouth before he could get in a finishing blow. Someone rushed past him into the doorway. Trion yelled. Out of the tail of his eyes, Stark saw the Lahari sitting dazed on the ground. The door was closing. Stark hunched up his shoulders and sprang. He hit the heavy panel with a jar that nearly knocked him breathless. It slammed open and there was a cry of pain and the sound of someone falling. Stark burst through, to find the last of the guards rolling every which way over the floor. But one rolled over onto his feet again, drawing his sword as he rose. He had not had time before. Stark continued his rush without stopping. He plunged headlong into the man before the point was clear of the scabbard, bore him over and down, and finished the man off with a savage efficiency. He leaped to his feet, breathing hard, spitting blood out of his mouth, and looked around the control room. But the others had fled, obviously to raise the warning. The mechanism was simple. It contained a large black metal oblong about the size and shape of a coffin, equipped with grids and lenses and dials. It hummed softly to itself, but what his source of power was, Stark did not know. Perhaps those same cosmic rays harnessed to a different use. He closed what seemed to be a master switch, and the humming stopped, and the flickering light died out of the lenses. He picked up the slain guard's sword and carefully wrecked everything that was breakable. Then he went outside again. Trion was standing up, shaking his head. He smiled ruefully. It seems that strength alone is not enough, he said. One must have skill as well. The barriers are down, said Stark. The way is clear. Trion nodded, and went with him back into the sea. This time both carried shock weapons taken from the guards, six in all, with eagles. Total armament for war. As they forged swiftly through the red depths, Stark asked, What of the people of Sherud? How will they fight? Trion answered, Those of Malthor's breed will stand for the Lahari. They must, for all their hope is there. The others will wait until they see which side is safest. They would rise against the Lahari if they dared, for we have brought them only fear in their lifetimes. But they will wait and see. Stark nodded. He did not speak again. They passed over the brooding city, and Stark thought of Egil and of Malthor, who were part of that silence now, drifting slowly through the empty streets where the little currents took them, wrapped in their shrouds of dim fire. He thought of Zareth sleeping in the Hall of Kings, and his eyes held a cold, 
cruel light. They swooped down over the slave barracks. Treon remained on watch outside. Stark went in, taking with him the extra weapons. The slaves still slept. Some of them dreamed and moaned in their dreaming, and others might have been dead, with their hollow faces white as skulls. Slaves, one hundred and four, counting the women. Stark shouted out to them, and they woke, starting up on their pallets, their eyes full of terror. Then they saw who it was that called them, standing collarless and armed, and there was a great surging and a clamor that stilled as Stark shouted again, demanding silence. This time Helvey's voice echoed his. The tall barbarian had awakened from his drugged sleep. Stark told them, very briefly, all that had happened. "'You are freed from the collar,' he said. "'This day you can survive or die as men, and not slaves.' He paused, then asked, "'Who will go with me into Sharoon?' They answered with one voice, the voice of the Lost Ones, who saw the red pall of death begin to lift from over them. The Lost Ones, who had found hope again. Stark laughed. He was happy. He gave the extra weapons to Helvey and three others that he chose, and Helvey looked into his eyes and laughed, too. Treon spoke from the open door. "'They are coming!' Stark gave Helvey quick instructions and darted out, taking with him one of the other men. With Treon, they hid among the shrubbery of the garden that was outside the hall, patterned and beautiful, swaying its lifeless brilliance in the lazy drifts of fire. The guards came, twenty of them, tall armed men, to turn out the slaves for another period of labor, dragging the useless stones." and the hidden weapons spoke with their silent tongues. Eight of the guards fell inside the hall. Nine of them went down outside. Ten of the slaves died with blazing collars before the remaining three were overcome. Now there were twenty swords among ninety-four slaves, counting the women. They left the city and rose up over the dreaming forest, a flight of white ghosts with flames in their hair coming back from the red dusk and the silence to find the light again. Light and vengeance. The first pale glimmer of dawn was sifting through the clouds as they came up among the rocks below the castle of the Lahari. Stark left them and went like a shadow up the tumbled cliffs to where he had hidden his gun on the night he had first come to Sharoon. Nothing stirred. The fog lifted up from the sea like a vapor of blood and the face of Venus was still dark. Only the clouds were touched with pearl. Stark returned to the others. He gave one of his shock weapons to a swamplander with a cold madness in his eyes. Then he spoke a few final words to Helvey and went back with Treon under the surface of the sea. Treon led the way. He went along the face of the submerged cliff and presently he touched Stark's arm and pointed to where a round mouth opened in the rock. "'It was made long ago,' said Treon, "'so that the Lahari and their slaves might come and go and not be seen. Come, and be very quiet.' They swam into the tunnel mouth, and down the dark way that lay beyond, until the lift of the floor brought them out of the sea. Then they felt their way silently along, stopping now and again to listen." Surprise was their only hope. Treon had said that with the two of them they might succeed. More men would surely be discovered, and meet a swift end at the hands of the guards. Stark hoped Treon was right. They came to a blank wall of dressed stone. Treon leaned his weight against one side, and a great block swung slowly around on a central pivot. Guttering torchlight came through the crack. By it, Stark could see that the room beyond was empty. They stepped through, and as they did so, a servant in bright silks came yawning into the room with a fresh torch to replace the one that was dying. He stopped in mid-step, his eyes widening. He dropped the torch. His mouth opened to shape a scream, but no sound came, and Stark remembered that these servants were tongueless to prevent them from telling what they saw or heard in the castle. 
Treon said. The man spun about and fled, down a long, dim-lit hall. Stark ran him down without effort. He struck once with the barrel of his gun, and the man fell and was still. Treon came up. His face had a look almost of exaltation, a queer shining of the eyes that made Stark shiver. He led on, through a series of empty rooms, all somber black, and they met no one else for a while. He stopped at last before a small door of burnished gold. He looked at Stark once, and nodded, and thrust the panels open and stepped through. End of Section 11 Section 12 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 12 of Enchantress of Venus They stood inside the vast echoing hall that stretched away into darkness until it seemed there was no end to it. The cluster of silver lamps burned as before, and within their circle of radiance the Lahari started up from their places and stared at the strangers who had come in through their private door. Cond and Errol with her hands idle in her lap. Bore, pommeling the little dragon to make it hiss and snap, laughing at its impotence. Vara, stroking the winged creature on her wrist, testing with her white finger the sharpness of its beak. And the old woman, with a scrap of fat meat halfway to her mouth. They had stopped, frozen, in the midst of these actions. And Treon walked slowly into the light. "'You know me,' he said. A strange shivering ran through them. Now, as before, the old woman spoke first, her eyes glittering with a look as rapacious as her appetite. "'You are Treon,' she said, and her whole vast body shook. The name went crying and whispering off around the dark walls. Treon! 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 Con leaped forward, touching his cousin's straight strong body with hands that trembled. You have found it, he said, the secret. Yes, Treon lifted his silver head and laughed, a beautiful ringing bell note that sang from the echoing corners. I found it, and it's gone! Smashed! "'Beyond your reach forever. "'Egil is dead, and the day of the Lahari is done.' "'There was a long, long silence, "'and then the old woman whispered, "'You lie!' "'Treon turned to Stark. "'Ask him, the stranger who came bearing doom upon his forehead. "'Ask him if I lie.' "'Con's face became something less than human. "'He made a queer, crazed sound and flung himself at Treon's throat.' Bohr screamed suddenly. He alone was not much concerned with the finding or the losing of the secret, and he alone seemed to realize the significance of Stark's presence. He screamed, looking at the big dark man, and went rushing off down the hall, crying for the guard as he went, and the echoes roared and racketed. He fought open the great doors and ran out and as he did so the sound of fighting came through from the compound. The slaves, with their swords and clubs, with their stones and shards of rock, had come over the wall from the cliffs. Stark had moved forward, but Treon did not need his help. He had got his hands around Khan's throat, and he was smiling. Stark did not disturb him. The old woman was talking, cursing, commanding, "'choking on her own apoplectic breath. "'Errol began to laugh. "'She did not move, "'and her hands remained limp and open in her lap. "'She laughed and laughed, "'and Vara looked at Stark and hated him. "'You are a fool, wild man,' she said. "'You would not take what I offered you, "'so you shall have nothing, only death.' "'She slipped the hood from her creature "'and set it straight at Stark.' Then she drew a knife from her girdle and plunged it into Treon's side. Treon reeled back. His grip loosened and Con tore away, half-throttled, raging, his mouth flecked with foam. He drew his short sword and staggered in upon Treon. Furious wings beat and thundered around Stark's head, and talons were clined for his eyes. 
He reached up with his left hand and caught the brute by one leg and held it. Not long, but long enough to get one clear shot at Cond that dropped him in his tracks. Then he snapped the falcon's neck. He flung the creature at Vahar's feet and picked up the gun again. The guards were rushing into the hall now at the lower end, and he began to fire at them. Treon was sitting on the floor. Blood was coming in a steady trickle from his side, but he had the shock weapon in his hands, and he was still smiling. There was a great, boiling roar of noise from outside. Men were fighting there, killing, dying, screaming their triumph or their pain. The echoes raged within the hall, and the noise of Stark's gun was like a hissing thunder. The guards, armed only with swords, went down like ripe wheat before the sickle. But there were many of them, too many for Stark and Treon to hold for long. The old woman shrieked and shrieked, and was suddenly still. Helvi burst in through the press, with a knot of collared slaves. The fight dissolved into a whirling chaos. Stark threw his gun away. He was afraid now of hitting his own men. He caught up a sword from a fallen guard and began to hew his way to the barbarian. Suddenly Treon cried his name. He leaped aside, away from the men he was fighting, and saw Vara fall with the dagger still in her hand. She had come up behind him to stab, and Treon had seen and pressed the trigger stud just in time. For the first time there were tears in Treon's eyes. A sort of sickness came over Stark. There was something horrible in this spectacle of a family destroying itself. He was too much the savage to be sentimental over Vara, but all the same he could not bear to look at Treon for a while. Presently he found himself back to back with Helvi, and as they swung their swords, the shock weapons had been discarded for the same reason as Stark's gun. Helvi panted. "'It's been a good fight, my brother. We cannot win.' but we can have a good death, which is better than slavery. It looked as though Helvi was right. The slaves, unfortunately, weakened by their long confinement, worn out by overwork, were being beaten back. The tide turned, and Stark was swept with it into the compound, fighting stubbornly. The great gate stood open. Beyond it stood the people of Sharoon, watching, hanging back, as Treon had said, they would wait and see. In the front, leaning on his stick, stood Larrabee the Earthman. Stark cut his way free of the press. He leaped up onto the wall and stood there, breathing hard, sweating, bloody, with a dripping sword in his hand. He waved it, shouting down to the men of Sharoon. "'What are you waiting for, you scuts, you women? The Lahari are dead!' THE LOST ONES ARE FREED. MUST WE OF EARTH DO ALL YOUR WORK FOR YOU? HE LOOKED STRAIGHT AT LARRABEE. LARRABEE STARED BACK, HIS DARK SUFFERING EYES FULL OF BITTER MIRTH. OH, WELL, HE SAID IN ENGLISH, WHY NOT? HE THREW BACK HIS HEAD AND LAUGHED, AND THE BITTERNESS WAS GONE. HE VOICED A HIGH, SHRILL, REBEL YELL, AND LIFTED HIS STICK LIKE A cudgel, LIMPING TOWARD THE GATE and the men of Shuroon gave tongue and followed him. After that, it was soon over. They found Boar's body in the stable pens, where he had fled to hide when the fighting started. The dragons, maddened by the smell of blood, had slain him very quickly. Helvi had come through alive, and Larrabee, who had kept himself carefully out of harm's way after he had started the men of Shuroon on their attack. Nearly half the slaves were dead, and the rest wounded. Of those who had served the Lahari, few were left. Stark went back into the great hall. He walked slowly, for he was very weary, and where he set his foot there was a bloody print, and his arms were red to the elbows, and his breast was splashed with the redness. Treon watched him come, and smiled, nodding. "'It is as I said,' and I have outlived them all. Errol had stopped laughing at last. She had made no move to run away, and the tide of battle had rolled over her and drowned her unaware. 
The old woman lay still, a mountain of inert flesh upon her bed. Her hand still clutched a ripe fruit, clutched convulsively in the moment of death, the red juice dripping through her fingers. "'Now I am going, too,' said Trion, "'and I am well content. With me goes the last of our rotten blood, and Venus will be the cleaner for it. Bury my body deep, stranger with the fierce eyes. I would not have it looked on after this.' He sighed and fell forward. Orr's little dragon crept whimpering out from its hiding-place under the old woman's bed and scurried away down the hall, trailing its dragging rope. Stark leaned on the taffrail, watching the dark mass of Sharoon recede into the red mists. The decks were crowded with the outland slaves going home. The Lahari were gone, the lost ones freed forever, and Sharoon was now only another port on the Red Sea. Its people would still be wolf's heads and pirates, but that was natural, as it should be. The black evil was gone. Stark was glad to see the last of it. He would be glad also to see the last of the Red Sea. The offshore wind set the ship briskly down the gulf. Stark thought of Larrabee, left behind with his dreams of winter snows and city streets and women with dainty feet. It seemed that he had lived too long in Sharoon, and had lost the courage to leave it. "'Poor Larrabee,' he said to Helvey, who was standing near him. "'He'll die in the mud, still cursing it.' Someone laughed behind him. He heard a limping step on the deck, and turned to see Larrabee coming toward him. "'I changed my mind at the last minute,' Larrabee said. "'I've been below, lest I should see my muddy brats and be tempted to change it again.' He leaned beside Stark, shaking his head. "'Ah, oh, well, they'll do nicely without me. I'm an old man, and I've a right to choose my own place to die in. I'm going back to Earth with you.' Stark glanced at him. "'I'm not going to Earth.' Larrabee sighed. "'No, no, I suppose you're not. After all, you're no Earthman, really, except for an accident of blood.' "'Where are you going?' "'I don't know. Away from Venus, but I don't know where yet.' Larrabee's dark eyes surveyed him shrewdly. "'A restless, cold-eyed tiger of a man. That's what Vara said. "'He's lost something,' she said. "'He'll look for it all his life and never find it.' After that there was silence. The red fog wrapped them, and the wind rose and sent them scudding before it. Then— Faint and far off, there came a moaning wail, a sound like broken chanting that turned Stark's flesh cold. All on board heard it. They listened, utterly silent, their eyes wide, and somewhere a woman began to weep. Stark shook himself. It's only the wind, he said roughly, in the rocks by the strait. The sound rose and fell, weary, infinitely mournful, and the part of Stark that was Nachaka said that he lied. It was not the wind that keened so sadly through the mists. It was the voices of the lost ones who were forever lost, Zareth, sleeping in the Hall of Kings, and all the others who would never leave the dreaming city and the forest, never find the light again. Stark shivered and turned away, watching the leaping fires of the strait sweep toward them. End of Section 12 End of Enchantress of Venus Section 13 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 of Shadrach the Lost It was dark in the caves under Mercury. It was hot and there was no sound in them but the slow plodding of Trevor's heavy boots. Trevor had been wandering for a long time, lost in this labyrinth where no human being had ever gone before. And Trevor was an angry man. Through no fault or will of his own, he was about to die, and he was not ready to die. Moreover, it seemed a wicked thing to come to his final moment here in the stifling dark, buried under alien mountains as high as Everest. He wished now that he had stayed in the valley. 
Hunger and thirst would have done for him just the same, but at least he would have died in the open like a man, and not like a rat trapped in a drain. Yet there was not really much to choose between them as a decent place to die. A barren little hell-hole the valley had been, even before the quake, with nothing to draw a man there except the hope of finding sunstones, one or two of which could transform a prospector into a plutocrat. Trevor had found no sunstones. The quake had brought down a whole mountain wall on his ship, leaving him with a pocket torch, a handful of food tablets, a canteen of water, and the scant clothing he stood in. He had looked at the naked rocks, and the little river frothing green with chemical poisons, and he had gone away into the tunnels, the ancient blowholes of a cooling planet, gambling that he might find a way out of the valleys. Mercury's twilight belt is cut into thousands of cliff-locked pockets, as a honeycomb is cut into cells. There is no way over the mountains, for the atmosphere is shallow, and the jagged peaks stand up into airless space. Trevor knew that only one more such pocket lay between him and the open plains. If he could get to and through that last pocket, he had thought. But he knew now that he was not going to make it. He was stripped to the skin already, in the terrible heat. When the weight of his minor boots became too much to drag, he shed them, padding on over the rough rock with bare feet. He had nothing left now but the torch. When the light went, his last hope went with it. After a while, it went. The utter blackness of the grave shut down. Trevor stood still, listening to the pulse of his own blood in the silence, looking at that which no man needs a light to see. Then he flung the torch away and stumbled on, driven to flight still by the terror which was greater than his weakness. Twice he struck against the twisting walls and fell and struggled up again. The third time he remained on his hands and knees and crawled. He crept on, a tiny creature entombed in the bowels of a planet. The boar grew smaller and smaller, tightening around him. From time to time he lost consciousness, and it became increasingly painful to struggle back to an awareness of the heat and the silence and the pressing rock. After one of these periods of oblivion he began to hear a dull, steady thunder. He could no longer crawl. The boar had shrunk to a mere crack, barely large enough for him to pass through worm-like on his belly. He sensed now a deep, shuddering vibration in the rock. It grew stronger, terrifying in that enclosed space. Steam slipped wraith-like into the smothering air. The roar and the vibration grew into an unendurable pitch. Trevor was near to strangling in the steam. He was afraid to go on, but there was no other way to go. Quite suddenly, his hands went out into nothingness. The rock at the lip of the boar must have been rotten with erosion. It gave under his weight and pitched him head first into a thundering rush of water that was blistering hot and going somewhere in a great hurry through the dark. After that, Trevor was not sure of anything. There was the scalding heat and the struggle to keep his head up, and the terrible speed of the sub mercurian River racing to its destiny. He struck rock several times, and once he held his breath for a whole eternity, until the roof of the tunnel rose up again. He was only dimly aware of a long, sliding fall downward through a sudden brightness. It was much cooler. He splashed feebly, because his brain had not told his body to stop, and the water did not fight him. His feet and hands struck solid bottom. He floundered on, and presently the water was gone. He made one attempt to rise. After that, he lay still. The great mountains leaned away from the sun. Night came, and with it a storm and rain. Trevor did not know it. He slept, and when he woke, the savage dawn was making the high cliffs flame with white light. Something was screaming above his head. Aching and leaden still with exhaustion, he roused up and looked about him. He sat on a beach of pale gray sand. 
At his feet were the shallows of a gray-green lake that filled a stony basin some half-mile in breadth. To his left the underground river poured out of the cliff face, spreading into a wide, rifling fan of foam. Off to his right the water spilled over the rim of the basin to become a river again somewhere below and beyond the rim, veiled in mist and the shadow of a mountain wall, was a valley. Behind him, crowding into the edge of the sand, were trees and ferns and flowers, alien in shape and color, but triumphantly alive. And from what he could see of it, the broad valley was green and riotous with growth. The water was pure, the air had a good smell, and it came to Trevor that he had made it. He was going to live a little while longer, after all. Forgetting his weariness, he sprang up, and the thing that had hissed and screamed above him swooped down and passed the clawed tip of a leathery wing so close to his face that it nearly gashed him. He stumbled backward, crying out loud, and the creature rose in a soaring spiral and swooped again. Trevor saw a sort of flying lizard, jet black except for a saffron belly. He raised his arms to ward it off, but it did not attack him. And as it swept by, he saw something that awoke in him amazement, greed, and a peculiarly unpleasant chill of fear. Around its neck the lizard thing wore a golden collar, and set into the scaly flesh of its head, into the bone itself, it seemed, was a sunstone. There was no mistaking that small, vicious flash of radiance. Trevor had dreamed of sunstones too long to be misled. He watched the creature rise again into the steamy sky and shivered, wondering who, or what, had set that priceless thing into the skull of a flying lizard, and why. It was the why that bothered him the most. Sunstones are not mere adornments for wealthy ladies. They are rare, radioactive crystals, having a half-life one-third greater than radium and are used exclusively in the construction of delicate electronic devices dealing with frequencies above the first octave. Most of that relatively unexplored superspectrum was still a mystery, and the strangely jeweled and collared creature was circling above him filled Trevor with a vast unease. It was not hunting. It did not wish to kill him. But it made no move to go away. From far down the valley... Muted by distance to a solemn bell note that rolled between the cliffs, Trevor heard the booming of a great song. A sudden desire for concealment sent him in among the trees. He worked his way along the shore of the lake. Looking up through the branches, he saw the black wings lift and turn, following him. The lizard was watching him with its bright, sharp eyes. It noted the path of his movements through the ferns and flowers, as a hawk watches a rabbit. He reached the lip of the basin, where the water poured over a cataract several hundred feet high. Climbing around the shoulder of a rocky bastion, Trevor had his first clear look at the valley. Much of it was still vague with mist, but it was broad and deep, with a sweep of level plain and clumps of forest locked tight between the barrier mountains. And as he made out other details, Trevor's astonishment grew out of all measure. The land was under cultivation. There were clusters of thatched huts among the fields, and in the distance was a rock-built city, immense and unmistakable in the burning haze of dawn. Trevor crouched there, staring, and the winged lizard swung in lazy circles, watching waiting, while he tried to think. A fertile valley such as this was rare enough in itself, but to find fields and a city was beyond belief. He had seen the aboriginal tribes that haunt some of the cliff-locked worlds of the Twilight Belt, subhuman peoples who live precariously among the bitter rocks and boiling springs, hunting the great lizards for food. None of this was ever built by them. Unless, in this environment, they had advanced beyond the age of stone. The gong sounded again its deep, challenging note. Trevor saw the tiny figures of mounted men, no larger than ants at that distance, come down from the city and ride out across the plain. 
Relief and joy supplanted speculation in Trevor's mind. He was battered and starving, lost on an alien world, and anything remotely approaching the human and the civilized was better luck than he could have dreamed or prayed for. Besides, there were sunstones in this place. He looked hungrily at the head of the circling watcher, and then began to scramble down the broken outer face of the bastion. The black wing slipped silently after him down the sky. About a hundred feet above the valley floor he came to an overhang. There was no way past it but to jump. He clung to a bush and let himself down as far as he could, and then dropped some four or five yards to a slope of springy turf. The fall knocked the wind out of him, and as he lay gasping a chill of doubt crept into his mind. He could see the land quite clearly now, the pattern of the fields, the far-off city. Except for the group of riders, nothing stirred. The fields, the plain were empty of life, the little villages still as death. And he saw, swinging lazily above a belt of trees by the river, a second black-winged shadow, watching. The trees were not far away. The riders were coming toward them and him. It seemed to Trevor now that the men were perhaps a party of hunters, but there was something alarming about the utter disappearance of all other life. It was as though the gong had been a warning for all to take cover while the hunt was abroad. The sharp-eyed lizards were the hounds that went before to find and flush the game. Glancing up at the ominous sentinel above his own head, Trevor had a great desire to see what the quarry was that hid in the belt of trees. There was no way back to the partial security of the lake basin. The overhang cut him off from that. The futility of trying to hide was apparent, but nevertheless he wormed in among some crimson ferns. The city was at his left. To the right, the fertile plain washed out into a badland of lava and shattered rock which narrowed and vanished around a shoulder of purple basalt. This defile was still in deep shadow. The riders were still far away. He saw them splash across a ford, toy figures making little bursts of spray. The watcher above the trees darted suddenly downward. The quarry was breaking cover. Trevor's suspicions crystallized into an ugly certainty. Horror struck, he watched the bronzed, half-naked figure of a girl emerge from the brilliant undergrowth and run like an antelope toward the badland. The flying lizard rose, swooped, and struck. The girl flung herself aside. She carried a length of sapling bound with great thorns, and she lashed out with it at the black brute, grazed it, and ran on. The lizard circled and came at her again from behind. She turned— there was a moment of vicious confusion, in which the leathery wings enveloped her in a kind of dreadful cloak, and then she was running it again, but less swiftly, and Trevor could see the redness of blood on her body. And again the flying demon came. The thing was trying to hurt her, turn her back toward the huntsman. But she would not be turned. She beat with her club at the lizard, and ran, and fell, and ran again. And Trevor knew that she was beaten. The brute would have the life out of her before she reached the rocks. Every dictate of prudence told Trevor to stay out of this. Whatever was going on was obviously the custom of the country, and none of his business. All he wanted was to get hold of one of these sunstones and then find a way out of this valley. That was going to be trouble enough without taking on any more. But Prudence was swept away in the fury that rose in him as he saw the hawk swoop down again, with his claws outspread and hungry for the girl's tormented flesh. He sprang up, shouting for her to fight, to hang on, and went running full speed down the slope toward her. She turned upon him a face of such wild, fierce beauty as he had never seen the eyes dark and startled and full of a terrible determination. Then she screamed at him in his own tongue, Look out! He had forgotten his own nemesis. Black wings, claws, 
and the lash of a scaly tail striking like a whip, and Trevor went down, rolling over and staining the turf red as he rolled. From far off he heard the voices of the huntsmen, shrill and strident, lifted in a wild halloo. End of section 13 Section 14 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of Shadrach the Last For some reason, the assault steadied Trevor. He got to his feet and took the club out of the girl's hands, regretting the gun that was buried under a ton of rock on the other side of the mountains. "'Stay behind me,' he said. "'Watch my back.' She stared at him strangely, but there was no time for questions. They began to run together toward the badland. It seemed a long way off. The lizards screamed and hissed above them. Trevor hefted the club. It was about the size and weight of a baseball bat. He had once been very good at baseball. "'They're coming,' said the girl. "'Lie down flat,' he told her, and went on, more slowly." She dropped behind him in the grass, her fingers closing over a fragment of stone. The wide wings whistled down. Trevor braced himself. He could see the evil eyes, yellow and bright as the golden collars, and the brilliant flash of the sunstones against the jetty scales of the head. They were attacking together, but at different angles, so that he could not face them both. He chose the one that was going to reach him first, and waited. He let it get close, very close, diving swiftly with a scarlet tongue, forking out of its hissing mouth and its sharp claws spread. Then he swung the club with all his mind. It connected. He felt something break. The creature screamed, and then the force of its dive carried it on into him and he lost his footing in a welter of thrashing wings and foundering body. He fell, and the second lizard was on him. The girl rose. In three long strides she reached him and flung herself upon the back of the scaly thing that ravaged him. He saw her trying to pin it to the ground, hammering methodically at its head with the stone. He kicked off the wounded one. He had broken its neck, but it was in no hurry to die. He caught up the club, and presently the second brute was dead. Trevor found it quite easy to pick up the sunstone. He held it in his hand, a strange, tawny, jewel-like thing, with a scrap of bone still clinging to it. It glinted with inner fires, deep and subtle, and an answering spark of wild excitement was kindled in Trevor from the very touch and feel of it, so that he forgot where he was or what he was doing forgot everything but the eerie crystal that gleamed against his palm. It was more than a jewel, more even than wealth, that he held there. There was hope and success and a new life. He had thrown years away prospecting the bitter Mercurian wastes. This trip had been his last gamble, and it had ended with his ship gone, his quest finished, and nothing to look forward to even if he did get back safely but to become one of the penniless, aging, planet-drifters he'd always pitied. Now all that was changed. This single stone would let him go back to Earth a winner and not a failure. It would pay off all the dreary, lonesome, hazardous years. It would. It would do so many things if he could get out of this godforsaken valley with it. If. The girl had got her breath again. Now she said urgently, "'Come, they're getting near.' Trevor's senses, bemused by the sunstone, registered only vaguely the external stimuli of sight and sound. The riders had come closer. The beasts they rode were taller and slighter than horses. They were not hoofed, but clawed. They had narrow, vicious-looking heads with spiny crests that stood up erect and arrogant. They came fast, carrying their riders lightly. The men were still too far away to distinguish features, but even at that distance Trevor sensed something peculiar about their faces, 
something unnatural. They wore splendid harness, and their half-clad bodies were bronzed, but not nearly so deeply as the girls. The girls shook him furiously, stirring him out of his dream. Do you want to be taken alive? Before, the beast would have torn us apart, and that is quickly over. But we killed the hawks. Don't you understand? Now they will take us alive. He did not understand in the least, but her obvious preference for a very nasty death instead of capture made him find reserves of strength he thought he had lost in the underground river. There was also the matter of the sunstone. If they caught him with it, they would want it back. Clutching the precious thing, he turned with the girl and ran. The lava bed was beginning to catch the sun now. The splintered rock showed through, bleak and ugly. The bad land and the defile beyond seemed like an entrance into hell, but it did offer shelter of a sort, if they could make it. The drumming of padded feet behind was loud in his ears. He glanced over his shoulder once. He could see the faces of the huntsmen now. They were not good faces, in either feature or expression, and he saw the thing about them that he had noticed before, the unnatural thing. In the center of each forehead, above the eyes, a sunstone was set into flesh and bone. First the hawk lizards, and now these. Trevor's heart contracted with an icy pang. These men were human, as human as himself, and yet they were not. They were alien and wicked, and altogether terrifying, and he began to understand why the girl did not wish to come alive into their hands. Fleet, implacable, the crested mounts with their strange riders were sweeping in upon the two who fled. The leader took from about his saddle a curved throwing stick and held it, poised. The sunstone set in his brow flashed like a third and evil eye. The lava and the fangs of rock shimmered in the light. Trevor yearned toward them. The brown girl running before him seemed to shimmer also. It hurt very much to breathe. He thought he could not go any farther. But he did, and when the girl faltered he put his arm around her and steadied her on. He continued to keep an eye out behind him. He saw the curved black stick come hurtling toward him, and he managed to let it go by. The others were ready now as they came within range. It seemed to Trevor that they were watching him with a peculiar intensity, as though they had recognized him as a stranger and had almost forgotten the girl in their desire to take him. His bare feet trod on lava already growing hot under the sun. A spur of basalt reared up and made a shield against the throwing sticks. In a minute or two, Trevor and the girl were hidden in a terrain of such broken roughness as the man had seldom seen. It was as though some demonic giant had whipped the molten lava with the pudding spoon, cracking mountains with his free hand and tossing in the pieces. He understood now why the girl had waited for daylight to make her break. To attempt this passage in the dark would have been suicidal. He listened nervously for sounds of pursuit. He could not hear any, but he remained uneasy, and when the girl flung herself down to rest, he asked, "'Shouldn't we go farther? They might still come.' She did not answer him at once, beyond a shake of the head. He realized that she was looking at him almost as intently as the writers had. It was the first chance she had had to examine him, and she was making the most of it. She noted the cut of his hair, the stubble of beard, the color and texture of his skin, the rags of his shorts that were all he had to cover him. Very carefully she noted them, and then she said in an odd, slow voice, as though she were thinking of something else, "'Mounted, the Corins are afraid of nothing. But afoot, and in here, they are afraid of ambush. It has happened before. They can die, you know, just the same as we do.' Her face, for all its youth, was not the face of a girl. It was a woman who looked at Trevor, a woman who had already learned the happy, the passionate, and the bitter things, 
who had lived with pain and fear and knew better than to trust anyone but herself. "'You aren't one of us,' she said. "'No, I came from beyond the mountains.' He could not tell whether she believed him or not. "'Who or what are the Corins?' "'The lords of Corith,' she answered, and began to tear strips from the length of white linen cloth she wore twisted about her waist. "'There will be time to talk later. We still have far to go. Here, this will stop the bleeding.' In silence they bound each other's wounds and started off again. If Trevor had not been so unutterably weary, and the way so hard, he would have been angry with the girl.' And yet there was nothing really to be angry about, except that he sensed she was somehow suspicious of him. Many times they had to stop and rest. Once he asked her, Why were they, the Corins, hunting you? I was running away. Why were they hunting you? Damned if I know. Accident, perhaps. I happened to be where their hawks were flying. The girl wore a chain of iron links around her neck a solid chain with no clasp, too small to be pulled over the head. From it hung a round tag with a word stamped on it. Trevor took the tag in his hand. Galt, he read. Is that your name? My name is Jen. Galt is the Corinne I belong to. He led the hunt. She gave Trevor a look of fierce and challenging pride and said, as though she were revealing some secret earldom. I am a slave. How long have you been in the valley, Jen? You and I are the same stock, speaking the same language. Earth stock. How does it happen, a colony of this size that no one ever heard of? It's been nearly three hundred years since the landing, she answered. I've been told that for generations my people kept alive the hope that a ship would come from Earth and release them from the Corins. It never came. And, except by ship, there is no way in or out of the valley. Trevor glanced at her sharply. I found a way in, all right, and I'm beginning to wish I hadn't. And if there's no way out, where are we going? I don't know myself, said Jen and Rose. But my man came this way, and others before him. She went on, and Trevor went with her. There was no place else to go. The heat was unbearable and they crept in the shadows of the rocks whenever they could. They suffered from thirst, but there was no water. The shoulder of the purple basalt loomed impossibly tall before them, and seemed never to grow nearer. For most of the day they toiled across the lava bed, and at last, when they had almost forgotten that they had ever dreamed of doing it, they rounded the shoulder and came staggering out of the bad land into a narrow canyon that seemed like the scar of some cataclysmic wound in the mountain. Rock walls, raw and riven, rose out of sight on either side, the twisted strata showing streaks of crimson and white and sullen okra. A little stream crawled in a stony bed, and not much grew beside it. Jan and Trevor fell by the stream and while they were still sprawled on the moist gravel, lapping like dogs at the bitter water, men came quietly from among the rocks and stood above them, holding weapons made of stone. Trevor got slowly to his feet. There were six of these armed men. Like the girl, they wore loincloths of white cotton, much frayed, and like her they were burned almost black by a lifetime of exposure to a brutal sun. They were all young, knotted and sinewy from hard labor, their faces grim beyond their years. All bore upon their bodies the scars of talons, and they looked at Trevor with a cold, strange look. They knew Jen, or most of them did. She called them gladly by name, and demanded, Hugh, where's Hugh? One of them nodded toward the farther wall. Up there in the caves. He's all right. Who is this man, Jen? She turned to study Trevor. I don't know. They were hunting him, too. He came to help me. I couldn't have escaped without him. He killed the hawks. But, she hesitated, choosing her words carefully. He says he came from beyond the mountains. 
He knows of earth and speaks our tongue. And when he killed the hawks, he smashed the skull of one and took the sunstone. All six stared at that. And the tallest of them, a young man with a face as bleak and craggy as the rocks around them, came toward Trevor. Why did you take the sunstone? he asked. His voice held an ugly edge. Trevor stared at him. Why the devil do you suppose? Because it's valuable. The man held out his hand. Give it to me. The hell I will, cried Trevor furiously. He backed away, just a little, getting set. The young man came on, and his face was dark and dangerous. Saul, wait, cried Jen. Saul didn't wait. He kept right on coming. Trevor let him get close before he swung and put every ounce of his strength behind the blow. The smashing fist took Saul squarely in the belly and sent him backward, doubled up. Trevor stood with hunched shoulders, breathing hard, watching the others with feral eyes. "'What are you?' he snarled. "'A bunch of thieves?' "'All right. Come on. I've got the stone the hard way, and I'm going to keep it.' Big words, a big anger, and a big fear behind them. The men were around him in a ring now. There was no chance of breaking away. Even if he did, he was so winded they could pull him down in minutes. The stone weighed heavy in his pocket, heavy as a half a lifetime of sweat and hunger and hard work on the rock piles of mercury. Saul straightened up. His face was still gray, but he bent again and picked up a sharp-pointed implement of rock that he had dropped. Then he moved forward, and the others closed in, at the same time, quite silently. There was a bitter taste in Trevor's mouth as he waited for them. To get his hands on a sunstone at last, and then to lose it and probably his life, too, to this crowd of savages. It was more than anybody ought to be asked to bear. "'Saul, wait!' cried Jen again, pushing in front of him. "'He saved my life. You can't just—' "'He's a Corin, a spy.' "'He can't be. There's no stone in his forehead, not even a scar.' Saul's voice was flat and relentless. He took a sunstone. Only a Corin would touch one of the cursed things. "'But he says he's from outside the valley. From earth, Saul. From earth.' Things would be different there. Jen's insistence on that point had at least halted the men temporarily, and Trevor, looking at Saul's face, had suddenly begun to understand something. You think the sunstones are evil, he said. Saul gave him a somber glance. They are, and the one you have is going to be destroyed. Now. Trevor swallowed the bitter anguish that choked him, and did some fast thinking. If the sunstones had a superstitious significance in this benighted pocket of mercury, and he could imagine why they might, with those damned unnatural hawks flying around with the equally unnatural corins, that put a different light on their attitude. He knew just by looking at their faces that it was, give him the sunstone or die. Dying at the hands of a bunch of wild fanatics didn't make sense. Better let them have the stone and gamble on getting it back again later, or on getting another one. They seemed plentiful enough in the valley. Sure, let's be sensible about it. Let's hand over a lifetime of hoping to a savage with horny palms, and not to worry about it. Let's... Oh, hell. Here, he said. All right, take it. It hurt. It hurt like giving up his own heart. Saul took it without thanks. He turned and laid it on a flat surface of rock, and began to pound the glinting crystal with the heavy stone he had meant to use on Trevor's head. There was a look on his lined, young, craggy face, as though he was killing a living thing, a thing that he feared and hated. Trevor shivered. He knew that sunstones were impervious to anything but atomic bombardment but it made him a little sick nonetheless to see that priceless object being battered by some crude stone club. It won't break, he said. You might as well stop. 
Saul flung down his weapon so close to Trevor's bare feet that he leaped back. Then he picked up the sunstone and hurled it as far as he could across the ravine. Trevor heard it clinking faintly as it fell, in among the rocks and rubble at the foot of the opposite cliff. He strained to mark the spot. "'You idiot!' he said to Saul. "'You've thrown away a fortune, the fortune I've spent my life trying to find. What's the matter with you? Don't you have any idea at all what those things are worth?' Saul ignored him, speaking bleakly to the others. No man with a sunstone is to be trusted. I say kill him. Jan said stubbornly, No, Saul, I owe him my life. But he could be a slave, a traitor, working for the Corins. Look at his clothes, said Jan. Look at his skin. This morning it was white, now it's red. Did you ever see a slave that color? Or a Corin, either. Besides, did you ever see him in the valley before? There aren't as many of us as that. We can't take any chances, Saul said. Not us. You can always kill him later. But if he is from beyond the mountains, perhaps even from earth. She said the word hesitantly, as though she did not quite believe there was such a place. He might know some of the things we've been made to forget. He might help us. Anyway, the others have a right to their say before you kill him. Saul shook his head. I don't like it, but... He hesitated, scowling thoughtfully. All right, we'll settle it up in the cave. Let's move. He said to Trevor, You go in the middle of us, and if you try to signal anyone... Who the devil would I signal to? retorted Trevor angrily. Listen, I'm sorry I ever got into your bloody valley. But he was not sorry, not quite. His senses were on the alert to mark every twist and turn of the way they went, the way that would bring him back to the sunstone. The ravine narrowed and widened and twisted, but there was only one negotiable path, and that was beside the stream bed. This went on for some distance and then the ravine split on a tremendous cliff of bare rock that tilted up and back as though arrested in the act of falling over. The stream flowed from the left-hand fork. Saul took the other one. They kept close watch on Trevor as he slipped and clambered and sprawled among them. The detritus of the primeval cataclysm that had shaped this crack in the mountains lay where it had fallen growing rougher and more dangerous with every eroding storm and cracking frost. Above him, on both sides, the mountain tops went up and still up, beyond the shallow atmosphere. Their half-seen summits leaned and quivered like things glimpsed from underwater, lit like torches by the naked blaze of the sun. There were ledges lower down. Trevor saw men crouched upon them, among heaps of piled stones. They shouted, and Saul answered them. In this narrow throat no man could get through alive if they chose to stop him. After a while they left the floor of the ravine and climbed a path, partly natural and partly so roughly hewn that it seemed natural. It angled steeply up the cliff face, and at its end was a narrow hole. Saul led the way through it, in single file the others followed, and Trevor heard Jen's voice echoing in some great hollow space beyond, calling Hugh. There was a cave inside, a very large cave with dim nooks and crannies around its edges. Shafts of sunlight pierced it here and there from cracks in the cliff face high above, and far at the back of it, where the floor tipped sharply down, a flame burned. Trevor had seen flames like that before on Mercury, where volcanic gases blowing up through a fissure had ignited from some chance spark. It was impressive, a small bluish column twisting upward into rock-curtained distance and roaring evilly. He could feel the air rush past him as the burning pillar sucked it in. There were people in the cave. Less than a hundred, Trevor thought not counting a handful of children and striplings. Less than a third of those were women. They all bore the same unmistakable stamp. 
Hard as life must be for them in the cave, it had been harder before. He felt his legs buckling under him with sheer weariness. He stood groggily with his back against the rough cave wall. A stocky young man with knotted shoulder muscles and sun-bleached hair was holding Jen in his arms. That would be Hugh. He, and the others, were shouting excitedly, asking and answering questions. Then, one by one, they caught sight of Trevor, and gradually the silence grew and spread. "'All right,' said Saul harshly, looking at Trevor. "'Let's get this settled.' "'You settle it,' said Trevor. "'I'm tired.' He glared at Saul and the unfriendly, staring crowd, and they seemed to rock in his vision. "'I'm an earth man. I didn't want to come into your damn valley. And I've been here a night and a day and haven't slept. I'm going to sleep.' Saul started to speak again, but Jan's man, Hugh, came up and stood in front of him. "'He saved Jan's life,' Hugh said. "'Let him sleep.' He led Trevor away to a place at the side where there were heaps of dried vines and mountain creepers, prickly and full of dust but softer than the cave floor. Trevor managed a few vague words of thanks and was asleep before they were out of his mouth. Hours, weeks— or perhaps it was only minutes later. A rough, persistent shaking brought him to again. Faces bent over him. He saw them through a haze, and the questions they asked penetrated to him slowly and without much meaning. Why did you want the sunstone? Why wouldn't I want it? I could take it back to earth and sell it for a fortune. What do they do with the sunstones on earth? Bill Gadgets, Super Electronic, to study things. Wavelengths too short for anything else to pick up. Thought waves, even. What do you care? Do they wear sunstones in their foreheads on earth? No? His voice trailed off, and the voices, or the dream of voices, left him. It was still daylight when he woke, this time normally. He sat up, feeling stiff and sore, but otherwise rested. Jan came to him, smiling, and thrust a chunk of what he recognized as some species of rock lizard into his hands. He gnawed at it wolfishly while she talked, having discovered that this was not the same day, but the next one, and quite late. They have decided, she said, to let you live. I imagine you had a lot to do with that. Thanks. She shrugged her bare shoulders with the raw wounds on them where the hawk lizards had clawed her. She had that exhausted, let-down look that comes after tremendous stress, and her eyes, even while she spoke to Trevor, followed Hugh as he worked at some task around the cave. "'I couldn't have done anything if they hadn't believed your story,' she told him. "'They questioned you when you were too far gone to lie.' He had a very dim memory of that." They didn't understand your answers, but they knew they were true ones. Also, they examined your clothes. No cloth like that is woven in the valley, and the things that hold them together, he knew she meant the zippers, are unknown to us. So you must have come from beyond the mountains. They want to know exactly how, and if you could get back the same way. No, said Trevor, and explained. Am I free to move around, then go where I want to? She studied him a moment before she spoke. You're a stranger. You don't belong with us. You could betray us to the Korans just as easily as not. Why would I do that? They hunted me, too. For sunstones, perhaps. You're a stranger. They would take you alive. Anyway, be careful. Be very careful what you do. From outside came a cry, Hawks! Take cover! Hawks! End of section 14 Section 15 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 of Shadrach the Last Instantly, everyone in the cave fell silent. They watched the places in the cave wall where the sunlight came in, 
the little cracks in the cliff face. Trevor thought of the hawk creatures, and how they would be wheeling and slipping along the ravine, searching. Outside, the rough rock looked all alike. He thought that in that immensity of erosions and crevices they would have a hard time finding the few tiny chinks that led into the cave. But he watched, too, intense with a feeling of danger. No sound at all came now from the ravine. In that utter stillness, the frightened whimper of a child came with the sudden loudness of a scream. It was instantly hushed. The shafts of sunlight crept slowly up the walls. Jen seemed not to breathe. Her eyes shone like an animal's. A black shadow flickered across one of the sunlight bars, flickered, and then was gone. Trevor's heart turned over. He waited for it to come back, to occlude that shaft of light, to slip along it and become a wide-winged demon with a sunstone in its brow. For a whole eternity he waited, but it didn't come back and then a man crept in through the entry hall and said, They're gone. Jan put her head down on her knees. She had begun to tremble all over, very quietly, but with spasmodic violence. Before Trevor could reach her, Hugh had her in his arms, talking to her, soothing her. She began to sob then, and Hugh glanced at Trevor across her shoulders. She's had a little too much. Yes, Trevor looked at the shafts of sunlight. Do the hawks come very often? They send them every once in a while, hoping to catch us off guard. If they could find the cave, they could hunt us out of it, drive us back into the valley. So far they haven't found it. Jan was quiet now. Hugh stroked her with big, awkward hands. She told you, I guess, about yourself, I mean. You've got to be careful— Yes, said Trevor. She told me. He leaned forward. Listen, I don't know how you people got here or what it's all about. After we got away from the Corins, Jen said something about a landing three hundred years ago. Three hundred earth years? About that, some of us have remembered enough to keep track. The first earth colonies were being started on Mercury about then, in two or three of the bigger valleys. "'Mining colonies. Was this one of them?' Hugh shook his head. "'No. The story is that there was a big ship loaded with some people from Earth. "'That's true, of course, because the ship is still here. What's left of it? "'And so are we. Some of the people on the ship were settlers and some were convicts.' "'He pronounced the word with the same hatred and scorn that always accompanied the name Corin.' Trevor said eagerly. They used to do that in the early days, use convict labor in the mines. It made so much trouble they had to stop it. Were the Corins? They were the convicts. The big ship crashed in the valley, but most of the people weren't killed. After the crash, the convicts killed the men who were in charge of the ship and made the settlers obey them. That's how it all started. And that's why we're proud we're slaves. "'because we're descended from the settlers. "'Trevor could see the picture quite clearly now, "'the more so because it had happened before in one way or another. "'The immigrant ship bound for one of the colonies, "'driven off its course by the tremendous magnetic disturbances "'that still made Mercury a spaceman's nightmare. "'They couldn't even have called for help or given their position.' The terrible nearness of the sun made any form of radio communication impossible. And then the convicts had broken free and killed the officers, finding themselves unexpectedly in command of a sort of paradise, with the settlers to serve them. A fairly safe paradise, too. Mercury has an infinite number of these twilight valleys, all looking more or less alike from space, half hidden under their shadow blankets of air, and only the few that are both accessible and unmistakable because of their size have permanent colonies. Straight up and down, by spaceship, is the only way in or out of most of them, and unless a ship should land directly on them by sheer chance, the erstwhile prisoners would be safe from discovery. But the sunstones, asked Trevor, touching his forehead, what about the sunstones and the hawks? 
they didn't have the use of them when they landed. No, they came later. You looked around uneasily. Look, Trevor, it's a thing we don't talk about much. You can see why, when you think what it's done to us. And it's a thing you shouldn't talk about at all. But how did they get them in their heads? And why? Especially, why do they waste them on the hawks? Jen glanced at him somberly from the circle of Hugh's arm. We don't know exactly, but the hawks are the eyes and ears of the Korans. And from the time they used the first sunstone, we've had no hope of getting free of them. The thing had been buried in Trevor's subconscious since last night's questioning came suddenly to the surface. Thought waves, that's it, sure. He leaned forward excitedly and Jen told him frantically to lower his voice. I'll be damned. They've been experimenting with sunstones for years on Earth, ever since they were discovered, but the scientists never thought of. Do they have the stones on Earth, too? asked Jen, with loathing. Oh, no, only the ones that are brought from Mercury. Something about Mercury being so close to the sun— Overdose of solar radiation and the extremes of heat, cold, and pressure while the planet was being made that formed that particular kind of crystal here. I guess that's why they're called sunstones. He shook his head. So that's how they work, direct mental communication between the corns and the hawks by means of the stones. Simple, too. Set them right in the skull, almost in contact with the brain. And you don't need all the complicated machines and senders and receivers they've been monkeying with in the labs for so long. He shivered. I'll admit, I don't like the idea, though. There's something repulsive about it. Hugh said bitterly, When they were only men and convicts, we might have beaten them some day, even though they had all the weapons. But when they became the Korans, he indicated the darkening the clothes of the cave. This is the only freedom we can ever have now. Looking at Hugh and Jan, Trevor felt a great upwelling of pity for them, and for all these far-removed children of Earth, who were now only hunted slaves to whom this burrow in the rock meant freedom. He thought with pure hatred of the Korans who hunted them, with the uncanny hawks that were the far-ranging eyes and ears and weapons. He wished he could hit them with— he caught himself up sharply. Letting his sympathies run away with him wasn't going to do anybody any good. The only thing that concerned him was to get a hold of that sunstone again and get out of this devil's pocket. He'd spent half a life hunting for the stone, and he wasn't going to let concern over perfect strangers sidetrack him now. The first step would be getting away from the cave. It would have to be at night. No watch was kept on the ledges, for the hawks did not fly in darkness, and the Korans never moved without the hawks. Most of the people were busy in those brief hours of safety. Women searched for edible moss and lichens. Some of the men brought water from the stream at the canyon fork, and others, with stone clubs and crude spears, hunted the great rock lizards that slept in the crevices, made sluggish by the cold. Trevor waited until the fourth night, and then, when Saul's water party left, he started casually out of the cave after them. "'I think I'll go down with them,' he told Jen and Hugh. "'I haven't been down that far since I got here.' There seemed to be no suspicion in them of his purpose. Jen said, "'Stay close to the others. It's easy to get lost in the rocks.' He turned and went into the darkness after the water party. He followed them down to the fork, and it was quite easy then to slip alongside the tumbled rock and leave them, working his way slowly and silently downstream. After several days in the dimness of the cave, he found that the starshine gave him light enough to move by. It was hard going, even so, and by the time he reached the approximate place where Saul had tried to kill him, he was bruised and cut and considerably shaken but he picked his spot carefully, crossed the stream, and began to search. The chill deepened, the rocks that had been hot under his hands turned cold, and the frost rime settled lightly on them, 
and Trevor shivered and swore and scrambled, fighting the numbness out of his body, praying that none of the loose rubble would fall on him and crush him. He had prospected on Mercury for a long time, otherwise he would not have lived. He found it more easily than he could have done by day, without a detector. He saw the cold, pale light of it gleaming, down among the dark, broken rock where Saul had thrown it. He picked it up. He dangled the thing in his palm, touching it with loving fingertips. It had a certain cold, repellent beauty, glimmering in the darkness, a freakish byproduct of Mercury's birth pangs, unique in the solar system. Its radioactivity was a type and potency harmless to living tissue, and its wonderful sensitivity had made it possible for physicists to explore at least a little into those unknown regions above the first octave. In a gesture motivated by pure curiosity, he lifted the stone and pressed it tight against the flesh between his brows. Probably it wouldn't work this way. Probably it had to be set deep into the bone. It worked. Oh, God, it worked. Something had him. Something caught him by the naked brain and would not let go. Trevor screamed. A thin, small sound was lost in the empty dark, and he tried again, but no sound would come. Something had forbidden him to scream. Something was in there, opening out the leaves of his brain like the pages of a child's book, and it wasn't a hawk or a corin. It wasn't anything human or animal that he had ever known before. It was something still and lonely and remote, as alien as the mountain peaks that towered upward to the stars, and as strong and as utterly without mercy. Trevor's body became convulsed. Every physical instinct was driving him to run, to escape, but he could not. In his throat now there was a queer, wailing whimper. He tried to drop the sunstone. He was forbidden. Rage began to come on the heels of horror, a blind protest against the indecent invasion of his most private mind. The whimpering rose to a sort of cat-like squall, an eerie and quiet insane sound in the narrow gorge, and he clawed with his free hand at the one that held the sunstone tight against his brows. He tore it loose a wrench that almost cracked his brain in two. A flicker of surprise, just before the contact broke, and then a fading flash of anger, and then nothing. Trevor fell down. He did not quite lose consciousness, but there was an ugly sickness in him, and all his bones had turned to water. It seemed a long time before he could get to his feet again. Then he stood there shaking. There was something in this accursed valley. There was something or someone who could reach out through the sunstones and take hold of a man's mind. It did that to the Korans and the Hawks, and it had done it for a moment to him, and the horror of that alien grasp upon his brain was still screaming inside him. But who? he whispered hoarsely. And then he knew that the word was wrong. What? for it was not human. It couldn't be human. Whatever it held him there wasn't man or woman, brute or human. It was something else, but what it was he didn't want to know. He only wanted to get out. Out. Trevor found that he had begun to run, bruising his shins against rocks. He got a grip on himself, forcing himself to stand still. His breath was coming in great gasps. He still had the sunstone clenched in his sweating palm, and he had an almost irresistible desire to fling the thing away with all his strength. But even in the grip of alien horror, a man could not throw away the goal of a half a lifetime, and he held it and hated it. He told himself that whatever it was that reached through the sunstones could not use them unless they were against the forehead, close to the brain. The thing couldn't harm him if he kept it away from his head. A terrible thought renewed Trevor's horror. He thought of the Korans, the men who wore sunstone set forever in their brows. Were they, always and always, in the icy, alien grip of that which had held him? And these were the masters of Jen's people? 
He forced that thought away. He had to forget everything except how to get free of this place. He started at once, still shaken. He couldn't go far before daylight, and he would have to lie up in the rocks through the day and try to make it to the valley wall the next night. He was glad when daylight came, the first fires of sunrise kindling the peaks that went above the sky. It was at that moment that a shadow flickered, and Trevor looked up and saw the hawks. Many hawks. They had not seen him. They were not heeding the rocks in which he crouched. They were flying straight up the ravine, not circling or searching now, but going with a sure purposefulness back the way he had come. He watched them uneasily. There were more than he had ever seen together before. But they flew on up the ravine without turning, and were gone. They weren't looking for me, he thought, but... Trevor should have felt relieved, but he didn't. His uneasiness grew and grew, stemming from an inescapable conclusion. The hawks were going to the cave. They were heading toward it in an exact line, turning neither right nor left, and this time they were not in any doubt. They, or whoever or whatever dominated them, knew this time exactly where to find the fugitives. But that's impossible, Trevor tried to tell himself. There's no way they could suddenly learn exactly where the cave is after all this time. No way? A thing was forcing its way up into Trevor's anxious thoughts, a realization that he did not want to look at squarely, not at all. But it would not be put down. It would not stop tormenting him, and suddenly he cried out to it, a cry of pain and guilt. No, it couldn't be. It couldn't be through me they learned. It fronted him relentlessly, the memory of that awful moment in the canyon when whatever had gripped him through the sunstone had seemed to be turning over the leaves of his brain like the pages of a book. The vast and alien mind that had gripped his in that dreadful contact had read his own brain clearly, he knew. And in Trevor's brain and memories it had found the secret of the cave. Trevor groaned in an agony of guilt. He crawled out of his rock heap and began to run back up the ravine, following the path the hawks had taken. There might still be time to warn them. Stumbling, running, he passed the canyon fork. And now, from above him in the canyon, he heard the sounds he dreaded. The sounds of women screaming and men shouting hoarsely in fury and despair. Farther on, over the rock scrambling, slipping, gasping for breath, he came to the cave mouth and the sight he had dreaded. The hawks had gone into the cave and driven out the slaves. They had them in the canyon now and they were trying to herd them together and drive them down toward the lava beds. But the slaves were fighting back. Dark wings beat and thundered in the narrow gorge between the walls of rock. Claws struck and lashing tails cut like whips. Men struggled and floundered and trampled each other. Some died. Some of the hawks died, too but the people were being forced farther down the canyon under the relentless swooping of the hawks. Then Trevor saw Jan. She was a little way from the others. Hugh was with her. He had shoved her into a protecting hollow and was standing over her with a piece of rock in his hands, trying to beat off a hawk. Hugh was hurt badly. He was not doing well. Trevor uttered a wild cry that voiced all the futile rage in him and bounded over a slope toward them. "'Hugh, look out!' he yelled. The hawk had risen, and then had checked and turned, to swoop down straight at Hugh's back. Hugh swung partly around, but not soon enough. The hawk's claws were in his body, deep. Hugh fell down. Jen was screaming when Trevor reached them. He didn't stop to snatch up a rock. He threw himself onto the hawk that had welded itself to Hugh's back. There was a horrid, slippery thrashing of wings under him, and the scaly neck of the thing was terribly strong between Trevor's hands, but not strong enough. He broke it. It was too late. 
When his sight cleared, Jan was staring in a strange wild way at the man and Hawk lying tangled together in the dust. When Trevor touched her, she fought him a little, not as though she saw him really, not as though she saw anything but Hugh's white ribs sticking out. Jan, for God's sake, he's dead. Trevor tried to pull her away. We've got to get away from here. There might be a chance. The Black Hawks were driving the humans down the canyon a little below them now, and if they could make the tumbled rocks below the cliff, there was a chance. End of section 15《Section 16 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4 of Shadrach, The Last He had to drag Jen. Her face had gone utterly blank. In the next minute he realized that they would never reach the rocks, and that there was no chance, none at all. Back from the winged whirl that was driving the humans— Two of the hawks came darting at them. Trevor swung Jan behind him and hoped fiercely he could get another neck between his hands before they pulled him down. The dark shadows flashed down. He could see the sunstones glittering in their heads. They struck straight at him. But at the last split second they swerved away. Trevor waited. They came back again, very fast, but this time it was at Jan they struck and not at him. He got her behind him again in time, and once more the hawks checked their strike. The truth dawned on Trevor. The hawks were deliberately refraining from hurting him. Whoever gives them their orders, the Korans or that other, doesn't want me hurt. He caught up Jan in his arms and started to run again toward the rocks. Instantly the hawk struck at Jan. He could not swing her clear in time. Blood ran from the long claw marks left in her smooth, tan shoulders. Jan cried out. Trevor hesitated. He tried again for the rocks, and Jan moaned as a swift, scaly head snapped at her neck. So that's it, Trevor thought furiously. I'm not going to be hurt, but they can drive me through Jan. And they could, too. He would never get Jan to the concealment of the rocks alive with those two wide-winged shadows tearing at her. He had to go the way they wanted, or they would leave her as they had left Hugh. "'All right!' Trevor yelled savagely at the circling demons. "'Let her alone. I'll go where you want.' He turned, still carrying Jan, plodding after the other slaves who were being herded down the canyon. All that day the hawks drove the humans down the watercourse, around the shoulder of basalt and out onto the naked sun-seared lava bed. Some of them dropped and lay where they were, and no effort of the hawks could move them on again. Much of the time Trevor carried Jan. Part of the time he dragged her. For long periods he had no idea what he did. He was in a daze in which only his hatred was still vivid, when he felt Jan pulled away from him. He struggled, and was held, and he looked up to see a ring of mounted men around him. Korans with their crested beasts, the sunstones glittering in their brows. They looked down at Trevor, curious, speculative, hostile, their otherwise undistinguished human faces made strangely evil and otherworldly by the winking stones. "'You come with us to the city,' one of them said curtly to Trevor, that woman goes with the other slaves. Trevor glared up at him. Why me, to the city? The Koran raised his riding whip threateningly. You'll do as you're ordered. Mount. Trevor saw that a slave had brought a saddle beast to him and was holding it, not looking either at him or the Korans. All right, he said. I'll go with you. He mounted and sat waiting, his eyes bright with the hatred that burned in him, bright as blown coals. They formed a circle around him, and the leader gave a word. They galloped off toward the distant city. Trevor must have dozed as he rode, for suddenly it was sunset, and they were approaching the city. Seeing it as he had before, 
far off and with nothing to measure it against but the overtopping titan peaks. It had seemed no more than a city built of rock. Now he was close to it. Black shadows lay on it, and on the valley, but halfway up the opposite mountain wall the light still blazed, reflected downward on the shallow sky, so that everything seemed to float in some curious dimension between night and day. Trevor stared, shut his eyes, and stared again. The size was wrong. He looked quickly at the Korans, with the eerie feeling that he might have shrunk to child size as he slept. But they had not changed, at least, relative to himself. He turned back to the city, trying to force it into perspective. It rose up starkly from the level plain. There was no gradual guttering out into suburbs, no softening down to garden villas or rows of cottages. It leapt up like a cliff and began, solemn, massive, squat, and ugly. The buildings were square, set stiffly along a square front. They were not tall. Most of them were only one story high. And yet Trevor felt dwarfed by them, as he had never felt dwarfed by the mightiest of Earth's skyscrapers. It was an unnatural feeling, and one that made him curiously afraid. There were no walls or gateways, no roads leading in. One minute the beasts padded on the grass of the open plain. The next, their claws were clicking on a stone pave and the buildings closed them in, hulking, graceless, looking sullen and forlorn in the shadowed light. There was no sound around them anywhere. No gleaming lamps in the black embrasures of the cavernous doors. The last furious glare of the hidden sun seeped down from the high peaks and stained their upper walls, and they were old, half as old, Trevor thought, as the peaks themselves. It was the window embrasures, the doors, and the steps that led up to them that made Trevor understand suddenly what was wrong and the latent fear that had been in him sprang to full growth. The city and the buildings in it, the steps and the doors and the height of the windows, were perfectly in proportion, perfectly normal, if the people who lived there were twenty feet high. He turned to the Korans. You never built this place. Who built it? The one called Galt, who was nearest him, snarled, "'Quiet, slave!' Trevor looked at him and at the other Korans. Something about their faces and the way they rode along the darkening empty street told him they too were afraid. He said, "'You, the Korans, the lordly demigods who ride about and send your hawks to hunt and slay, you're more afraid of your master than the slaves are of you.' They turned toward him pallid faces that burned with hatred. He remembered how that other had gripped his brain back in the canyon. He remembered how it had felt. He understood many things now. He asked, How does it feel to be enslaved, Korins? Not just enslaved in body, but in mind and soul. Gull turned like a striking snake, but the blow never fell. The upraised hand with heavy whip suddenly checked, and then sank down again. Only the eyes of the Koran glowed with a baleful helplessness under the winking sunstone. Trevor laughed without humor. It wants me alive. I guess I'm safe then. I guess I could tell you what I think of you. You're still convicts, aren't you? After three hundred years, no wonder you hate the slaves. Not the same convicts, of course. The sunstones didn't give longevity. Trevor knew how the Korans propagated, stealing women from among the slaves, keeping the male children and killing the female. He laughed again. It isn't such a good life after all, is it, being a Koran? Even hunting and killing can't take the taste out of your mouths. No wonder you hate the others. They're enslaved, all right, but they're not owned. They would have liked to kill him, but they could not. They were forbidden. Trevor looked at them in the last pale flicker of the afterglow. The jewels and the splendid harness, the bridles of the beasts heavy with gold, 
the weapons they looked foolish now like paper crowns and glass beads that children deck themselves with when they pretend to be kings these were not lords and masters these were only little men and slaves and the sunstones were a badge of shame the cavalcade passed on empty streets empty houses with windows too high for human eyes to look through and steps too tall for human legs to climb full dark and the first stunning crash of thunder the first blaze of lightning between the cliffs the mounts were hurrying now almost galloping to beat the lightning and the scalding rain they were in a great square around it was a stiff rectangle of houses and these were lighted with torchlight and in the monstrous doorways here and there a little figure stood a corin watching in the exact center of the square was a flat low structure of stone having no windows and but a single door they reined the beast before the lightless entrance get down said gall to trevor a livid reddish flare in the sky showed trevor the corin's face and it was smiling as a wolf smiles before the kill then the thunder came the downpour of rain and he was thrust bodily into the doorway he stumbled over worn flagging in the utter dark but the corins moved sure-footedly as cats he knew they had been here many times before and he knew that they hated it he could feel the hate and the fear bristling out from the bodies that were close to his smell them in the close hot air they didn't want to be here but they had to they were bidden he would have fallen head foremost down the sudden flight of steps if someone had not caught his arm they were huge steps they were forced to go down them as small children do lowering themselves bodily from tread to tread a furnace blast of air came up the well but in spite of the heat trevor felt cold he could feel how the hard stone of the stairs had been worn into deep hollows by the passing feet whose feet and going where a sulphurous glow began to creep up through the darkness they went down what seemed a very long way the glow brightened so that trevor could once more make out the faces of the corins the heat was overpowering but still there was a coldness around trevor's heart the steps ended in a long low hall so long that the farther end of it was lost in vaporous shadow trevor thought that it must have been squared out of a natural cavern for here and there in the rocky floor small fumaroles burned and bubbled giving off the murky light and a reek of brimstone along both sides of the hall were rows of statues seated in stone chairs trevor stared at them with the skin crawling up and down his back statues of men and women or rather of creatures manlike and womanlike sitting solemn and naked their hands folded in their laps their eyes fashioned of dull reddish stone looking straight ahead their features even and composed with a strange sad patience clinging to the stony furrows around mouth and cheek statues that would be perhaps twenty feet tall if they were standing carved by a master's chisel out of a pale substance that looked like alabaster galt caught his arm oh no you won't run away you were laughing remember come on i want to see you laugh some more they forced him along between the rows of statues quiet statues with a curiously ghostly look of thoughtfulness of thoughts and feelings long vanished but once there different from those of humans perhaps but quite as strong no two of them were alike in face or body trevor noted among them things seldom seen in statues a maimed limb a deformity or a completely nondescript face that would offer neither beauty nor ugliness for an artist to enlarge upon also they seemed all to be old though he could have not said why he thought so there were other halls opening off this main one how far they went he had no means of guessing but he could see that in them were other shadowy rows of seated figures statues endless numbers of statues 
down here in the darkness underneath the city. He stopped, bracing himself against his captors, gripping the hot rock with his bare feet. This is a catacomb, he said. Those aren't statues, they're bodies, dead things sitting up. Come on, said Galt, come on and laugh. They took him, and there were too many to fight. Trevor knew that it was not them he had to fight. Something was waiting for him down in that catacomb. It had had his mind once. It would... They were approaching the end of the long hall. The sickly light from the fumaroles showed the last of the lines of seated figures. Had they died there like that, sitting up, or had they been brought here afterward? The rows on each side ended evenly, the last chairs exactly opposite each other. But against the blank end wall was a solitary seat of stone, facing down the full gloomy length of the hall, and on it sat a man-like shape of alabaster, very still, the stony hands folded rigidly upon the stony thighs. A figure no different from the others, except— except that the eyes were still alive. The corns dropped back a little, all but galt. He stayed beside Trevor, his head bent, his mouth sullen and nervous, not looking up at all. And Trevor stared into the remote and somber eyes that were like two pieces of carnelian in that pale alabaster face, and yet were living, sentient, full of a deep and alien sorrow. It was very silent in the catacomb. The dreadful eyes studied Trevor, and for just a moment his hatred was tempered by a strange pity as he thought what it must be like for the brain, the intelligence behind those eyes, already entombed, and knowing it. A long living and a long dying, the blessing and the curse of my people. The words were soundless, spoken inside his brain. Trevor started violently. Almost he turned to flee, remembering the torture of that moment in the canyon, and then he found that while he had been staring, a force as gentle and stealthy as the gliding of a shadow had already invaded him, and he was forbidden. At this range I do not need the sunstones, murmured the silent voice within him. Once I did not need them at all, but I am old. Trevor stared at the stony thing that watched him, and then he thought of Jan, of Hugh lying dead with the dead hawk in the dust, and the strangeness left him, and his bitter passion flared again. So you hate me as well as fear me, little human? You would destroy me? There was a gentle laughter inside Trevor's mind. I have watched generations of humans die so swiftly, and yet I am here as I was before they came, waiting. "'You won't be here forever,' snarled Trevor. "'These others like you died. You will.' "'Yes, but it's a slow dying, little human. "'Your body chemistry is like that of the plants, the beasts, based upon carbon. "'Quick to grow, quick to wither away. "'Ours was of another sort. "'We were like the mountains, cousin to them, "'our body cells built of silicone, even as theirs.' and so our flesh endures until it grows slow and stiff with age. But even then we must wait long, very long, for death. Something of the truth of that long waiting came to Trevor, and he felt a shuddering thankfulness for the frailty of human flesh. I am the last, whispered the silent voice. For a while I had companionship of minds, but the others are all gone before me, long ago. Trevor had a nightmare vision of Mercury, in some incalculable future eon, a frozen world taking its last plunge into the burned-out sun, bearing with it these endless rows of alabaster shapes, sitting in their chairs of stone, upright in the dead blackness underneath the ice. He fought back to reality, clutching his hatred as a swimmer clings to a plank, his voice raw with passion and bitterness as he cried out, "'Yes, I'll destroy you if I can. "'What else could you expect after what you've done?' "'Oh, no, little human, you will not destroy me. "'You will help me.' "'Trevor glared. "'Help you? 
Not if you kill me. There will be no killing, for you would be of no use to me dead. But alive you can serve me. That is why you were spared. Serve you? Like them? He swung to point to the waiting Korans. But the Korans were not waiting now. They were closing in on him, their hands reaching for him. Trevor struck out at them. He had a fleeting thought of how weird this battle of his with the Korans must look, as they struck and staggered on the stone paving beneath the looming watching thing of stone. But even as he had had that thought, the moment of struggle ended. An imperious command hit his brain, and black oblivion closed down upon him like the sudden clenching of a fist. End of Section 16 Section 17 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shannock the Last, Part 5 Darkness He was lost in it, and he was not himself any more. He fled through the darkness, groping, crying out for something that was gone. And a voice answered him, a voice that he did not want to hear. Darkness Dreams. Dawn, high on the blazing mountains. He stood in the city, watching the light glow bright and pitiless, watching it burn on the upper walls and then slip downward into the streets, casting heavy shadows in the openings of door and window, so that the houses looked like skulls with empty eye holes and gaping mouths. The buildings no longer seemed too big. He walked between them, and when he came to steps he climbed them easily, and the window ledges were no higher than his head. He knew these buildings. He looked at each one as he passed, naming it, remembering with a long, long memory. The hawks came down to him, the faithful servants with the sunstones in their brows. He stroked their pliant necks, and they hissed softly with pleasure, but their shallow minds were empty of everything but that vague sensation. He passed on through the familiar streets, and in them nothing stirred. All through the day from dawn to sunset, and in the darkness that came afterward, nothing stirred, and there was a silence among the stones. He could not endure the city. His time was not yet, though the first subtle signs of age had touched him. But he went down into the catacombs and took his place with those others who were waiting and could still speak to him with their minds, so that he should not be quite alone with the silence. The years went by, leaving no traces of themselves in the unchanging gloom of the mortuary halls. One by one those last few minds were stilled until all were gone, and by that time age had chained him where he was unable to rise and go again into the city where he had been young, the youngest of all, Shannock, they had named him, the last. So he waited, alone. And only one who was kin to the mountains could have borne that waiting in the place of the dead. Then, in a burst of flame and thunder, new life came into the valley. Human life, soft, frail, receptive life, intelligent, unprotected, possessed of violent and bewildering passions. Very carefully, taking its time, the mind of Shannock reached out and gathered them in. Some of the men were more violent than the others. Shannock saw their emotions in patterns of scarlet against the dark of his inner mind. They had already made themselves masters, and a number of these frail sensitive brains had snapped out swiftly because of them. These I will take for my own, thought Shawnock. Their mind patterns are crude, but strong, and I am interested in death. There had been a surgeon aboard the ship, but he was dead. However, there was no need of a surgeon for what was about to be done. When Shawnock had finished talking to the men he had chosen, telling them of the sunstones, telling them the truth, but not all of it, when those men had eagerly agreed to the promise of power, Shannock took complete control, and the clumsy convict hands that moved now with such exquisite skill were as much his instruments as the scalpels of the dead surgeon that they wielded. 
making the round incision and the delicate cutting of the bone. Who was the man that lay there, quiet under the knife? Who were the ones that bent above him, with the strange stones in their brows? Names. There are names, and I know them. Closer, closer. I know that man who lies there with blood between his eyes. Trevor screamed. Someone slapped him across the face, viciously and with intent. He screamed again, fighting, clawing, still blinded by the visions and the dark mists, and that voice that he dreaded so much spoke gently in his mind. It's all over, Trevor. It is done. The hand slapped him again, and a rough human voice said harshly, Wake up! Wake up, damn it! He woke. He was in the middle of a vast room, crouched down in the attitude of a fighter, shivering, sweating, his hands outstretched and grasping nothing. He must have sprung there, half unconscious, from the tumbled pallet of skins against the wall. Galt was watching him. Welcome, Earthman. How does it feel to be one of the masters? Trevor stared at him. A burning flood of light fell through the tall window so high above his head, setting the sunstone ablaze between the Corin's sullen brows. Trevor's gaze fixed on that single point of brilliance. Oh, yes, said Galt. It's true. It struck Trevor with an ugly shock that Galt's lips had not moved, and that he had made no audible sound. "'The stones give us a limited ability,' Galt went on, still without speaking aloud. "'Not like his, of course. But we can control the hawks, and exchange ideas between us when we want to, if the range isn't too far. Naturally, our minds are open to him any time he wants to pry.' "'There is no pain,' Trevor whispered, desperately trying to make the thing not be so. "'My head doesn't ache.' "'Of course not. He takes care of that.' "'Shanak? If it isn't so, how do I know that name? And that dream, that endless nightmare in the catacombs?' Galt winced. "'We don't use that name. He doesn't like it.' He looked at Trevor. "'What's the matter, Earthman? Why so green? You were laughing once, remember? Where's your sense of humor now?' He caught Trevor abruptly by the shoulders and turned him around so that he faced a great sheet of polished glassy substance set into the wall, a mirror for giants, reflecting the whole huge room, reflecting the small dwarf figures of the men. "'Go on,' said Galt, pushing Trevor ahead of him. "'Take a look.' Trevor shook off the Corin's grasp. He moved forward by himself, close to the mirror." He set his hands against the chill surface and stared at what he saw there. And it was true. Between his brows a sunstone winked and glittered. And his face, the familiar, normal, not-too-bad face he had been used to all his life, was transformed into something monstrous and unnatural, a goblin mask with a third and evil eye. A coldness crept into his heart and bones. He backed away a little from the mirror, his hands moving blindly upward, slowly toward the stone that glistened between his brows. His mouth was twisted like a child's, and two tears rolled down his cheeks. His fingers touched the stone, and then the anger came. He sank his nails into his forehead, clawing at the hard stones, not caring if he died after he had torn it out. Galt watched him. His lips smiled, but his eyes were hateful. Blood ran down the sides of Trevor's nose. The sunstone was still there. He moaned and thrust his nails deeper, and Shannock let him go until he had produced one stab of agony that cut his head in two and nearly dropped him. Then Shannock sent in the full force of his mind. Not in anger, for he felt none, and not in cruelty— for he was no more cruel than the mountain he was kin to, but simply because it was necessary. Trevor felt that cold and lonely power roll down on him like an avalanche. He braced himself to meet it, but it broke his defenses, crushed them, made them nothing, 
and moved onward against the inmost citadel of his mind. In that reeling, darkened fortress all that was holy, Trevor crouched and clung to his armament of rage, remembering dimly that once, in a narrow canyon, it had driven back this enemy and broken free. And then some crude animal instinct far below the level of conscious thought warned him not to press the battle now, to bury his small weapon and wait, letting this last redoubt of which he was yet master go untouched and perhaps unnoticed by his captor. Trevor let his hands drop limply and his mind go slack. The cold black tide of power paused, and then he felt it slide away, withdrawing from those threatened walls. Out of the edges of it, Shannock spoke. Your mind is tougher than these valley-bred Korans. They're well-conditioned, but you, you remember that you defied me once. The contact was imperfect then. It is not imperfect now. Remember that, too, Trevor. Trevor drew in a long, unsteady breath. He whispered, What do you want of me? Go and see the ship. Your mind tells me that it understands these things. See if it can be made to fly again. That order took Trevor completely by surprise. The ship, but why? Shannock was not used to having his wishes questioned, but he answered patiently, I have still a while to live. Several of your short generations. I have had too much of this valley, too much of these catacombs. I want to leave them. Trevor could understand that. Having had that nightmare glimpse into Shawnock's mind, he could perfectly understand. For one brief moment, he was torn with pity for this trapped creature who was alone in the universe. And then he wondered, What would you do if you could leave the valley? What would you do to another settlement of men? Who knows? I have one thing left to me. Curiosity. You'd take the Korans with you, and the hawks? Some? They're my eyes and ears, my hands and feet. But you object, Trevor. What difference does that make? said Trevor bitterly. I'll go look at the ship. Come on, said Galt, taking up an armful of torches. I'll show you the way. They went out through the tall door into the streets between the huge, square, empty houses. The streets and houses that Trevor had known in his dream, remembering when they were lights and voices in them. Trevor noticed that only Galt was leading him out of the opposite side of the city, toward the part of the valley he had never visited. And then his mind reverted to something that not even the shock of his awakening could drive out of his consciousness. Jen. A sudden panic sprang up in him. How long had it been since the darkness fell on him there in that catacomb? Long enough for almost anything to happen. He envisioned Jen being torn by hawks, of her body lying dead as Hughes had lain, and he started to reach out for Galt, who had owned them both. But abruptly Shawnock spoke to him, in that eerie, silent way he was getting used to. The woman is safe. Here, look for yourself. His mind was taken firmly and directed into a channel completely new to him. He felt a curious small shock of contact, and suddenly he was looking down from a point somewhere in the sky at a walled paddock with a number of tiny figures in it. His own eyes would have seen them as just that, but the eyes he was using now were keen as an eagle's, though they saw no color but only black and white and the shadings in between so he recognized one of the distant figures as Jen. He wanted to get closer to her, much closer, and rather sulkily his point of vision began to circle down, dropping lower and lower. Jen looked up. He saw the shadow of wide wings sweep across her, and realized that of course he was using one of the hawks. He pulled it back so as not to frighten her, but not before he had seen her face. The frozen stoniness was gone, and in its place had come the look of a wounded tigress. "'I want her,' Trevor said to Shannock. "'She belongs to Galt. I do not interfere.' Galt shrugged. "'You're welcome. But keep her chained. She's too dangerous now for anything but hawk meat.' The ship was not far beyond the city. 
It lay canted over on its side, just clear of a low spur jutting out from the barrier cliff. It had hit hard, and some of the main plates were buckled, but from the outside the damage didn't seem irreparable, if you had the knowledge and the tools to work with. Three hundred years ago it might have been made to fly again. Only those who had the knowledge and the will were dead. And the convicts wanted to stay where they were. The tough metal of the outer skin, alloyed to resist friction that could burn up a meteor, had stood up pretty well under three centuries of Mercurian climate. It was corroded, and where the breaks were the inner shells were eaten through with rust, but the hulk still remained the semblance of a ship. "'Will it fly?' asked Shannock eagerly. "'I don't know yet,' Trevor answered. Galt lighted a torch and gave it to him. "'I'll stay out here.' Trevor laughed. "'How are you ever going to fly over the mountains?' "'He'll see to that when the time comes,' Galt muttered. "'Take the rest of these torches. It's dark in there.' Trevor climbed in through the gaping lock, moving with great caution on the filled, rust-red decks. Inside the ship was a shambles. Everything had been stripped out of it that could be used, leaving only bare cubicles with the enamel peeling off the walls and a moldering litter of junk. In a locker forward of the airlock he found a number of spacesuits. The fabric was rotted away but a few of the helmets were still good and some half-score of oxygen bottles had survived, the gas still in them. Shawnock urged him to go on patiently. Get to the essentials, Trevor. The bridge room was still intact, though the multiple thickness of glassite in the big port showed patterns of spidery cracks. Trevor examined the controls. He was strictly a planetary spacer, used to flying his small craft within spitting distance of the world he was prospecting, and there were few gadgets here he didn't understand, but he could figure the board well enough. Not far, Trevor, only over the mountains. I know from your mind, and I remember from the minds of those who died after the landing. And beyond the mountain wall there is a plain of dead rock, more than a hundred of your reckoning in miles and then another ridge that seems solid but is not, and beyond that pass there is a fertile valley twenty times bigger than Corinth, where earthmen live. Only partly fertile, and the mines that brought the earthmen are pretty well worked out, but a few ships still land there, and a few earthmen still hang on. That is best, a small place to begin. To begin what? Who can tell? You don't understand, Trevor. For centuries I've known exactly what I would do. There is a kind of rebirth in not knowing. Trevor shivered and went back to studying the controls. The wiring, protected by layers of imperviplass insulation and conduit, seemed to be in fair shape. The generator room below had been knocked about, but not too badly. There were spare batteries. Corroded, yes, but if they were charged... They could hold for a while. Will it fly? I told you, I don't know yet. It would take a lot of work. There are many slaves to do this work. Yes, but without fuel it's all useless. See if there's fuel. The outlines of that hidden thing in Trevor's secret mind were coming clearer now. He didn't want to see them out in the full light where Shawnock could see them too. He thought hard about generators, batteries, and the hooking up of leads. He crept among the dark bowels of the dead ship, working toward the stern. The torch made a red and smoky glare that lit up deserted wardrooms and plundered holds. One large compartment had a heavy barred and bolted door that had bent like tin in the crash. That's where they came from, Trevor thought, like wolves out of a trap. In the lower holes that had taken the worst of the impact were quantities of mining equipment and farm machinery, all smashed beyond use, but formidable looking nonetheless, with rusty blades and teeth and queer hulking shapes. They made him think of weapons, and he let the thought grow, adorning it with pictures of men going down under whirring reapers. Shawnock caught it. Weapons? They could be used as such but the metal in them would repair the hull. He found the fuel bunkers. 
The main supply was used to the last grain of fissionable dust, but the emergency bunker still showed some content on the mechanical gauges. Not much, but enough. End of Section 17 Section 18 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6 of Shawnock the Last A hard excitement began to stir in Trevor, too big to be hidden in that secret corner of his mind. He didn't try. He let it loose, and Shawnock murmured, "'You are pleased.' The ship will fly, and you are thinking that when you reach the other valley and are among your own people again, you will find means to destroy me. Perhaps, but we shall see. In the smoky torchlight, looking down from a sagging catwalk above the firing chambers and the rusted sealed-in tubes, Trevor smiled. A lie could be thought of as well as spoken. And Shawnock, in a manner of speaking, was only human. I'll need help. All the help there is. You'll have it. It'll take time. Don't hurry me and don't distract me. Remember, I want to get over the mountains as bad as you do. Shawnock laughed. Trevor got more torches and went to work in the generator room. He felt that Shawnock had withdrawn from him, occupied now with rounding up the Korans and the slaves. But he did not relax his caution. The open areas of his mind were filled with thoughts of vengeance to come when he reached that other valley. Gradually, the exigencies of wrestling with the antiquated and partly ruined machinery drove everything else away. That day passed, and a night, a half another day before all the leads were hooked the way he wanted them, before one creaky generator was operating on one-quarter normal output, and the best of the spare batteries were charging. He emerged from the torch-lit obscurity into the bridge, blinking mole-like in the light, and found Galt sitting there. "'He trusts you,' the Koran said, "'but not too far.' Trevor scowled at him. Exhaustion, excitement, and a feeling of fate had combined to put him into an unreal state where his mind operated more or less independently. A hard protective shell had formed around that last little inner fortress, so that it was hidden even from himself, and he had come almost to believe that he was going to fly this ship to another valley and battle Shawnok there. So he was not surprised to hear Shawnok say softly in his mind, "'You might try to go away alone. I wouldn't want that, Trevor.' Trevor grunted, "'I thought you controlled me so well I couldn't spit if you forbade it.' I am dealing with much here that I don't comprehend. We were never a mechanical people. Therefore, some of your thoughts, while I read them clearly, have no real meaning for me. I can handle you, Trevor, but I'm taking no chances with the ship. Don't worry, Trevor told him. I can't possibly take the ship up before the hull's repaired. It would fall apart on me. That was true, and he spoke it honestly. "'Nevertheless,' said Shawnock, "'Galt will be there, as my hands and feet, "'an extra guard over that object which you call a control bank, "'and which your mind tells me is the key to the ship. "'You are forbidden to touch it until it's time to go.' "'Trevor heard Shawnock's silent laughter. "'Treachery is implicit in your mind, Trevor. "'But I'll have time. "'Impulses come swiftly and cannot be read beforehand.' but there is an interval between the impulse and the realization of it. Only a fraction of a second, perhaps, but I'll have time to stop you. Trevor did not argue. He was shaking a little with the effort of not giving up his last pitiful individuality, of fixing his thoughts firmly on the next step toward what Shawnock wanted and looking neither to the right nor to the left of it. He ran a grimy hand over his face. "'shrinking from the touch of the alien disfigurement in his forehead, "'and said sullenly, "'The holes have to be cleared. "'The ship won't lift that weight any more, "'and we need the metal for repairs.' "'He thought again strongly of weapons. "'Send the slaves.' "'No,' said Shawnock firmly. "'The Korans will do that. 
We won't put any potential weapons in the hands of the slaves. Trevor allowed a wave of disappointment to cross his mind, and then he shrugged. All right, but get them at it. He went and stood by the wide ports looking out over the plain toward the city. The slaves were gathered at a safe distance from the ship, waiting like a herd of cattle until they should be needed. Some mounted corans guarded them while the hawks wheeled overhead. Coming toward the ship, moving with the resentful slowness, was a tiny army of Korans. Trevor could sense the group thought quite clearly. In all their lives they had never soiled their hands with labor, and they were angry that they had now to do the work of slaves. Digging his nails into his palms, Trevor went aft to show them what to do. He couldn't keep it hidden much longer, this thing that he had so painfully concealed under layers of half-truths and deceptions. It had to come out soon, and Shannock would know. In the smoky glare of many torches, the Korans began to struggle with the rusting masses of machinery in the afterholds. "'Send more down here,' Trevor said to Shannock. "'These things are heavy.' "'They're all there now except those that guard the slaves. They cannot leave.' "'All right,' said Trevor. "'Make them work.' He went back up along the canting decks, along the tilted passages, moving slowly at first, then swifter, swifter, his bare feet scraping on the flakes of rust, his face with the third uncanny eye, gone white and strangely set. His mind was throwing off muddy streams of thought, confused and meaningless, Desperate camouflage to hide until the last second what was underneath. Trevor! That was Shadrach, alert, alarmed. It was coming now, the purpose, out into the light. It had to come. It could not be hidden any longer. It burst up from a secret place, one strong red flare against the darkness, and Shannock saw it, and sent the full cold power of his mind to drown it out. Trevor came into the bridge room, running. The first black wave of power hit him, crushed him. The bridge room lengthened out into some weird dimension of delirium, with Galt waiting at the far end. Behind Galt, the one small, little key that needed to be touched just once. The towering mind of Shannock beat him back, forbidding him to think, to move, to be. But down in that beleaguered part of Trevor's mind, the walls still held, with a bright brand of determination burning in them. This was the moment, the time to fight, and he dug up that armament of fury he had buried there. He let it free, shouting at the alien force, I beat you once, I beat you. The deck swam under his feet. The peeling bulkheads wavered past like veils of mist. He didn't know whether he was moving or not, but he kept on while the enormous weight bore down on his quivering brain, a mountain tilting, falling, seeking to smother out the fury that was all he had to fight with. Fury for himself, defiled and outraged. Fury for Jen, with the red scars on her shoulders. Fury for Hugh lying dead under an obscene killer. Fury for all the generations of decent people who had lived and died in slavery, so that Shannock's time of waiting might be lightened. He saw Galt's face, curiously huge, close to his own. It was stricken and amazed. Trevor's bare teeth glistened. I beat him once, he said to the Koran. Galt's hands were raised. There was a knife in his girdle, but he had been bidden not to use it, not to kill. Only Trevor could make the ship fly. Galt reached out and took him, but there was an unsureness in his grip, and his mind was crying out to Shannock, You could not make him stop. You could not. Trevor, who was partly merged with Shannock now, heard that cry and laughed. Something in him had burst wide open at Galt's physical touch. He had no control now, no sane thought left but only a wild, intense desire to do two things, one of which was to destroy this monster that had hold of him. "'Kill him,' said Shannock suddenly, 
He's mad, and no one can control an insane human. Galt did his best to obey, but Trevor's hands were already around the Coran's throat, the fingers sinking deep into the flesh. There was a sharp snapping of bone. He dropped the body. He could see nothing now except one tiny point of light in a reeling darkness. That single point of light had a red key in the center of it. Trevor reached out and pushed it down. That was the other thing. For a short second, nothing happened. Trevor sagged down across Galt's body. Shawnock was somewhere else, crying warnings that came too late. Trevor had time to draw one hoarse, triumphant breath and brace himself. The ship leaped under him. There was a dull roar, and then another, as the last fuel bunkers let go. The whole bridge room rolled and came to rest with a jarring shock that split the ports wide open, and the world was full of shriek and crash of metal being torn and twisted and rent apart. Then it quieted. The ground stopped shaking and the deck settled under Trevor. There was silence. Trevor crawled up the new slope of the bridge room floor, to the shattered lock and through it, into the pitiless sunlight. He could see now exactly what he had done. And it was good. It had worked. The last small measure of fuel had been enough. The whole after part of the hulk was gone, and with it gone all but a few of Shawnock's corns, trapped in the lower holds. And then, in pure surprise, Shawnock spoke inside Trevor's mind. I grow old indeed. I misjudged the toughness and the secrecy of a fresh, strong mind. I was too used to my obedient corns. Do you see what's happening to the last of them? Trevor asked savagely. Can you see? The last of the corns who had been outside with the slaves seemed to have been stunned and bewildered by the collapse of their world. And with the spontaneity of a whirlwind, the slaves had risen against this last remnant of their hated masters. They had waited for a long, long time, and now the Korans and the Hawks were being done to death. Can you see it, Shanak? I can see, Trevor. And they're coming now for you. They were. They were coming, blood-mad against all who wore the sunstone, and Jan was in the forefront of them, and Saul, whose hands were red. Trevor knew that he had less than a half a minute to speak for his life and he was aware that Shawnock, still withdrawn, watched now with an edged amusement. Trevor said harshly to Saul and all of them, So I give you your freedom, and you want to kill me for it? Saul snarled, You betrayed us in the cave, and now? I betrayed you, but without intent. There was someone stronger than the Korans, and even you didn't know about it. So how should I have known? Trevor talked fast then talking for his life, telling them about Shawnock and how the Corins themselves were enslaved. A lie, spat Saul. Look for yourselves in the crypts underneath the city, but be careful. He looked at Jan, not at Saul. After a moment, Jan said slowly, Perhaps there is a Shawnock. Perhaps that's why we were never allowed in the city, so the Corins could go on pretending that they were gods. It's another of his lies, I tell you. Jen turned to him. Go and look, Saul. We'll watch him. Saul hesitated. Finally, he and a half dozen others went off toward the city. Trevor sat down on the hot, scorched grass. He was very tired, and he didn't like it all the way the withdrawn shadow of Shawnock Hoover just outside his mind. The mountains leaned away from the sun, and the shadows crawled up the lower slopes. Then Saul and the others returned. Trevor looked up at their faces and laughed without mirth. It's true, isn't it? Yes, said Saul, and shivered. Yes. Did he speak to you? He started to, but we ran. And Saul suddenly cried, out of the depths of fear this time and not of hate. We can never kill him. It is his valley. And, oh, God, we're trapped in here with him. We can't get out. We can get out, said Trevor. 
End of section 18. Section 19 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 7 of Shawnock, The Last. Saul stared at him sickly. There's no way over the mountains. There isn't even air up there. There's a way. I found it in the ship. Trevor stood up, speaking with sudden harshness. Not a way for us all. Not now. But if three or four of us go, one may live to make it, and he could bring back men with ships for the others. He looked at Saul. Will you try it with me? The gaunt man said hoarsely, I still don't trust you, Trevor. But anything, anything to get away from that. I'll go, too, Jen said suddenly. I'm as strong as Saul. That was true, and Trevor knew it. He stared at her for a long minute but he could not read her face. Saul shrugged. All right. But it's all craziness, murmured a voice. You can't breathe up there on the ridges. There's no air. Trevor climbed painfully into what was left of the twisted wreck and brought out the helmets and oxygen bottles that had survived for just this purpose. We'll breathe, he said. These. He tried for a word that would explain to them. These containers hold an essence of air. We can take them with us and breathe. But the cold. You have tan skins, haven't you? And gums. I can show you how to make us protective garments. Unless you'd rather stay here with Shawnock. Saul shivered a little. No, we'll try it. In all the hours that followed, while the women of the slaves worked with soft tan skins and resinous gums, while Trevor labored over the clumsy helmets they must have. In all that time, Shannock was silent. Silent, but not gone. Trevor felt that shadow on his mind. He knew that Shannock was watching. Yet the last one made no attempt upon him. The slaves watched him, too. He saw the fear and hatred still in their eyes as they looked at the sunstone between his brows. And Jen watched him, and said nothing, and he could read nothing at all in her face. Was she thinking of Hugh and how the hawks had come? By mid-afternoon they were ready. They started climbing slowly, toward the passages that went up beyond the sky. He and Saul and Jan were three grotesque and shapeless figures, in the three layered garments of skin that were crudely sealed with gum and the clumsy helmets that were padded out with cloth, because there was no collar rest to hold them. Their faces were wrapped close, and they held the ends of the oxygen tubes in their mouths, because no amount of ingenuity could make the helmets space tight. The evening shadow flowed upward from the valley floor as they climbed, and the men who had come to help them dropped back. These three went on, with Saul leading the way and Trevor last. And still Shawnock had not spoken. The atmosphere slipped behind them. They were climbing into space now, tiny creatures clambering up an infinity of virgin rock, in the utter black between the blazing peaks above and the flaring lightnings of the evening storm below. Up and up toward the pass, toiling forward painfully with each other's help where no man could have made it alone through a numbing and awful cold and silence. Three clumsy, dragging figures, up here above the sky itself, walking in the awfulness of infinity, where the rocks their feet dislodged rushed away as noiseless as a dream, where there was no sound, no light, no time. Trevor knew they must have reached the pass, for on both sides now there rose up the slopes that had never been touched by wind or rain or living root. He staggered on, and presently the ground began to drop and the way was easier. They had passed the crest, and the oxygen was almost gone. Downward now, stumbling, slipping, sliding, yearning toward the air below. And they were on the other side of the mountain, above the plain of rock that led to... And then, at last, Shannock laughed. Clever, he said. Oh, very clever to escape without a ship. But you will come back with a ship, 
and you will take me to the outside world, and I will reward you greatly. No, said Trevor in his mind. No, Shannock, if we make it, the sunstone comes out, and we'll come back for the slaves, not for you. No, Trevor, the gentle finality of that denial was coldly frightening. You are mine now. You surprised and tricked me once, but I know the trick now. Your whole mind is open to me. You cannot withstand me ever again. It was cold, cold in the darkness below the pass, and the chill went deep into Trevor's soul and froze it. Saul and Jan were below him now, stumbling down along the rock-strewn lip of a chasm, into the thin high reaches of the air, into sound and life again. He saw them tear away their helmets. He followed them, pulling off his own, gasping the frigid breath into his starved lungs. Shannock said softly, "'We do not need them any longer. They would be a danger when you reach other men. Dispose of them, Trevor.' Trevor started a raging refusal, and then his mind was gripped by a great hand, shaken and turned and changed. His fury flowed away into blackness. "'But of course,' he thought, there are many boulders, and I can topple them into the chasm so easily. He started toward a jagged stone mass, one that would quite neatly brush the two clumsy figures below him into the abyss. That's the way, Trevor, but quickly. Trevor knew that Shannock had spoken truth, and that this time he was conquered. No, I won't, he cried to himself, but it was only a weak echo from a fading willpower, a dying self. You will, Trevor, and now they suspect. Saul and Jan had turned. Trevor's face, open now to the numbing cold which he could scarcely feel, must have told them everything. They started scrambling back up toward him. Only a short distance, but they would be too late. Trevor shrieked thinly, Look out! Shannock! He had his hands on it now. On the boulder he must roll to crush them. But there was another way. He was Shannox while he lived, but there was a way to avoid again betraying Jan's people, and that way was to live no longer. He used the last of his dying will to pitch himself toward the brink of the chasm. Hundreds of feet below a man could lie quiet on the rocks through all eternity. Trevor, no, no! Shannock's powerful command halted him as he swayed on the very edge, and then Jan's arm caught him from behind. He heard Saul's voice crying, thin and harsh in the upper air. "'Push him over. He's a Corin. You saw his face.' Jan answered, "'No, he tried to kill himself for us.' "'But Shannock has him,' Saul cried out. "'Shannock had him, indeed.' stamping down that final flicker of Trevor's revolt, fiercely commanding him. "'Slay the woman and the man!' Trevor tried to. He was all Shannock's now. He tried earnestly with all his strength to kill them, but both the woman and the man had hold of him now. They were too strong for him, and he could not obey the last one as he wanted to. "'Tie his arms!' Jan was shouting. We can take him, and he can't do us any harm. The anger of Shawnock flooded through Trevor, and he raged and struggled, and it was useless. Strips of hide secured his arms, and they were dragging him on down out of the mountains, and he could not obey. He could not. And then he felt the anger of Shawnock ebb away into a terrible hopelessness. Trevor felt his own consciousness going and he went into the darkness bearing in his mind the echo of that last bitter cry. I am old, too old. End of section 19 Section 20 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 8 of Shawnock the Last Trevor awakened slowly, rising above the dark sea of oblivion only to sink again, conscious in those brief intervals that he lay in a bed and that his head ached. 
There came a time when he rose, not to sink again. After a while his eyes opened, and he saw a metal ceiling. "'We made it,' he said. "'Yes, you made it,' said a friendly voice. "'This is Solar City. You've been here quite a while.' Trevor turned his head to the voice, to the white-jacketed doctor beside his bed. But he didn't see the man or the room. Not at first. He saw only, upon the bedside table in a tray, a tawny eye that twinkled and glittered at him. A sunstone. His hand started to rise weakly to his face. The doctor forestalled him. Don't bother, it's out. And a delicate job of getting it out it was. You'll have a headache for a while, but anyone would take a headache for a sunstone. Trevor didn't answer that. He said suddenly, "'Jan, and Saul?' "'They're here. Pretty odd folk they are, too. Won't talk to any of us. You're all a blazing mystery, you know.' He went away. When he came back, Jan and Saul were with him. They wore modern synth-cloth garments now. Jan looked as incongruous in hers as a leopardess in a silk dress. She saw the smile in his eyes and cried, "'Don't laugh at me, ever!' It occurred to Trevor that civilizing her would take a long time. He doubted if it ever would be done, and he was glad of that. She stood looking gravely down at him, and then said, "'They say you can get up tomorrow.' "'That's good,' said Trevor. "'You'll have to be careful for a while.' "'Yes, I'll be careful.' They said no more than that, but in her steady, grave gaze, Trevor read that Hugh and the Hawks were forgiven, not forgotten, but forgiven, that they too had touched each other and would not let go again. Saul cried anxiously, "'Days we've waited. When can we go back to the valley with a ship for the others?' Trevor turned to the curiously watching doctor. "'Can I charter a ship here?' A man with a sunstone can get almost anything he wants, Trevor. I'll see about it. The chartered ship that took them back to the valley had a minimum crew and two mining technicians Trevor had hired. They sat down outside the ancient city, and the slaves came surging toward them, half in eagerness, half in awe of this embodiment of misty legend. Trevor had told Saul what to do. Out up the valley— in the skulls of slain Korans were sunstones worth many fortunes. They were going out with the slaves. But they're evil, evil, Saul had cried. Not on the outside worlds, Trevor told him. You people are going to need a start somewhere. When that was done, when they were all in the ship, Trevor nodded to the two mining technicians. Now, he said, the entrance to that catacomb is right over there. The two went away, carrying their bulky burden slung between them. Presently they came back again without it. Trevor took his sunstone from his pocket. Jan clutched his arm and cried, No! There's no danger now, he said. He hasn't time enough left to do anything with me. And I somehow feel that I should tell him. He put the sunstone to his brow and in his mind he cried, Shawnock! And into his mind came the cold, tremendous presence of the last one. In an instant it had read Trevor's thoughts. So this is the end, Trevor? Yes, said Trevor steadily, the end. He was braced for the wild reaction of alarm and passion, the attempt to seize his mind, to avert doom. It didn't come. Instead, from the last one, came a stunning pulse of gladness, of mounting joy. "'Why, why do you want me to do this?' Trevor cried. "'Yes, Trevor, yes. I had thought that the centuries of waiting for death would be long yet, and lonely. But this, this will free me now.' Dazed by surprise, Trevor slowly made a gesture, and their ship throbbed upward into the sky. Another gesture, and the technician beside him reached toward the key of the radio detonator. In that moment he felt the mind of Shawnock crying out as in a vast, mingled music, 
a glad chorus of release against chords of cosmic sorrow for all that had been and never would be again, for the greatest and oldest of races that was ending. The receding city below erupted flame and rock around the catacomb mouth as the key was pressed, and the song of Shaunach ebbed into silence, as the last of the children of the mountains went forever into night. End of section 20 End of Shaunach the Last Section 21 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 of The Vanishing Venusians The breeze was steady enough, but it was not in a hurry. It filled the lug sail just hard enough to push the dirty weed-grown hull through the water, and no harder. Matt Harker lay alongside the tiller and counted the trickles of sweat crawling over his nakedness and stared with sullen, opaque eyes into the indigo night. Anger, leashed and impotent, rose in his throat like bitter vomit. The sea, Rory McLaren's Venusian wife called it the sea of morning opals, lay unstirring, black, streaked with phosphorescence. The sky hung low over it, the thick cloud blanket of Venus that had made the sun a half-remembered legend to the exiles from Earth. Riding lights burned in the blue gloom, strung out in line. Twelve ships, thirty-eight hundred people, going no place, trapped in the interval between birth and death, and not knowing what to do about it. Matt Harker glanced upward at the sail, and then at the stern lantern of the ship ahead. His face, in the dim glow that lights Venus even at night, was a gaunt oblong of shadows and hard bone, seamed and scarred with living with wanting and not having, with dying and not being dead. He was a lean man, wiry and not tall, with a snake-like surety of motion. Somebody came scrambling quietly aft along the deck, avoiding the sleeping bodies crowded everywhere. Parker said, without emotion, "'Hi, Rory.' Rory McLaren said, "'Hi, Matt.' He sat down. He was young, perhaps half Harker's age. There was still hope in his face, but it was growing tired. He sat for a while without speaking, looking at nothing, and then said, Honest to God, Matt, how much longer can we last? What's the matter, kid? Starting to crack? I don't know. Maybe. When are we going to stop somewhere? When we find a place to stop. Is there a place to stop? Seems like ever since I was born, we've been hunting. There's always something wrong. Hostile natives, or fever, or bad soil. Always something. And we go on again. It's not right. It's not any way to try to live. I told you not to go having kids. What's that got to do with it? You start worrying. The kid isn't even here yet, and already you're worrying. "'Sure I am.' McLaren put his head in his hands suddenly and swore. Harker knew he did that to keep from crying. "'I'm worried,' McLaren said, "'that maybe the same thing will happen to my wife and kid that happened to yours. "'We got fever aboard.' Harker's eyes were like blown coals for an instant. Then he glanced up at the sail and said, "'They'd be better off if it didn't live.' That's no kind of thing to say. It's the truth. Like you ask me, when are we going to stop somewhere? Maybe never. You belly ache about it ever since you were born. Well, I've been at it longer than that. Before you were born, I saw our first settlement burned by the cloud people, and my mother and father crucified in their own vineyard. I was there when this trek to the promised land began back on earth, and I'm still waiting for the promise. The sinews in Harker's face were drawn like knots of wire. His voice had a terrible quietness. Your wife and kid would be better off to die now, while Vicky's still young and has hope, and before the child ever opens its eyes. Sim, the big black man, relieved Harker before dawn. He started singing softly, 
something mournful and slow as the breeze and beautiful. Harker cursed him and went up into the bow to sleep, but the song stayed with him. Oh, I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. Harker slept. Presently he began to moan and twitch, and then cry out. People around him woke up. They watched with interest. Harker was a lone woeful wake, ill-tempered and violent. When, at long intervals, he would have one of his spells, no one was anxious to help him out of it. They liked peeping inside of Harker when he wasn't looking. Harker didn't care. He was playing in the snow again. He was seven years old, and the drifts were high and white and above them the sky was so blue and clean that he wondered if God mopped it every few days like Mom did the kitchen floor. The sun was shining. It was like a great gold coin, and it made the snow burn like crushed diamonds. He put his arms up to the sun, and the cold air slapped him with clean hands, and he laughed. And then it was all gone. By God, somebody said, ain't them tears on his face? Bawling, bawling like a little kid. Listen at him. Hey, said the first one sheepishly, reckon we ought to wake him up? Hell with him, the old sourpuss. Hey, listen to that. Dad, Harker whispered. Dad, I want to go home. Dawn came like a sifting of fire opals through the layers of the pearl-gray cloud. Harker heard the yelling dimly in his sleep. He felt dull and tired, and his eyelids stuck together. The yelling gradually took shape and became the word land, repeated over and over. Harker kicked himself awake and got up. The tideless sea glimmered with opaline colors under the mist. Flocks of little jewel-scaled sea dragons rose up from the ever-present floating islands of weed, and the weed itself, part of it, writhed and stretched with sentient life. Ahead there was a long, low hummock of muddy ground fading into tangled swamp. Beyond it, rising sheer into the clouds, was a granite cliff, a sweeping escarpment that stood like a wall against the hopeful gaze of the exiles. Harker found Rory McLaren standing beside him, his arm around Vicky, his wife. Vicky was one of several Venusians who had married into the Earth colony. Her skin was clear white, her hair a glowing silver, her lips vividly red. Her eyes were like the sea, changeable, full of hidden life. Just now they had that special look that the eyes of women get when they're thinking about creation. Harker looked away. McLaren said, "'It's land!' Harker said, It's mud, it's swamp, it's fever, it's like the rest. Vicky said, Can we stop here just a little while? Harker shrugged. That's up to Gibbons. He wanted to ask what the hell difference it made where the kid was born, but for once he held his tongue. He turned away. Somewhere in the waste a woman was screaming in delirium. There were three shapes wrapped in ragged blankets and laid on planks by the port scuppers. Harker's mouth twitched in a crooked smile. "'We'll probably stop long enough to bury him,' he said. "'Maybe that'll be time enough.' He caught a glimpse of McLaren's face. The hope in it was not tired any more. It was dead. Dead, like the rest of Venus. Gibbons called the chief men together aboard the ship the leaders, the fighters and hunters and seamen, the tough leathery men who were the armor around the soft body of the colony. Harker was there, and McLaren. McLaren was young, but up until lately he had had a quality of optimism that cheered his shipmates, a natural leadership. Gibbons was an old man. He was the original guiding spirit of the five thousand colonists who had come out from Earth to start on a new world. Time and tragedy, disappointment and betrayal had marked him cruelly, but his head was still high. Harker admired his guts while cursing him for an idealistic fool. 
the inevitable discussion started as to whether they should try a permanent settlement on this mud flat or go on wandering over the endless, chartless seas. Harker said impatiently, For Cripe's sake, look at the place. Remember the last time? Remember the time before that, and stop bleeding. Sim, the big black, said quietly, The people are getting awful tired. A man was meant to have root some place. There's going to be trouble pretty soon if we don't find land. Harker said, You think you can find some, pal? Go to it. Gibbon said heavily, But he's right. There's hysteria, fever, dysentery, and boredom, and the boredom's worst of all. McLaren said, I vote to settle. Harker laughed. He was leaning by the cabin port, looking out at the cliffs. The gray granite looked clean above the swamp. Harker tried to pierce the clouds that hid the top, but couldn't. His dark eyes narrowed. The heated voices behind him faded into distance. Suddenly he turned and said, "'Sir, I'd like permission to see what's at the top of those cliffs.' There was complete silence. Then Gibbon said slowly, "'We've lost too many men on journeys like that before, only to find the plateau uninhabitable. There's always the chance. Our first settlement was in the high plateaus, remember? Clean air, good soil, no fever.' "'I remember,' Gibbon said. "'I remember.' He was silent for a while. Then he gave Harker a shrewd glance. I know you, Matt. I might as well give permission. Harker grinned. You won't miss me much anyhow. I'm not a good influence any more. He started for the door. Give me three weeks. You'll take that long to careen and scrape the bottoms anyhow. Maybe I'll come back with something. McLaren said, I'm going with you, Matt. Harker gave him a level-eyed stare. You'd better stay with Vicky. If there's good land up there, and anything happens to you so you can't come back and tell us. Like not bothering to come back, maybe? I didn't say that. Like we both won't come back, but two is better than one. Harker smiled. The smile was enigmatic and not very nice. Gibbon said, He's right, Matt. Harker shrugged. Then Sim stood up. Two is good, he said, but three is better. He turned to Gibbons. There's nearly five hundred of us, sir. If there's new land up there, we ought to share the burden of finding it. Gibbons nodded. Harker said, You're crazy, Sim. Why do you want to do all that climbing, maybe to no place? Sim smiled. His teeth were unbelievably white in the sweat-polished blackness of his face. But that's what my people always done, Matt. A lot of climbing, to no place. They made their preparations and had a last night's sleep. McLaren said goodbye to Vicky. She didn't cry. She knew why he was going. She kissed him, and all she said was, Be careful. All he said was, I'll be back before he's born. They started at dawn carrying dried fish and sea berries made into pemmican, and their long knives and ropes for climbing. They had long ago run out of ammunition for their few blasters, and they had no equipment for making more. All were adept at throwing spears, and carried three short ones barbed with bone across their backs. It was raining when they crossed the mud flat, wading thigh-deep in heavy mist, Harker led the way through the belt of swamp. He was an old hand at it, with an uncanny quickness in spotting vegetation that was independently alive and hungry as he was. Venus is one vast hothouse, and the plants have developed into species as varied and marvelous as the reptiles or the mammals, crawling out of the Precambrian seas as primitive flagellates and growing wills of their own with appetites and motive power to match. The children of the colony learned at an early age not to pick flowers. The blossoms too often bit back. The swamp was narrow, and they came out of it safely. A great swamp dragon, Alation, screamed not far off, but they hunt by night, 
and it was too sleepy to chase them. Harker stood finally on firm ground and studied the cliff. The rock was roughened by weather, hacked at by ages of erosion, savaged by earthquake. There were stretches of loose shale and great slabs that looked as though they would peel off at a touch, but Harker nodded. "'We can climb it,' he said. "'Question is, how high is up?' Sim laughed. "'High enough for the Golden City, maybe. "'Have we got a clear conscience? "'Can't carry no load of sin that far.' Rory McLaren looked at Harker. Harker said, "'All right, I confess. "'I don't care if there's land up there or not. "'All I wanted was to get the hell out of that damn boat "'before I went clean nuts. "'So now you know.' McLaren nodded. "'He didn't seem surprised. "'Let's climb.' By morning of the second day they were in the clouds. They crawled upward through the opal-tinted steam, half-liquid, hot and unbearable. They crawled for two more days. The first night or two Sim sang during his watch, while they rested on some ledge. After that he was too tired. McLaren began to give out, though he wouldn't say so. Matt Harker grew more taciturn and ill-tempered, if possible, but otherwise there was no change. The clouds continued to hide the top of the cliff. During one rest break, McLaren said hoarsely, "'Don't these cliffs ever end?' His skin was yellowish, his eyes glazed with fever. "'Maybe,' said Harker. "'They go right up beyond the sky.' The fever was on him again, too." It lived in the marrow of the exiles, coming out at intervals to shake and sear them, and then retreating. Sometimes it did not retreat, and after nine days there was no need. McLaren said, You wouldn't care if they did, would you? I didn't ask you to come, but you wouldn't care. Ah, shut up. McLaren went for Harker's throat. Harker hit him with great care and accuracy. McLaren sagged down and shook his head in his hands and wept. Sim stayed out of it. He shook his head, and after a while he began to sing to himself, or someone beyond himself. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I see. Harker pulled himself up. His ears rang and he shivered uncontrollably, but he could still take some of McLaren's weight on himself. They were climbing a steep ledge fairly wide and not difficult. "'Let's get on,' said Harker. About two hundred feet beyond that point, the ledge dipped and began to go down again in a series of broken steps. Overhead, the cliff face bulged outward. Only a fly could have climbed it. They stopped. Harker cursed with vicious slowness. Sim closed his eyes and smiled. He was a little crazy with fever himself. Golden City's at the top. That's where I'm going. He started off along the ledge, following its decline toward a jutting shoulder, around which it vanished. Harker laughed sardonically. McLaren pulled free of him and went doggedly after Sim. Harker shrugged and followed. Around the shoulder the ledge washed out completely. They stood still. The steaming clouds shut them in before, and behind was a granite wall hung within thick, freshly creepers. Dead end. Well, said Harker. McLaren sat down. He didn't cry or say anything. He just sat. Sim stood with his arms hanging and his chin on his huge black chest. Harker said, See what I meant? About the promised land? Venus is a fixed wheel, and you can't win. It was then that he noticed the cool air. He had thought it was just a fever chill, but it lifted his hair, and it had a definite pattern on his body. It even had a cool, clean smell to it. It was blowing out through the creepers. Harker began ripping with his knife. He broke through into a cave mouth, a jagged rip worn smooth at the bottom by what must once have been a river. That draft is coming from the top of the plateau, Harker said. 
Wind must be blowing up there and pushing it down. There may be a way through. McLaren and Sim both showed a slow, terrible growth of hope. The three of them went without speaking into the tunnel. End of Part 1 Section 22 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of The Vanishing Venusians They made good time. The clean air acted as a tonic, and hope spurred them on. The tunnel sloped upward rather sharply, and presently Harker heard water a low, thunderous murmur as of an underground river up ahead. It was utterly dark, but the smooth channel of stone was easy to follow. Sim said, "'Isn't that a light up ahead?' "'Yeah,' said Harker. "'Some kind of phosphorescence. "'I don't like that river. "'It may stop us.' They went on in silence. The glow grew stronger, the air more damp. Patches of phosphorescent lichen appeared on the walls, glimmering with dim jewel tones like an unhealthy rainbow. The roar of the water was very loud. They came upon it suddenly. It flowed across the course of their tunnel in a broad channel, worn deep into the rock, so that its level had fallen below its old place and left the tunnel dry. It was a wide river, slow and majestic. Lichen spangled the roof and walls, reflecting in dull glints of color from the water. Overhead there was a black chimney going up through the rock, and the cool draft came from there with almost hurricane force, much of which was dissipated in the main river tunnel. Harker judged there was a cliff formation on the surface that siphoned the wind downward. The chimney was completely inaccessible. Harker said, I guess we'll have to go upstream, along the side. The rock was eroded enough to make that possible, showing wide ledges at different levels. McLaren said, What if this river doesn't come from the surface? What if it starts from an underground source? You stuck your neck out, Harker said. Come on. They started. After a while, tumbling like porpoises in the black water, the golden creature swam by and saw the men, and stopped, and swam back again. They were not very large, the largest about the size of a twelve-year-old child. Their bodies were anthropoid, but adapted to swimming with shimmering webs. They glowed with a golden light, phosphorescent like the lichen, and their eyes were lidless and black, like one huge spreading pupil. Their faces were incredible, Harker could remember, faintly, the golden dandelions that grew on the lawn in summer. The heads and faces of the swimmers were like that, covered with streaming petals that seemed to have independent movements, as though they were sensory organs as well as decoration. Harker said, For cripe's sake, what are they? They look like flowers, McLaren said. They look more like fish, the black man said. Harker laughed. I'll bet they're both. I'll bet they're planties that grew where they had to be amphibious. The colonists had shortened the plant animal to planimal, and then just plenty. I've seen gimmicks in the swamps that weren't so far away from these, but geez, get the eyes on them. They look human. The shape's human, too, almost, McLaren shivered. I wish they wouldn't look at us that way. Sim said, "'As long as they just look, I'm not going to worry.' They didn't. They started to close in below the men, swimming effortlessly against the current. Some of them began to clamber out on the low edge behind them. They were agile and graceful. There was something unpleasantly childlike about them. There were fifteen or twenty of them, and they reminded Harker of a gang of mischievous kids." Only the mischief had a queer, soulless quality of malevolence. Harker led the way faster along the ledge. His knife was drawn, and he carried a short spear in his right hand. The tone of the river changed. 
The channel broadened, and up ahead Harker saw that the cavern ended in a vast, shadowy place, the water spreading into a dark lake, spilling slowly out over a low, wide lip of rock. More of the shining child things were playing there. They joined their fellows, closing the ring tighter around the three men. "'I don't like this,' McLaren said. "'If they'd only make a noise!' They did, suddenly, a shrill tittering like a blasphemy of childish laughter. Their eyes shone. They rushed in, running wetly along the ledge, reaching up out of the water to claw at ankles, laughing. Inside his tough flat belly, Harker's guts turned over. McLaren yelled and kicked. Claws raked his ankle, spiny, needle-sharp things like thorns. Sim ran his spear clean through a golden breast. There were no bones in it. The body was light and membranous, and the blood that ran out was sticky and greenish, like sap. Harker kicked two of the things back in the river, swung his spear like a ball bat, and knocked two more off the ledge. They were unbelievably light, and shouted, "'Up there, that high ledge. I don't think they can climb that.' He thrust McLaren bodily past him and helped Sim fight a rear-guard action while they all climbed a rotten and difficult transit. McLaren crouched at the top and hurled chunks of stone at the attackers. There was a great crack running up and clear across the cavern roof, scar of some ancient earthquake. Presently a small slide started. Okay, Harker panted. Quit before you bring the roof down. They can't follow us. The planes were equipped for swimming, not climbing. They clawed angrily and slipped back, and then retreated sullenly to the water. Abruptly they seized the body with Sim's spear through it and devoured it, quarreling fiercely over it. McLaren leaned over the edge and was sick. Harker didn't feel so good himself. He got up and went on. Sim helped McLaren, whose ankle was bleeding badly. This higher ledge angled up and around the wall of the great lake cavern. It was cooler and drier here, and the lichens thinned out, and vanished, leaving total darkness. Harker yelled once. From the echo of his voice, the place was enormous. Down below, in the black water, golden bodies streaked like comets in an ebon universe, going somewhere, going fast. Harker felt his way carefully along. His skin twitched with a nervous impulse of danger, a sense of something unseen, unnatural, and wicked. Sim said, I hear something. They stopped. The blind air lay heavy with a subtle fragrance. "'spicy and pleasant, yet somehow unclean. "'The water sighed lazily far below. "'Somewhere ahead was a smooth, rushing noise "'which Harker guessed was the river inlet. "'But none of that was what Sim meant. "'He meant the rippling, rustling sound "'that came from everywhere in the cavern. "'The black surface of the lake was dotted now "'with spots of burning phosphorescent color, "'trailing fiery wakes.' The spots grew swiftly, coming nearer, and became carpets of flowers, scarlet and blue and gold and purple, floating fields of them, and towed by shining swimmers. "'My God,' said Harker softly, "'how big are they?' "'Enough to make three of me.' Sim was a big man. "'Those little ones were children, all right.' They went on and got their papas. "'Oh, Lord!' The swimmers were very like the smaller ones that had attacked them by the river, except for their giant size. They were not cumbersome. They were magnificent, supple-limbed and light. Their membranes had spread into great shining wings, each rib tipped with fire. Only the golden dandelion heads had changed. They had shed their petals. Their adult heads were crowned with flat, coiled growths having the poisonous and filthy beauty of fungus, and their faces were the faces of men. For the first time since childhood, Harker was cold. 
the fields of burning flowers were swirled together at the base of the cliff. The golden giants cried out suddenly, a sonorous belling note, and the water was churned to blazing foam as thousands of flower-like bodies broke away and started up the cliff on suckered, spidery legs. It didn't look as though it were worth trying, but Harker said, Let's get the hell on. There was a faint light now from the army below. He began to run along the ledge, the others close on his heels. The flower hounds coursed swiftly upward, and their master swam easily below, watching. The ledge dropped. Harker shot along it like a deer. Beyond the lowest dip it plunged into the tunnel whence the river came. A short tunnel, and at the far end. Daylight, Harker shouted. Daylight. McLaren's bleeding leg gave out and he fell. Harker caught him. They were at the lowest part of the dip. The flower beasts were just below, rushing higher. McLaren's foot was swollen, the calf of his leg discolored. Some swift infection from the planty's claws. He fought Harker. Go on, he said. Go on. Harker slapped him hard across the temple. He started on, half carrying McLaren, but he saw it wasn't going to work. McLaren weighed more than he did. He thrust McLaren into Sim's powerful arms. The big black nodded and ran, carrying the half-conscious man like a child. Harker saw the first of the flower things flow up onto the ledge in front of them. Sim hurdled them. They were not large, and there were only three of them. They rushed to follow, and Harker speared them, slashing and striking with the sharp bone tip. Behind him the full tide rushed up. He ran, but they were faster. He drove them back with a spear and knife, and ran again, and turned and fought again, and by the time they had reached the tunnel, Harker was staggering with weariness. Sim stopped. He said, There's no way out. Harker glanced over his shoulder. The river fell sheer down a high face of rock, too high and with too much force in the water even for the giant water planties to think of attempting. Daylight poured through overhead, warm and welcoming, and it might as well have been on Mars. Dead end. Then Harker saw the little eroded channel twisting up at the side. Little more than a drain pipe and long dry, leading to a passage beside the top of the falls. A crack, barely large enough for a small man to crawl through. It was a hell of a ragged hope, but... Harker pointed, between jabs at the swarming flowers. Sim yelled, You first! Because Harker was the best climber, he obeyed, helping the gasping McLaren up behind him. Sim wielded his spear like a lightning brand, guarding the rear, creeping up inch by inch. He reached a fairly secure perch and stopped. His huge chest pumped like a bellows. His arm rose and fell like a polished bar of ebony. Harker shouted to him to come on. He and McLaren were almost at the top. Sim laughed. How are you going to get me through that little bitty hole? Come on, you fool. You better hurry. I'm about finished. Sim, Sim, damn you. Crawl out through that tube, runt, and pull that string bean with you. I'm a man-sized man, and I got to stay. Then furiously, hurry up, or they'll drag you back before you're through. He was right. Harker knew he was right. He went to work pushing and jamming McLaren through the narrow opening. McLaren was groggy and not much help, but he was thin and small-boned, and he made it. He rolled out on a slope covered with green grass, the first Harker had seen since he was a child. He began to struggle after McLaren. He did not look back at Sim. The black man was singing about the glory of the coming of the Lord. Harker put his head back into the darkness of the creek. Sim! Yeah, faintly hoarse, echoing. 
There's land here, Sim. Good land. Yeah? Sim, we'll find a way. Sim was singing again. The sound grew fainter, diminishing downward into distance. The words were lost, but not what lay behind them. Matt Harker buried his face in the green grass, and Sim's voice went with him into the dark. The clouds were turning color with the sinking of the hidden sun. They hung like a canopy of hot gold washed in blood. It was utterly silent, except for the birds. Birds. You never heard birds like that down in the low places. Matt Harker rolled over and sat up slowly. He felt as though he had been beaten. There was a sickness in him, and a shame, and the old dark anger lying coiled and deadly above his heart. Before him lay the long slope of grass to the river, which bent away to the left out of sight behind a spur of granite. Beyond the slope was a broad plain and then a forest of gigantic trees. They seemed to float in the coppery haze, their dark branches outspread like wings and starred with flowers. The air was cool, with no taint of mud or rot. The grass was rich, the soil beneath it clean and sweet. Rory McLaren moaned softly, and Harker turned. His leg looked bad. He was in a sort of stupor, his skin flushed and dry. Harker swore softly, wondering what he was going to do. He looked back toward the plane, and he saw the girl. He didn't know how she got there, perhaps out of the bushes that grew in thick clumps on the slope. She could have been there a long time, watching. She was watching now, standing quite still about forty feet away. A great scarlet butterfly clung to her shoulder, moving its wings with lazy delight. She seemed more like a child than a woman. She was naked, small and slender and exquisite. Her hair had a faint translucent hint of green under its whiteness. Her hair curled short to her head, was deep blue, and her eyes were blue also, and very strange. Harker stared at her, and she at him, neither of them moving. A bright bird swooped down and hovered by her lips for a moment, caressing her with its beak. She touched it and smiled, but she did not take her eyes from Harker. Harker got to his feet, slowly, easily. He said, Hello. She did not move, nor make a sound, but quite suddenly a pair of enormous birds, beaked and clawed like eagles and black as sin, made a whistling rush down past Harker's head and returned, circling. Harker sat down again. The girl's strange eyes moved from him, up toward the crack in the hillside whence he had come. Her lips didn't move, but her voice or something, spoke clearly inside Harker's head. You came from there. There had a tremendous feeling in it, and none of it nice. Harker said, Yes, a telepath, huh? But you're not. A picture of the golden swimmers formed in Harker's mind. It was recognizable, but hatred and fear had washed out all the beauty, leaving only horror. Harker said, no. He explained about himself and McLaren. He told about Sim. He knew she was listening carefully to his mind, testing it for truth. He was not worried about what she would find. My friend is hurt, he said. We need food and shelter. For some time there was no answer. The girl was looking at Harker again. His face, the shape and texture of his body, his hair, and then his eyes. He had never been looked at quite that way before. He began to grin. A provocative, be damned to you grin that injected a surprising amount of light and charm into his sardonic personality. Honey, he said, you are terrific. Animal, mineral, or vegetable? She tipped her small round head in surprise, and asked his own question right back. Harker laughed. She smiled, 
her mouth making a small inviting V, and her eyes had sparkles in them. Harker started toward her. Instantly the birds warned him back. The girl laughed, a mischievous ripple of merriment. Come, she said, and turned away. Harker frowned. He leaned over and spoke to McLaren, with peculiar gentleness. He managed to get the boy erect, and then swung him across his shoulders, staggering slightly under the weight. McLaren said distinctly, I'll be back before he's born. Harker waited until the girl had started, keeping his distance. The two blackbirds followed watchfully. They walked out across the thick grass of the plain toward the trees. The sky was now the color of blood. A light breeze caught the girl's hair and played with it. Matt Harker saw that the short curled strands were broad and flat, like blue petals. End of Part 2 Section 23 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 of The Vanishing Venusians It was a long walk to the forest. The top of the plateau seemed to be bowl-shaped, protected by encircling cliffs. Harker, thinking back to that first settlement long ago, decided that this place was infinitely better. It was like the visions he had seen in fever dreams, the promised land. The coolness and cleanness of it were like having weights removed from your lungs and heart and body. The rejuvenating air didn't make up for McLaren's weight, however. Presently Harker said, Hold it, and sat down, tumbling McLaren gently onto the grass. The girl stopped. She came back a little way and watched Harker, who was blowing like a spent horse. He grinned up at her. "'I'm shot,' he said. "'I've been too busy for a man of my age. Can't you get a hold of somebody to help me carry him?' Again she studied him with puzzled fascination. Night was closing in, in a clear indigo, less dark than at sea level. Her eyes had a curious luminosity in the gloom. "'Why do you do that?' she asked. "'Do what?' carry it. By it, Harker guessed she meant McLaren. He was suddenly, coldly conscious of a chasm between them that no amount of explanation could bridge. He's my friend. He's... I have to. She studied his thought and then shook her head. I don't understand. It's spoiled. Her thought image was a combination of broken, finished, and useless. Why carry it around? McLaren's not an it. He's a man like me, my friend. He's hurt and I have to help him. I don't understand. Her shrug said it was his funeral, also that he was crazy. She started on again, paying no attention to Harker's call for her to wait. Perforce, Harker picked up McLaren and staggered on again. He wished Sim were here, and immediately wished he hadn't thought of Sim. He hoped Sim had died quickly before. Before what? Oh, God, it's dark, and I'm scared, and my belly's all gone to cold water, and that thing trotting ahead of me through the blue haze. The thing was beautiful, though. Beautifully formed, fascinating, a curved slender gleam of moonlight, a chalice flower holding the mystic, scented nectar of the unreal, the unknown, the undiscovered. Harker's blood began, in spite of himself, to throb with a deep excitement. They came under the fragrant shadows of the trees. The forest was open, with broad mossy rides and clearings. There were flowers underfoot, but no brush and clumps of ferns. The girl stopped and stretched up her hand. A feathery branch, high out of her reach, bent and brushed her face and she plucked a great pale blossom and set it in her hair. She turned and smiled at Harker. He began to tremble, partly with weariness, partly with something else. "'How do you do that?' he asked. She was puzzled. "'The branch, you mean?' "'Oh, that!' she laughed. It was the first sound he had heard her make, 
and it shot through him like warm silver. I just think I would like a flower, and it comes. Teleportation, teleconnectic energy, what did the books call it? Back on Earth they knew something about that, but the colony hadn't had much time to study even its own meager library. There had been some religious sect that could make roses bend into their hands. Old Wisdom, the force behind the biblical miracles, just the infinite power of thought. Very simple. Yea, Harker wondered uneasily whether she could work it on him, too. But then, he had a brain of his own. Or did he? What's your name? he asked. She gave a clear, trilled sound. Harker tried to whistle it and gave up. Some sort of tone language, he guessed, without words as he knew them. It sounded as though they, her people, whatever they were, had copied the birds. I'll call you Button, he said. Bachelor Button. But you wouldn't know. She picked the image out of his mind and sent it back to him. Blue fringe top flowers nodding in his mother's china bowl. She laughed again and sent her blackbirds away and led on into the forest, calling out like an oriole. Other voices answered her, and presently, racing the light wind between the trees, her people came. They were like her. There were males, slender little creatures like young boys, and girls like Button. There were several hundred of them, all naked, all laughing and curious, their lithe, pliant bodies fitting moth fashion through the indigo shadows. They were topped with petals. Harker called them that, though he still wasn't sure, of all colors from blood scarlet to pure white. They trilled back and forth. Apparently Button was telling them all about how she found Harker and McLaren. The whole mob pushed on slowly through the forest and ended finally in a huge clearing where there were only scattered trees. A spring rose and made a little lake, and then a stream that wandered off among the ferns. More of the little people came, and now he saw the young ones. All sizes, from tiny thin creatures on up, replicas of their elders. There were no old ones. There were none with imperfect or injured bodies. Harker, exhausted and on the thin edge of a fever bout, was not encouraged. He set McLaren down by the spring. He drank, gasping like an animal, and bathed his head and shoulders. The forest people stood in a circle, watching. They were silent now. Harker felt coarse and bestial, somehow, as though he had belched loudly in church. He turned to McLaren. He bathed him, helped him drink, and set about fixing the leg. He needed light, and he needed flame. There were dry leaves and mats of dead moss in the rocks around the spring. He gathered a pile of these. The forest people watched. Their silent, luminous stare got on Harker's nerves. His hands were shaking so that he made four tries with his flint and steel before he got a spark. The tiny flicker made the silent rank stir sharply. He blew on it. The flames licked up, small and pale at first, then taking hold, growing, crackling. He saw their faces in the springing light, their eyes stretched with terror. A shrill cry broke from them, and then they were gone like rustling leaves before a wind. Harker drew his knife. The forest was quiet now. Quiet, but not at rest. The skin crawled on Harker's back, over his scalp, drew tight on his cheekbones. He passed the blade through the flame. McLaren looked up at him. Harker said, It's okay, Rory, and hit him carefully on the point of the jaw. McLaren lay still. Harker stretched out the swollen leg and went to work. It was dawn again. He lay by the spring in the cool grass, the ashes of his fire gray and dead beside the dark stains. He felt rested, relaxed, and the fever seemed to have gone out of him. The air was like wine. He rolled over on his back. There was a wind blowing. 
It was a live, strong wind, with a certain smell to it. The trees were rollicking, almost shouting with pleasure. Harker breathed deeply. The smell, the pure clean edge. Suddenly he realized that the clouds were high, higher than he'd ever known them to be. The wind swept them up, and the daylight was bright, so bright that... Harker sprang up. The blood rushed in him. There was a stinging blur in his eyes. He began to run, toward a tall tree, and he flung himself upward into the branches and climbed, recklessly, into the swaying top. The bowl of the valley lay below him, green, rich, and lovely. The gray granite cliffs rose around it, grew higher in the direction from which the wind blew. Higher and higher, and beyond them, far beyond, were mountains, flung towering against the sky. On the mountains, showing through the whipping veils of cloud, there was snow, white and cold and blindingly pure, and as Harker watched there was a gleam, so quick and fleeting that he saw it more with his heart than with his eyes. Sunlight. Snowfields, and above them, the sun. After a long time he clambered down again into the silence of the glade. He stood there, not moving, seeing what he had not had time to see before. Rory McLaren was gone. Both packs, with food and climbing ropes and bandages and flint and steel, were gone. The short spears were gone. Feeling on his hip, Harker found nothing but bare flesh. His knife and even his breech clout had been taken. A slender, exquisite body moved forward from the shadows of the trees. Huge white blossoms gleamed against the curly blue that crowned the head. Luminous eyes glanced up at Harker, full of mockery and a subtle animation. Button smiled. Matt Harker walked toward Button, not hurrying, his hard sinewy face blank of expression. He tried to keep his mind that way, too. Where is the other one, my friend? In the finish place. She nodded vaguely toward the cliffs near where Harker and McLaren had escaped from the caves. Her thought image was somewhere between rubbish heap and cemetery, as nearly as Harker could translate it. It was also completely casual, a little annoyed that time should be wasted on such trifles. Did you? Is he still alive? It was when we put it there. It will be all right. It will just wait until it stops. Like all of them. Why was he moved? Why did you? It was ugly, Button shrugged. It was broken anyway. She stretched her arms upward and lifted her head to the wind. A shiver of delight ran through her. She smiled again at Harker, sidelong. He tried to keep his anger hidden. He started walking again not as though he had any purpose in mind, bearing toward the cliffs. His way lay past a bush with yellow flowers and thorny, pliant branches. Suddenly it writhed and whipped him across the belly. He stopped short and doubled over, hearing Button's laughter. When he straightened up, she was in front of him. "'It's red,' she said, surprised." and laid little pointed fingers on the scratches left by the thorns. She seemed thrilled and fascinated by the color and feel of his blood. Her fingers moved, probing the shape of his muscles, the texture of his skin, and the dark hair on his chest. They drew small lines of fire along his neck, along the ridge of his jaw, touching his features one by one, his eyelids, his black brows. "'What are you?' whispered her mind to his. "'This.' Harker put his arms around her slowly. Her flesh slid cool and strange under his hands, sending an indescribable shudder through him, partly pleasure, partly revulsion. He bent his head. Her eyes deepened, lakes of blue fire, and then he found her lips. They were cool and strange like the rest of her, pliant, "'scented with spice, the same perfume that came with sudden overpowering sweetness from her curling petals. 
Harker saw movement in the forest aisles, a clustering of bright flower heads. Button drew back. She took his hand and led him away, off toward the river and the quiet, ferny places along its banks. Glancing up, Harker saw that the two blackbirds were following overhead. "'You are really plants, then? Flowers like those?' He touched the white blossoms on her head. "'You are really a beast, then? Like the furry, snarling things that climb up through the pass sometimes?' They both laughed. The sky above them was the color of clean fleece. The warm earth and crushed ferns were sweet beneath them. "'What pass?' asked Harker. "'Over there.' She pointed off toward the rim of the valley. It goes down to the sea, I think. Long ago we used to go down there, but there's no need, and the beasts make it dangerous. Do they? said Harker, and kissed her in the hollow below her chin. What happens when the beasts come? Button laughed. Before he could stir, Harker was trapped fast in a web of creepers and tough fern and the blackbirds were screeching and clashing their sharp beaks in his face. "'That happens,' Button said. She stroked the ferns. "'Our cousins understand us, even better than the birds.' Harker lay sweating, even after he was free again. Finally he said, "'Those creatures in the underground lake, are they your cousins?' Button's fear thought thrust against his mind like hands pushing away. "'No, don't.' Long, long ago the legend is that this valley was a huge lake, and the swimmers lived in it. They were a different species from us entirely. We came from the high gorges, where there are only barren cliffs now. This was long ago. The lake receded. We grew more numerous and began to come down, and finally there was a battle and we drove the swimmers over the falls into the black lake. They have tried and tried to get out, to get back to the light, but they can't. They send their thoughts through us sometimes. They... She broke off. I don't want to talk about them any more. How would you fight them if they did get out? Harker asked uneasily. Just with the birds and the growing things. Button was slow in answering. Then she said, I will show you one way. She laid her hand across his eyes. For a moment there was only darkness. Then a picture began to form. People, his own people, seen as reflections in a dim and distorted mirror, but recognizable. They poured into the valley through a notch in the cliffs, and instantly every bush and tree and blade of grass was bent against them. They fought, slashing with their knives, making headway, but slowly. And then, across the plain, came a sort of fog, a thin drifting curtain of soft white. It came closer, moving with force of its own, not heeding the wind. Harker saw that it was thistledown. Seeds borne on silky wings. It settled over the people trapped in the brush. It was endless and unhurrying, covering them all with a fine fleece. They began to writhe and cry out with pain, with a terrible fear. They struggled, but they couldn't get away. The white down dropped away from them. Their bodies were covered with countless tiny green shoots, sucking the chemicals from the living flesh and already beginning to grow. Button's spoken thought cut across the image. I have seen your thoughts, some of them, since the moment you came out of the caves. I can't understand them, but I can see our plains gashed to the raw earth and our trees cut down and everything made ugly. If your kind came here, we would have to go, and the valley belongs to us. Matt Harker's brain lay still in the darkness of his skull, wary, drawn in upon itself. It belonged to the swimmers first. They couldn't hold it. We can. Why did you save me, Button? What do you want of me? There was no danger from you. You were strange. I wanted to play with you. Do you love me, Button? His fingers touched a large, smooth stone among the fern roots. Love? What is that? It's tomorrow and yesterday. 
It's hoping and happiness and pain. The complete self because it's selfless. The chain that binds you to life and makes living it worthwhile. Do you understand? No, I grow. I take from the soil and the light. I play with the others, with the birds and the wind and the flowers. When the time comes, I am ripe with seed, and after that I go to the finished place and wait. That's all I understand. That's all there is. He looked up into her eyes. A shudder crept over him. You have no soul, Button. That's the difference between us. You live, but you have no soul. After that, it was not so hard to do what he had to do. To do quickly, very quickly, the thing that was his only faint chance of justifying Sim's death. The thing that Button may have glimpsed in his mind, but could not guard against, because there was no understanding in her of the thought of murder. End of Part 3 Section 24 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4 of The Vanishing Venusians The blackbirds darted at Harker, but the compulsion that sent them flickered out too soon. The ferns and creepers shook, and then were still, and the birds flew heavily away. Matt Harker stood up. He thought he might have a little time. The flower people probably kept in pretty close touch mentally, but perhaps they wouldn't notice Button's absence for a while. Perhaps they weren't prying into his own thoughts, because he was Button's toy. Perhaps... He began to run, toward the cliffs where the finished place was. He kept as much as possible in the open, away from shrubs. He did not look again, before he left, at what lay by his feet. He was close to his destination when he knew that he was spotted. The birds returned, rushing down on him on black, whistling wings. He picked up a dead branch to beat them off, and it crumbled in his hands. Telekinesis, the power of mind over matter. Harker had read once that if you knew how, you could always make your point by thinking the dice into position. He wished he could think himself up a blaster. Curved beaks ripped his arms. He covered his face and grabbed one of the birds by the neck and killed it. The other one screamed, and this time Harker wasn't so lucky. By the time he had killed the second one, he'd felt claws in him and his face was laid open along the cheekbones. He began to run again. Bushes swayed toward him as he passed. Thorny branches stretched. Creepers rose like snakes from the grass, and every green blade was turned knife-like against his feet. But he had already reached the cliffs, and there were open rocky spaces and the undergrowth was thin. He knew he was near the finished place because he could smell it. The gentle withered fragrance of flowers passed their prime and under that a dead, sour decay. He shouted McLaren's name, sick with dread that there might not be an answer, weak with relief when there was one. He raced over tumbled rocks toward the sound. A small creeper tangled his foot and brought him down. He wrenched it by the roots from its shallow crevice and went on. As he glanced back over his shoulder, he saw a thin white veil a tiny patch in the distant air, drifting toward him. He came to the finish place. It was a box canyon, quite deep, with high, sheer walls, so that it was almost like a wide well. In the bottom of it, bodies were thrown in a dry, spongy heap. Colorless flower bodies, withered and gray, an incredible compost pile. Rory McLaren lay on top of it, apparently unhurt. The two packs were beside him, with the weapons. Strewn over the heap, sitting, lying, moving feebly about, were the ones who waited, as Button had put it, to stop. There were the aged, the faded and worn out, the imperfect and injured, where their ugliness could not offend. They seemed already dead mentally. 
They paid no attention to the men, nor to each other. Sheer blind vitality kept them going a little longer, as a geranium will bloom long after its cut stalk is desiccated. Matt, McLaren said. Oh, God, Matt, I'm glad to see you. Are you all right? Sure, my leg even feels pretty good. Can you get me out? Throw those packs up here. McLaren obeyed. He began to catch Harker's feverish mood, warned by Harker's bleeding, ugly face that something nasty was afoot. Harker explained rapidly while he got out one of the ropes and half-hauled McLaren out of the pit. The white veil was close now, very close. "'Can you walk?' Harker asked. McLaren glanced at the fleecy cloud. Harker had told him about it. "'I can walk,' he said. "'I can run like hell.' Harker handed him the rope. "'Get around the other side of the canyon. Clear across, see?' He helped McLaren on with his pack. "'Stand by with the rope to pull me up, and keep to the bare rocks.' McLaren was off. He limped badly, his face twisted with pain. Harker swore. The cloud was so close now, he could see the millions of tiny seeds floating on their silken fibers, thistle-down guided by the minds of the flower people in the valley. He shrugged into his pack straps and began winding bandages and tufts of dead grass around the bone tip of a recovered spear. The edge of the cloud was almost on him when he got a spark into the improvised torch and sprang down onto the heap of dead flower things in the pit. He sank and floundered on the treacherous surface, struggling across it while he applied the torch. The dry, withered substance caught. He raced the flames to the far wall and glanced back. The dying creatures had not stirred, even when the fire engulfed them. Overhead, the edges of the seed cloud flared and crisped. It moved on blindly over the fire. There was a pale flash of light, and the cloud vanished in a puff of smoke. Rory! Harker yelled. Rory! For a long minute he stood there, coughing, strangling in thick smoke, feeling the rushing heat crisp his skin. Then, when it was almost too late... McLaren's sweating face appeared above him, and the rope snaked down. Tongues of flame flicked his backside angrily as he ran monkey fashion up the wall. They got away from there, higher on the rocky ground, slashing occasionally with their knives at brush and creepers they could not avoid. McLaren shuddered. "'It's impossible,' he said. "'How do they do it?' "'They're blood cousins, or should I say sap?' Anyhow, I suppose it's like radio control, a matter of transmitting the right frequencies. Here, take it easy a minute. McLaren sank down gratefully. Blood was seeping through the tight bandages where Harker had incised his wound. Harker looked back into the valley. The flower people were spread out in a long crescent, their bright multicolor heads clear against the green plain. Harker guessed that they would be guarding the pass. He guessed that they had known what was going on in his mind as well as Button had. New form of communism. One mind for all and all for one mind. He could see that even without McLaren's disability they couldn't make it to the pass. Not a mouse could have made it. He wondered how soon the next seed cloud would come. What are we going to do, Matt? Is there any way... McLaren wasn't thinking about himself. He was looking at the valley like Lucifer yearning at paradise, and he was thinking of Vicky. Not just Vicky alone, but Vicky is a symbol of 3,800 wanderers on the face of Venus. I don't know, said Harker. The pass is out, and the caves are out. Hey, remember when we were fighting off those critters by the river, and you nearly started a cave-in throwing rocks? There was a fault there, right over the edge of the lake. An earthquake split. If we could get at it from the top and shake it down. It was a minute before McLaren caught on. His eyes widened. A slide could dam up the lake. If the level rose enough, the swimmers could get out. 
Harker gazed with sultry eyes at the bobbing flower heads below. But if the valley's flooded, Matt, and those critters take over, where does that leave our people? There wouldn't be too much of a slide, I don't think. The rock's solid on both sides of the fault. And anyway, the weight of the water backed up there would push through anything, even a concrete dam, in a couple of weeks. Harker studied the valley floor intently. See the way that slopes there. Even if the site didn't wash out, a little digging would drain the flood off down the pass. We'd just be making a new river. Maybe, McLaren nodded. I guess so. But that still leaves the swimmers. I don't think they'd be any nicer than these babies about giving up their land. His tone said he would rather fight Button's people any day. Harker's mouth twisted in a slow grin. The swimmers are water creatures, Rory, amphibious. Also, they've lived underground in total darkness for God knows how long. You know what happens to angleworms when you get them out in the light. You know what happens to fungus that grows in the dark. He ran his fingers over his skin, almost with reverence. Notice anything about yourself, Rory? Or have you been too busy? McLaren stared. He rubbed his own skin and winced and rubbed again, watching his fingers leave streaks of vivid white that faded instantly. Sunburn, he said wonderingly. My God, sunburn. Harker stood up. Let's go take a look. Down below, the flower heads were agitated. They don't like that thought, Rory. Maybe it can be done, and they know it. McLaren rose, leaning on a short spear like a cane. Matt, they won't let us get away with it. Harker frowned. Button said there were other ways beside the seed. He turned away. No use standing here worrying about it. They started climbing again, very slowly on account of McLaren. Harker tried to gauge where they were in relation to the cavern beneath. The river made a good guide. The rocks were almost barren of growth here, which was a godsend. He watched, but he couldn't see anything threatening approaching from the valley. The flower people were mere dots now, perfectly motionless. The rock formation changed abruptly. Ancient quakes had left scars in the shape of twisted strata, great leaning slabs of granite poised like dancers, and cracks that vanished into darkness. Harker stopped. That's it. Listen, Rory. I want you to go off up there, out of the danger area. Matt, I... Shut up. One of us has got to be alive to take word back to the ships as soon as he can get through the valley. There's no great rush, and you'll be able to travel in three or four days. You. But why me? You're a better mountain man. You're married, said Harker curtly. It'll only take one of us to shove a couple of those big slabs down. They're practically ready to fall of their own weight. Maybe nothing will happen. Maybe I'll get out all right. But it's a little silly if both of us take the risk, isn't it? Yeah, but Matt... Listen, kid. Harker's voice was oddly gentle. I know what I'm doing. Give my regards to Vicky and the... He broke off with a sharp cry of pain. Looking down incredulously, he saw his body covered with little tentative flames, feeble, flickering, gone, but leaving their red footprints behind them. McLaren had the same thing. They stared at each other. A helpless terror took Harker by the throat. Telekinesis again. The flower people turning his own weapon against him. They had seen fire, and what it did, and they were copying the process in their own minds, concentrating, all of them together, the whole mental force of the colony centered on the two men. He could even understand why they focused on the skin. They had taken the sunburn thought and applied it literally. Fire. Spontaneous combustion. A simple, easy reaction, if you knew the trick. There was something about a burning bush. The attack came again, stronger this time. 
The flower people were getting the feel of it now. It hurt. Oh, God, it hurt. McLaren screamed. His loincloth and bandages began to smolder. What to do, thought Harker. Quick, tell me what to do. The flower people focus on us through our minds, our conscious minds. Maybe they can't get the subconscious so easily, because the thoughts are not directed. They're images, symbols, vague things. Maybe if Rory couldn't think consciously, they couldn't find him. Another flare of burning, agonizing pain. In a minute, they'll have the feel of it. They can keep it going. Without warning, Harker slugged McLaren heavily on the jaw and dragged him away to where the rock was firm. He did it all with astonishing strength and quickness. There was no need to save himself. He wasn't going to need himself much longer. He went away a hundred feet or so, watching McLaren. A third attack struck him, sickened and dazed him so that he nearly fell. Rory McLaren was not touched. Harker smiled. He turned and ran back toward the rotten place in the cliffs. A part of his conscious thought was so strongly formed that his body obeyed it automatically, not stopping even when the flames appeared again and again on his flesh, brightening, growing, strengthening as the thought energies of Button's people meshed together. He flung down one teetering giant of stone, and the shock jarred another loose. Harker stumbled onto a third, based on a sliding bed of shale and thrust with all his strength and beyond it, and it went, too, with crashing thunder. Harker fell. The universe dissolved into shuddering, roaring chaos beyond a bright veil of flame and a smell of burning flesh. By that time there was only one thing clear in Matt Harker's understanding, the second part of his conscious mind, linked to and even stronger than the first. The image he carried with him into death was a tall mountain with snow on its shoulders, blazing in the sun. It was night. Rory McLaren lay prone on a jutting shelf above the valley. Below him the valley was lost in indigo shadows, but there was a new sound in it, the swirl of water, angry and swift. There was new life in it, too. It rode the crest of the floodwaters burning gold in the blue night, shining giants returning in vengeance to their own place. Great patches of blazing jewel-toned phosphorescence dotted the water, the flower-hounds, turned loose to hunt. And in between them, rolling and leaping in deadly play, the young of the swimmers went. McLaren watched them hunt the forest people. He watched all night, shivering with dread, while the Golden Titans exacted payment for the ages they had lived in darkness. By dawn it was all over, and then, through the day, he watched the swimmers die. The river turned back on itself, barred them from the caves. The strong bright light beat down. The swimmers turned at first to greet it with a pathetic joy, and then they realized. McLaren turned away. He waited, resting, until, as Harker had predicted, the block washed away and the backed-up water could flow normally again. The valley was already draining when he found the pass. He looked up at the mountains and breathed the sweet wind, and felt a great shame and humility that he was here to do it. He looked backward toward the caves where Sim had died, and the cliffs above where he had buried what remained of Matt Harker. It seemed to him that he should say something, but no words came, only that his chest was so full he could hardly breathe. He turned mutely down the rocky pass, toward the sea of morning opals and the thirty-eight hundred wanderers who had found a home. End of The Vanishing Venusians End of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett